Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to call this meeting to order. At this time, I would like to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional land of Treaty 6 territory and acknowledge the diverse indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as Cree, Dene, Sotu, Blackfoot, and Dakota Sioux, as well as Métis and Inuit, and now settlers from around the world. I will do a quick roll call of council members. Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Councillor Prince Bay. Good afternoon. Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Paquette. Tansi. Tansi. Councillor Tang. Hi, good afternoon. Councillor Hamilton. Good afternoon. Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Salvador. Good afternoon. Councillor Cartmel. Good afternoon. Councillor Rice. Good afternoon. Councillor Jans. Good afternoon. I'll check again, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Stevenson. And uh, Deputy Mayor is Councillor Rutherford and Acting Mayor is Councillor Rice. Councillor Hamilton, can you go to can I go to it up for the adoption of the agenda? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, I will move the adoption of the uh, uh, March fifteenth uh, public hearing agenda um, with the following uh, replacement pages. 3.6 Charter Bylaw 1992 to allow for a mix of commercial use uh, on a site with high visibility, Calgary Trail North. 3.19 Charter Bylaw 2009 to allow for small scale infill development, Sherwood. And 3.21 uh, Bylaw 2005 amendment to the Griesbach neighborhood area structure plan. Oh, and 3.22 Charter Bylaw 2006 to allow for multi unit housing up to six stories in the village center of Griesbach. Second. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton, a second by Councillor Rice. Any questions on the adoption of the agenda? Seeing none, call the vote. Let me yes. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. We're just looking for Councillor Tang's vote. Yes, from me. Thank you. And also looking for Councillor Stevenson's vote. Councillor oh, Stevenson is yes. Councillor Stevenson is joined us now in the uh, in the chamber hall. We okay. have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Any protocol items? I don't have any notices of protocol items. And explanation of public hearings. So all I'll do is explain the process for the public hearing. Uh, okay. For each item, administration may provide opening remarks or a presentation. Members of the public who have registered to speak will then be invited to make their presentations. Speakers will be heard in panels, and each speaker will have five minutes to present. The clerk will run the official timer in council chamber. The timer lights on the podium will be, will be green for the first four minutes. Turn yellow when there is one minute remaining, and flash red when the five minutes are up. If you're participating virtually, you may wish to use a timer of your own. When everyone on your, in your panel has had a chance to present, members of council may ask questions of you or other panel members. For this reason, you may wish to remain in the meeting until all questions have been asked of your panel. If you're participating virtually, please remember to mute your microphone 
when you are not speaking. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties, please reach out to the office of the city clerk using the contact information provided in a confirmation of registration or at city.clerk at edmonton.ca. If you're here with us in person, the clerk will guide you to your seat when it's your turn to speak. As Edmonton transitions from provincial mask mandates and the city's temporary mask bylaw, we ask visitors to council chambers to be kind and respectful of each other. You can wear a mask to protect yourself and those around you, and please respect people's personal decisions around wearing masks. In the event of an emergency, please follow the clerk's direction to evacuate. City staff will track to you to your muster point. All right. Madam Clerk, I will call for persons to speak. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.1, Charter Bylaw 19918, Public Notification Bylaw Amendment Number 1? This is the 3.1, right? Yes. Yeah, we don't have anyone in favor, and we don't have anyone opposed. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.2, Charter Bylaw 19986, to allow for multi unit housing on the ground floor? of a residentially converted hotel, Strathcona Junction. We have Taylor Kavavguchi to answer questions only from the mustard seed, uh, Gavin Hordick to answer questions only, L7 Architecture Inc., Keys Prince, Maltby and Pins Architects, uh, Michael DeWolf, L7 Architect, and Megan Shuring to answer questions only. So what I need to know from Keys, Prince, and Michael DeWolf, are you here to answer questions only? Are you here to make a presentation? I can speak to my colleague, Michael. He's uh, not available on this call. Okay, that was for Michael DeWolf. Sorry, this is Gavin. Um, my colleague Michael will not be on this call. Okay, we'll come back then when we uh, come to your item. I just needed to know if they're here to speak or not. Okay, next one. Apologies, are we just checking in uh, to make sure each person Other is on the line? Other speakers are here. And so I Taylor. Kawaguchi, are you there? I am here, yes. And I do have a short presentation for council if they do wish to have one. Okay. And Gavin Gordick? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. And Keys Prince? Your Keys is in the, uh, in the chamber hall. Michael DeWolf, are you here? No. Megan Shuring. Megan? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Items 3.3 and 3.4 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to bylaw 19987, amendment to the Strathcona Area Redevelopment Plan, or charter bylaw 19988 to expand potential new business opportunities, Ritchie and CPR Irvine? We don't have anyone in favor and we don't have anyone opposed. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.5, Charter Bylaw 19955, to rezone industrial land for expanded industrial use, Papa Chase Industrial? We have Amit Sharma to answer questions only. Amit, are you there? I am here to answer questions. Thank you. Yolanda Liu. To answer questions only, Yolanda, are you there? Good afternoon. Thank you. And we have no one opposed. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.6, Charter Bylaw 19992, to allow for a mix of commercial uses on a site with high visibility, Calgary Trail North? We have Sylvia Summers. Sylvia, are you there? I am here. Um, 
I'm able to present if this item is selected. Okay, thank you. Damir Blazeka. I'm here to answer questions if the uh, item is selected. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bajan Menani to answer questions only. Bajan. I'm here in case there is any questions for me to respond to. Thank you. And we have no one opposed. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.7, Charter Bylaw 19990, to allow for general industrial development and the preservation of natural areas and parkland associated with the North Saskatchewan River, Edmonton Energy and Technology Park? We have no one in favor, and we have no one in opposition. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.8, Charter Bylaw 19965, to rezone land for residential development in the orchards at Ellerslie neighborhood? We have Elise Schilling, Schillington, sorry, to answer question only. Elise, are you there? Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you, and we have no one opposed. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.9, Charter Bylaw 19856, to rezone land for commercial use accord? We have Sarah Sherman to answer questions only. Sarah, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Thanks. Ainsley Brown to answer questions only. Ainsley, you there? Good afternoon. Uh, PJ Pescott to answer questions only. PJ, are you there? Good afternoon. Thank you, and we have no one opposed. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.10, Charter Bylaw 19991, to allow for the development of a variety of low-density residential uses and multi-unit housing in the form of row housing, Kinglet Gardens? We have Alicia Shillington to answer questions only. She's here. Kevin Buckes to answer questions only. Kevin, are you there? Good afternoon. Thank you, and we have no one opposed. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.11, Charter Bylaw 19998, to rezone land for residential development in the Charlesworth neighborhood? Uh, Alicia Shillington to answer questions only. She's here. Katrina Rowe to answer questions only. Katrina, are you there? I am. Good afternoon. Thank you. And we have no one opposed. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.12, Charter Bylaw 19997, to allow for single detached housing, the Uplands? Uh, we have Rihanna Rahman to answer questions only. In favor? Rihanna, are you there? Good afternoon. Thank you. And we have no one in opposition. Items 3.13 and 3.14 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to bylaw 20003 to amend the Riverview Area Structure Plan or bylaw 20004 to amend the Uplands Neighborhood Structure Plan? We have in favor Yolanda Lu to answer questions only. She's here. Keith Davies to answer questions only. Keith, are you there? Yes, hello, good afternoon. Thank you, and Doug Vanderbrink to answer questions only. Doug, are you there? Good afternoon. Thank you, and we have no one in opposition. Are you, sir, just told them, sir, are you here to present on 3.13 and 3.14, the Riverview ASP Uplands NSP? Yeah, I And are you in opposition, or are you in favor of it? <laughs> I know, I know, I, did, I know the dilemma, but uh, for procedural, uh, in favor, so you, you want to make a presentation in favor of it, or you want to just answer questions only? Uh, if, it's, if it's only exempted for discussion, then we will discuss it, if otherwise, no. So it has to be selected for discussion. Uh, council members would select it if they wish to do so. But if you want to speak to it, you can register to speak. So if you would come up to the clerk, right, they will take your name and they will let me know your name. Yeah, then uh, you can uh, uh, register, then we will acknowledge you.
it's just a category we have to identify people in. I know sometimes it's pretty, can be confusing. Can you give me a, a person's name? Uh, David Bhutan has registered to speak in favor and would like to make a presentation on items 3.13, 3.14. David. All right. David Bhutan in favor. All right. And would like to make a presentation. And we have no one in opposition. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.15, bylaw 19989, closure of an undeveloped portion of road right of way, Cromdale? We have no one in favor and we have no one in opposition. Items 3.16 and 3.17 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to Charter Bylaw 19994 to allow for low intensity commercial office residential and service uses Glenwood? Apologies, I said those backwards. Or item 3.16 Bylaw 19993 to amend the Jasper Place Area Redevelopment Plan. We have uh... Laila Gogan to answer questions only. Laila, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. And uh, uh, Jennifer Vald Vald Valdez, Valdez to answer questions only. Jennifer? Okay, no. And we have no one in opposition. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.18, bylaw 19996, to close a portion of Road of Malmo Plains? We have in favor Jen Rutledge to answer questions only. Jen, are you there? I'm here. Good afternoon. Thank you. And we have no one in opposition. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.19, charter bylaw 20009, to allow for small scale infill development, Sherwood? We have no one in favor, and we have no one in opposition. Uh, apologies. Oh, sorry, we do have one in opposition. Uh, Carolyn Whitehouse. Carolyn, are you there? I'm here, yes. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, okay. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.20, Charter Bylaw 19995, to allow for industrial businesses and limited compatible non-industrial businesses, King Edward Park? We have in favor Ryan Edick to answer questions only. Ryan, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. And we have no one in opposition. Items. 3.21 and 3.22 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to bylaw 20005, amendment to the Griesbaugh neighborhood area structure plan, or charter bylaw 20006 to allow for multi-unit housing up to six stories in the village center Griesbaugh? We have in favor Samir Ramatula. Uh, Samir, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. And uh, I'd like to present if the item selected. Thank you. And Belinda Morel, Morel Smith. Brenda, yes, good afternoon. I am here. And uh, same as Samir, I would like to present if the item is selected. Thank you. In opposition, we have Barry Jahal. Barry, are you there? Barry? Nope. Okay. We just hold on. Barry? Are you, I see you there, okay. You're there, right, Barry, can you say you're there? I saw you momentarily. I see that they've unmuted. They may just have to uh, log out of the meter, log back in. Okay, all right, I saw him there, he was there, okay. Can we move, go to the next one? Items 3.23 and 3.24 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to bylaw 20007 to amend the Oliver Area Redevelopment Plan or charter bylaw 20008 to allow for a medium rise multi unit housing development, Oliver? We have in favor Ian Morgan. Ian, are you there? I am, you're in the hall, you're at the chamber hall, thank you. And Dolores Nord. Dolores, are you there? I see your, uh, it is your hand, Dolores. 
We see you. Yeah, I'm here. Good, thank you. All right. So those were the bylaws for discussion and the people here to speak. Now we go into exemptions. Bylaws to be selected for debate. I'll go to Councillor Hamilton. Hi, I'll, I'll select 3.13 and 3.14 since we have a, a speaker in the affirmative on that. 3.13 and the other one was? Uh, actually, I think, I, uh, sorry, I said, yeah, 3.13 and 3.14. 3.13, 3.14. Councillor Salvador. Uh, yes, I'd like to select uh, 3.8. 3.9 and 3.21. So 3.8, 3.9, and sorry? 3.21. 3.21. Uh, Mr. Mayor, right. just 3.22 is also dealt with with 3.21, so they both have to be selected. 3.21. Two, two, got it. Okay. Yes, selected by Councillor Salvador. Okay, Councillor Rutherford. I was going to select three point two two, um, but now I'm not. So, yep. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Rice. I would like to select three point one. Uh, 3.3 .3 and 3.4, so they must select it together. 3.3, 3.4, yep. Uh, and also 3.7. 3.7, okay. Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to select uh, 3.6 and excuse me, 3.23 and 3.24, which I believe have a, a speaker. 3.6, sorry, what was the other one, sorry? Uh, 3.6 and then 3.23 and 3.24. 3.23, 3 3.24, okay. Uh, Councillor Jans. Sorry, I'm just going through the list here. So uh, can I confirm that... Um, 321 and 322 were selected and 323 and 324 were selected? Yes. And 36, 38, 39 were selected? Sorry. Three point, was 3.6, 3.8, and 3.9 selected? Yeah. And then 3.11, was that selected? No. Nope. Okay, I'll select that one. Thank you. 31, 311, right? Yeah. Okay. All right, and uh, Councillor Hamilton, I see you back on the board. Yeah, just for good measure. I, I, I forgot to select item 3.19. 3.9, 3.19, okay. Yeah. All right. Mr. Mayor, confirming that 3.2 should be selected as well. Yeah, I'm as just there looking at 3.2. 3.2 needs to be selected, right? 3.2. 3.2, yes, there is a speaker who would like to make a presentation. Okay, I'll select that. Okay. So, Madam Clerk, can someone, we need to move the balance, right? Yes, please. Councillor Cartmel? Thank you, Marisohi. I will move closure of the public hearing on items 3.5, 3.10. 3 3.12, 3.15, 3.16, 3.17, 3.18, and 3.20. Thank you, Councillor Cardmel. Seconded by? Second. Second. Councillor Rice. Any questions? See none. Please vote. Looking for Councillor Hamilton's vote. We have all the votes. 
Display the votes, please. That is carried. Sorry, someone really wants to talk to me. Uh, I will move first reading of items 3.5, 3.10, 3.12, 3.13, 3.14, 3.15, 3.16, 3.17, 3.18, 3.19, 3.20, 3.21, 3.22, 3.23, 3.24, 3.25, 3.26, 3.27, 3.28, 3.29, 3.30, 3.31, 3.32, 3.33, 3.34, 3.35, 3.36, 3.37, 3.38, 3.39, 3.40, 3.41, 3.42, 3.43, 3.44, 3.45, 3.46, 3.47, 3.48, 3.49, 3.50, 3.51, 3.52, 3.53, 3.54, 3.55, 3.56, 3.57, 3.58, 3.59, 3.60, 3.61, 3.62, 3.63, 3.64, 3.65, 3.66, 3.67, 3.68, 3.69, 3.70, 3.71, 3.72, 3.73, 3.74, 3.75, 3.76, 3.77, 3.78, 3.79, 3.80, 3.81, 3.82, 3.83, 3.84, 3.85, 3.86, 3.87, 3.88, 3.89, 3.90, 3.91, 3.92, 3.93, 3.94, 3.95, 3.96, 3.97, 3.98, 3.99, 3.10, 3.11, 3.12, 3.13, 3.14, 3.15, 3.16, 3.17, 3.18, 3.19, 3.20, 3.21, 3.22, 3.23, 3.24, 3.25, 3.26, 3.27, 3.28, 3.29, 3.30, 3.31, 3.32, 3.33, 3.34, 3.35, 3.36, 3.37, 3.38, 3.39, 3.40, 3.41, 3.42, 3.43, 3.44, 3.45, 3.46, 3.47, 3.48, 3.49, 3.50, 3.51, 3.52, 3.53, 3.54, 3.55, 3.56, 3.57, 3.58, 3.59, 3.10, 3.11, 3.12, 3.13, 3.14, 3.15, 3.16, 3.17, 3.18, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 3.20, 
that is carried. And thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll move that um, these items be referred back to administration. That's 3.8, right? 3.3 and 3.4. And we're just pulling it up on the... Uh, oh, you we brought them forward. Now we have to refer them. Okay, yes, cool. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And Please seconded by please. Councillor Cartmel, right? Refer back. Second, yep. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, call the vote, please. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to move that we bring item, um, sorry, th three, oh, three, eight forward. Yeah, 3.8, right? 19965. Yeah. That's, yeah. Okay. Seconded by Councillor Cartmel. Second, thank, yep. Thank you. Any questions to bring this item forward? Seeing none, call the vote. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And I'd now like to move that we uh, refer back item 3.8 uh, or charter by law 19965. Second. Second by Councillor Cartmel. Any questions? Seeing none, call the vote. Sorry, um, I clicked in too slow on this. Um, can you just provide a rationale for referring re re referring back? Is that is that to the mover or to administration? Uh, probably to administration. <laughs> to, to administration. Hi, uh, Travis here. Uh, so item 3.8, uh, that's the one we're looking for yeah. clarification. Yeah. So 3.8, uh, the applicant uh, did not put up a rezoning sign in time. Uh, so as per our requirements, we have to have the rezoning sign up prior to the public hearing. So the surrounding neighborhoods or neighbors are uh, notified through that method. Uh, so for that reason, it's being postponed until the sign is up. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Any other questions? Seeing none. So, uh, sorry, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Uh, the referral motion back just mentions the update to two regulations. It's up. Would they, would they would have to put up the sign to comply with the regulations, right? Sorry, I might be able to just um, allay some confusion here. So that previous one was about a, a number of regulations, I think, in the direct control counselor. And Mr. Pollock, please correct me if I'm wrong. 3.19 is where there was some on-site signage that needed to go up in time. And so that would be the one that we would look at subsequent to this, Councillor Stevenson. So correct Perfect. me if I'm wrong, planning coordination and Mr. Pollock, but I believe that should sort that out for you, Councillor Stevenson. Uh, that is correct. My apologies. Uh, 3.8 is just looking to update uh, a couple of regulations in line with the developer's intent, which requires uh, re-advertising. Um, and 3.19 is the signage mishap. Great. No, no further questions. Thanks so okay. much for the clarity. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Okay. Please vote. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Um, Mr. Mayor, I'll move that we uh, bring three item 319 forward. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Second by Councillor Second. Cartmel. To bring it forward, any questions? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Thank you, and I'll now move that we refer back Charter Bylaw 2009, um, 
to allow for time for posting the necessary signage. Thank you. Second. Councillor Cartmel seconded it. Any questions? Seeing none, call the vote. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Councillor Stevenson? Councillor Stevenson? Can you refer them more? Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Could we? No, I thought we just did. That was the referral motion. That was the referral. I am not following the direction. I, there you go. I mean, the good news and is we have just done a lot of work. Three items. We've done a lot of work. It's a record. In uh, 40 minutes. Okay, I'm just going through my list. Everything that needs to be referred is referred. Okay. We are going into our first item, 3.1. Yes. Yep. Administration, uh, got a presentation. Hello, uh, Your Worship and Councillors. This item was discussed quite comprehensively uh, in November at Executive Committee and then received first reading on December 1st at Council. We're more than happy to make introductory remarks if that pleases uh, Council, but we're also happy to go to questions if you would prefer that given uh, how busy your agenda is. Your call. Introductory remarks, council members? Sure, go ahead. We will benefit from introductory remarks, Ms. Wine. Thank you. Yeah. I'll dive right yeah. in. Yeah. Um, today I'm joined by Mary Sturgeon, Charity, who is the branch manager for reputation and brand, Charity Dyke, uh, director of brand integration, and Olivia Ballone, director of the zoning bylaw renewal project. Jesse Inkpen from Legal Services is also here to help with any legal clarifications should you need them. Second slide, please. Prior to 2017, the Municipal Government Act required municipalities to advertise public notifications in general circulation newspapers. In 2017, the province revised the MGA. This revision provided municipalities the opportunity to consider alternative advertising methods. With that change, the city passed our public no notification bylaw in 2019. The public notification bylaw states that to meet the public notification requirements of the MGA, we will use the municipal website, edmonton.ca, and at least one non-internet based method. For site specific advertising, that is a single lot or two or more lots that are subject to a single land development application, the city committed to use mail notification for its non-internet based advertising method. For city or area-wide advertising, the, submit, the city committed to post physical notices in the Edmonton Service Centre in Edmonton Tower for the non-internet based advertising method. These methods are the minimum required notification. Alongside required advertising methods, we strategically determine additional methods of notification as necessary to increase our reach, such as posting on City of Edmonton social media platforms, notification by mail or email to relevant stakeholders, including business improvement areas, community leagues, senior serving organizations, social agencies, and libraries, direct mail, roadside signs, out of home, interior and exterior transit, digital and static billboards, digital signage in recreation centers, for example. Advertisements with local media, newspaper, radio, television, etc., and posting information signs on site physically. For those members of council who participated in the contract advertising discussion at executive committee on November the 10th, you may recall us mentioning that the legal requirements for public notification 
within the Provincial Expropriation Act. This act has not been amended by the province and so still requires the city to post public notifications about expropriations in newspapers of general circulation. And now over to Mary Spurgeon to explain the specifics of the proposed change. Thanks, Katrin. Today, we are bringing forward two amendments to adjust the way that legally required adver advertisements and notification may be carried out by the city under the um, Municipal Government Act. The table on this slide shows a before and after view to demonstrate the change we are recommending in this bylaw amendment. First is to modernize our notification approach in the bylaw to focus on the municipal website, that is edmonton.ca. We are proposing that edmonton.ca, which had more than 20 million visits over the past year, be the foundational method for legally required advertisements alongside mail outs for site specific advertisements and public service announcements for citywide rezonings. Second, is the addition of a section in the public notification bylaw that addresses digital notification met methods for large scale rezonings, which Livia Ballone will speak about shortly. We believe that using edmonton.ca as our legally required method for advertising provides a more timely and accessible option for individuals who are unlikely to visit a physical bricks and mortar location. <clears throat> It also addresses unforeseen circumstances, excuse me, it also addresses unforeseen circumstances, such as what we've experienced during the pandemic, where access to physical locations, including the Edmonton Service Center, were impacted by public health me measures. While physical locations were closed, digital information sources were always open and accessible. We believe the current requirement of posting legal notifications in the service center has minimal meaningful impact or value for Edmontonians in being informed about development rezonings. A digital approach is more straightforward, efficient to maintain, and a more timely and accessible method for public notification. I want to stress that using the city's website as our legally required notification method does not limit us from employing other communications tactics and tools to inform the public. The requirements in the table shown here are our minimum requirements. We can and do use many other tactics to inform Edmontonians about changes that may matter to them. I'll now hand things over to Livia, who will step you through the proposed approach to address notifications around large scale rezonings. Thank you, Mary. As you can see on the slide, large scale re rezoning notification will only apply when there's a bylaw to rezone more than 500 parcels of land at once. This is equivalent to approximately 25 city blocks. This method is targeted in its scope and application and will be used for large scale city projects like the zoning bylaw renewal initiative in the future. So just to clarify, the Municipal Government Act requires that the city provide written notification to property owners when their land is being considered for rezoning. Traditionally, this notice has been given through direct mail. However, the city charter regulation provides the city the authority to create a process of giving notice of a rezoning by electronic means, where the proposed amendment would affect more than 500 parcels of land. The Zoning Bylaw Renewal Initiative represents the first time the city has contemplated a rezoning bylaw that impacts 500 or more parcels at one time. In addition to the city's website, Edmontonians will be advised of the citywide rezoning through a combination of tactics. These tactics will likely include information contained in direct mail taxation notices, citywide advertisement campaigns. So we're gonna do traffic signs, print and digital billboards, newspaper ads, social media campaigns, 311 and other de dedicated staff resources, public service announcements and media relations, stakeholder presentations and engagements and workshops and other digital communications. And that's the end of our presentation. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. We don't have any uh, members of public signed to, uh, to speak, and so I can directly go into questions uh, of admin. Councillor Rice, you selected this item, right? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes. So I, can, I you, can you click in to uh, ask questions? Can you sign up to ask questions? There you go. Go ahead. Um, I select this item and specifically I do appreciate the opportunity uh, from administration to give us a fresh um, what it is changed about. And because back to my member trends, 2021, we just select in and swear in. And then and right now we have the a better understanding and how the city's business going, how the communication of the is going. And I think this is a great opportunity. Um, so I just want to clarify if a few things um, be, will be very quick. So the first one is about, and based on the change right now, and for the large scale, uh, advertise, we only use itemon.ca, right? We're not use uh, traditional news or, or any mails out as a message and based on the table presented today. So the, requ so the requirement right now for large scale rezonings prior to this bylaw would, would be that we would need to uh, notify um, uh, every property owner in Edmonton of the large scale rezoning by mail, by direct notice. So what this bylaw is proposing is that we don't do that mail noticed out, but we look at other opportunities, of course, our website, but then look at other opportunities um, to get the word out about the large scale rezoning. Uh, do we still do tra traditional newsletter uh, advertising? So currently for rezoning applications, um, we advertise in the paper and we do direct mail notices. Uh, I'm talking about the emphasis bylaw is is passed as a change. And so do we still do the mailing out and do we still do traditional newspaper advertising or only keep one option and doing Edmund.ca uh, website advertise? On broad-based advertising counselor, we have the option to use all of the tools at our disposal as we need to. Um, what this does is change the requirement for a, for direct mailing out to individual um, property owners. So for this for this change for this change, uh, I I think I should ask a different way. And for this change, and is the only method we use, and right now, and based on the the table and presented and in today's presentation. So we only do item on that CA. That's the minimum requirement, counselor. Okay. It, is by, it is by no means the only way that we would communicate large scale change. And and and, and I, I know that you know that the zoning bylaw for Edmonton, the new zoning bylaw is large scale change. So we would deploy a mix of methods to get that message out to Edmontonians. Okay, uh, thank you. That is uh, one question I have. And the another question is about the budget uh, implication. Uh, can you tell me a little bit of detail about the budget uh, implication uh, for this change as a result? Mary, are you able to speak to the budget implications? My, my sense here is that uh, they are minimal, but I'll, 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 I'll let you layer in any detail. Um, will we save money on legally required ads? Um, there's a potential for cost savings counselor, but um, other methods, we often employ other methods from a communications perspective to make sure that we have a broad reach. So um, while, uh, while we might see a, a, an adjustment in, a down in our advertising costs, we might incur costs uh, th through those other, other communications methods. 
uh, for me to ask this question and then because this question is linked back, uh, like last year we approved city council, city council approved, I believe this three million and then for the advertise with traditional newspapers. Uh, so if we right now change this minimum requirement to more focus on the digital method, how that impact could uh, either reduce the advertise on the traditional newspaper or we still keep the same around advertisement on the traditional uh, media newspapers. Um, we would be downplaying our dependence on traditional media counselor, which, um, which downplays the budget. But as Ms. Sturgeon said, um, we still have an obligation to let Edmontonians know what's going on. And even digital advertising, for example, incurs costs. Sorry, Mary, I interrupted you there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Okay. Thank you. My time is out. Yeah. And I see no more questions. Would you like to move the uh, uh, closing of the bylaw? Uh, yes. Yeah, I would like, I would like to move the bylaw, the public hearing and chart bylaw one nine nine one eight, uh, be closed. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Seconded by. Second. Councillor Principe. Any questions? Call the vote. Just looking for Councillor Tang's vote. Uh, yes, from me. Thank you, Councillor Tang. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And Councillor Rice, I'll come to you for moving yes. of the second and third reading. Yes, I, I could. I move that chart by law 19918 be read a second time. Second by Councillor Prince Bay. Right. Second. Thank you, Councillor Prince Bay. Any questions? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. Point of order. Yes. Oh, never mind. We did the first reading in December. Never mind. I was yes. like, oh, did we miss the first reading? Thank <laughs> no, you. Sorry. No worries. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Uh, please vote. Just looking for Councillor to vote. We have all 13 votes. Got it. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Councillor Rice. I move that chart by now 19918 be read a third time. Second. Second by Councillor Prince Bay. Any questions? None. Call the vote. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Thank you, Councillor Rice and Councillor Prince Bay. Now we go into our next item, which is 3.2 Charter Bylaw 19986 to allow for multi unit housing on the ground floor of a residentially converted hotel, Strathcona Junction. Admin? For our presentation? Thank you. Good afternoon. This application proposes a minor change to an existing DC-1 or direct development control provision to convert the ground floor of a hotel to a residential use in the Strathcona Junction neighborhood. The upper three stories of this former hotel have already been converted to residential and that's in the form of supportive housing for a total of 72 units. If this rezoning is approved, it will add 13 more units and complete the conversion of this building. That would be 85 units in total. Next slide, please. The site is located on University Avenue between Gateway Boulevard and Calgary Trail. 
and the city has provided advance notice to 222 surrounding residences, residents. We heard from four people with comments and the comments were more related to the operation of supportive housing in this location, as opposed to the impacts of converting this floor to a residential use. Two people were supportive, indicating that this was a good location and that we need more of this in the city. And two people were concerned with the perceived negative impacts from supportive housing developments. Next slide, please. The Strathcona Junction Area Redevelopment Plan, or ARP, is intended to facilitate a transition from the industrial, the existing industrial land uses towards an urban style commercial mix. The plan does allow for residential opportunities. However, these are expected to be in the upper stories of buildings with commercial uses at ground level. The current DC-1 therefore restricts residential uses at a ground level. Administration is recommending an exception to the plan as very little transition has occurred since the plan adoption, which means there are still many opportunities that allow the area to more fully realize the plan in the future. In addition, the changes would apply to only this site and the existing building and administration sees no commercial uses at ground level as a minor trade-off for helping to address the pressing issue of houselessness in Edmonton. The use of the site aligns with the city plan's big city moves to be inclusive and compassionate with the goal of having nobody in core housing need and having no chronic episode, episodic houselessness in Edmonton. This rezoning will help achieve this by facilitating the full conversion of this former hotel to supportive housing. Next slide, please. Administration supports this application because it will increase housing diversity in the city. It helps achieve city plans, inclusive and compassionate goals. And the use generally aligns with the Strathcona Junction Area Redevelopment Plan. This concludes what concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. We have a number of uh, members of public, uh, most uh, all in favor. Uh, I, I'll call the names Tyler, Kawaguchi to answer questions only, Gavin Hardik to answer questions only, but Keys Prince here to make a presentation, right? Keys, right, so you're there. Uh, Michael DeWolf, I'll ask again uh, to questions or to make a presentation. I don't if, believe Michael will be not, joining us. Not, not joining us. And just to confirm, I believe Taylor does have a presentation. Oh, Taylor does have a presentation, okay. So we'll go. Hi, uh, just a point of clarity here. I have a presentation just, just available if council would like to hear it, but I do feel like administration has covered um, a lot of the context of this. So I do feel like the um, the applicants and the members of public here will be able to address any questions. So okay. uh, I'm yes. willing to present if you'd like, but I'm also happy to just address any questions that council has. Well, council members, if they have questions to, uh, to you, they'll come to you to ask those questions. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. All right, and Megan Shuring is also for questions only. All right, uh, Mr. Prince, over to you. Uh, I uh, am totally in favor of what's going to happen in our neighborhood. We own a property on s between Calgary Trail and the Gateway Boulevard on 71st Avenue. And we're also designing at the moment a project for Avian Met that's between uh, 71st Avenue and 68th Avenue, right along the Gateway Boulevard. Um, I, I would like to have a little bit of history here. When I was on the Edmonton Design Committee a few years ago, uh, the city planning department brought in an incredible exciting proposal on the laneway that was running basically from Wright Avenue all the way up to Argyle Road. And we thought as, as architects and designers, what a great idea and I think it would put our city on the map, but slowly but surely, I think it has become a kind of a dream scheme. Quite a few years back, there was the, the Such um, campus of Nate and we, and the design committee suggested that they would turn the building around and face the laneway partially to get some activity 
we were told by the director from Nate that was responsible for their campuses, uh, we do what we feel like doing because we have the charter right from universities and colleges. So they can basically do what they feel like doing on their properties. Anyway, we asked them if they could delete the overhead doors and maybe do the cafeteria in, in, in the lane side, but they didn't do that. Then, then this time around uh, with the hotel that was already built, we taking a bite out of that whole exciting plan that was, was put together by the planning department to make it in a beautiful cycling and walking path. And right now the only people that walk there are the people that bring empty bottles to the uh, bottle depot that's along Calgary Trail. Um, we we have, have true feelings for the people, this, particularly the street people. We looked after Brad Pennycook, a street person, for 20 years. He, he, he lived in our backyard where the office is. And unfortunately, last year, Brad died of kidney failure. But nevertheless, he was at home in our backyard. And I always promised him that we would build him a nice little, single little facility. And he said, Mr. Prince, I don't need anything of this stuff. I am very happy what you guys already built for me. And we were probably very illegal or whatever in an industrial site to have some kind of single housing for a street person. But a guy lived for many, many years and he became a true friend to all the guys in our office too. Um, last year, the University of Calgary organized an, an, an international architectural ideas competition. and and it was just after Brett had died. I said, well, we have done all the work already. Let's send in what, what we were proposing to do for Brett. And here we had designed basically an 80 square feet home with everything in it. And, and, and um, I think the, the jury of the competition must have thought quite highly about this because there were over 450, close to 500 entries in this competition from 57 countries in the world. And we made it to the list of finalists. There were 19 out of them. They awarded six honorary mentions and two winners out of it. But our little 80 square feet, unfortunately, we didn't go any further, but, but there were huge projects that were multi-millions of, of value with proposals of our ideas and architecture and, and what could happen. But we felt quite proud of it. And But one thing that, that really bothers me, that every time a new development seems to happen along the, the Gateway Boulevard and, and the Calgary Trail, is that we starting to lose that street face to the lane which the planners had in mind. And I think from, from excitement, we need commercial stuff there and, and, and places where people meet. And, and I, I, every single unit, we, we did it with one house for, for a street person. Here, I think we have over 80 people. We cut off the street, basically have a home. But I was really hoping that that street face would be there, and, and unfortunately, I think we taking another bite out of this fantastic design. So my red light is flashing, <laughs> so I think that's set enough. Thank you for, my, for your attention. Thank you so much for being here. Really, really appreciate your uh, compassion and uh, care. Uh, Councillor Stevenson? Uh, yes, I just echo the mayor's thank you for, for being here. Um, I did have a question for, um, for the mustard seeds. I'm not sure who, who wanted to weigh in. Just wondering if there will um, be some common amenity space in, in this development with the redevelopment of that ground floor. Will there be any programming or shared meal space uh, provided in the building? I can answer that. Um, there will be a common space, but it will not be uh, a, like where we have a commercial kitchen where people will come to dine. They will have their own individual uh, enclosed apartments for themselves. Um, but there is a space where they can do uh, 
like a community room. Um, we would have employment coaches coming in. We would have elders coming in. We would have chaplains. We would have uh, job searches, um, some advocacy coming into that space. So yes, in the main area, there will still be a space for community activities. Perfect. Thank you so much. Those are all the questions I had, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor uh, Rutherford, can you take a chair quickly, if you don't mind, please? So taken. Thank you. I, I really want to commend everyone uh, working on this, uh, this project. I do have a couple of questions about the, uh, the total number of uh, Edmontonians who will be accommodated in this place. Any, any numbers if you could share with us? I can speak a little bit to that. So um, the current development is 72 units. And so this uh, proposed DC1 text amendment would allow for an additional 13 more units on the main floor for a total of 85 Edmontonians that would uh, be able to take advantage of this housing opportunity. Okay, so th 13 additional units. Okay, got it. Thank you. And uh, the... The provision of uh, wraparound around services. I don't know if it's, I can ask that question. I'm looking at our legal on the the provision of wraparound around services for uh, in in this unit. In um, the unit. I think, Councillor, I would. Uh, sorry, Councillor, Mr. Mayor, my apologies. Um, I think I would stick to sort of those okay, land use considerations the, within the. Take yeah, to the thank end. You. Okay. You know, I. Uh, no, that's all you needed to know. I. Uh, 13 people will be accommodated. That's, uh, you know, for those 13 people, that's life-changing experience. So thank you for that. Yeah, okay. I'll take the chair back. Take the chair back. And uh, I see no more questions on this. Uh, I know this is, Const oh, sorry, Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have a question to administration. I don't know is the time to ask right yeah, now. Well, just, or just, I'll, we'll come to that in a minute, Councillor Right, I just want to make okay. sure that no one else has questions to uh, the members of the public. Right. So, uh, all right. And there's no new information to be uh, asked about to the members of the public. Add to the question. And this time we're going to go to the Minra as well, right? for new information. Yeah. The Councilor Rice can go to admin now. You, yeah. You've yeah. finished your questions. We have nobody in opposition. You can proceed to ask questions of administration. Got it. Mr. Okay. Mayor. Yeah. Yep. Go ahead, Councilor Rice. Uh, thank you, Ms. Chair. Uh, I think I realize this hotel actually close to the university and then uh, University Ave. And so I saw in the report uh, regarding uh, the community insights results, there are four response received, uh, they, uh, but I didn't see the detail about the response. And is can administration provides the, uh, what's the response look like for this uh, community uh, engagement? Sure. Thank you for the question, Grace. Um, uh, a few different examples of the uh, feedback we received, um, that it's a good central south side location. Um, the area has already enough problems associated with homelessness. The area does not have the resources that homeless people need. Um, the area that the engagement seems lacking uh, the project must be developed, including a safety and security plan. Um, it just, does that give you sort of a sense of, of the feedback, or would you like to hear a bit more? Uh, I would like to hear a little bit more, and because you mentioned about safety and the security, so is there any plan and in place and the coordinating and between all the organizations and including university and less to either reports and how we implement that safety and the security plan in that area. So for that question specifically, um, I'd like to refer you back um, 
to the applicant um, what was under consideration for administration wasn't um, the operation, it was the residential land use at, on the ground floor of this building. I can speak to um, what we've set out in our community plan and our good neighbor plan. Um, also, we have sent out a survey that was held in uh, January and February. I think the end of January, I'm not quite sure. We had it up and uh, we heard some things about the security, um, obviously issues, but we had already pre-planned and have had a walkthrough with the, M the EPS and they have made suggestions. Um, we've done a SEPTED report on the space. Um, so we do have a plan for 24 hour uh, staffing. We also have fobs, uh, security fobs for people coming in and out. And uh, for Excuse also- Excuse me, just I, Megan, I have to stop you. I'm so sorry. Uh, these are questions to admin, right? So, uh, uh, um, Mr. So Mayor, this, yeah. if it assists, maybe Councillor Rice can catch that on. Uh, and under new information. That's correct. Yeah, if yeah. you have questions to the proponent, Councillor Rice, on safety issues, you can come back after we're done with admin, right? So, uh, uh, this is time for question to administration at this time. Okay. Sorry, Megan, to stop you about that. Just okay. following the process. <laughs> it's got, okay, go ahead, Councillor Rice. So, um, yeah, yeah um, so because I asked a question uh, to the admin actually, uh, and regarding the safety yeah. and then security and plan and easy neighborhoods, that's why. I'll give uh, you another minute in your, because your last minute was gone. So go ahead if you have another question to admin. Okay, so I will stop here and then, uh, leave my time and for my colleagues. Okay, good, thank you. Councillor Stevenson. Yes, just a very quick question to admin just around um, the, the uses that are included in the zone. So I understand that, uh, you know, this development was seen as, as fitting within the multi, uh, sorry, the multi-unit uh, use. Um, but I noticed that we didn't take this opportunity to add in the supportive housing use. Um, Again, maybe maybe recognizing that that you know there there was sense in that in terms of timelines, that just the scope of this particular amendment. But wondering if administration has a policy in place that uh, you know by practice, any time a DC with multi-unit housing is being amended, that 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 new supportive housing use is being added in. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, there isn't a policy, but there's a practice uh, that when there's multi-family unit housing in any of our we'll call it legacy zones, whether they're DCs or special areas, uh, that supportive housing would be added in. Uh, for this one, particularly, there are some time pressures uh, around uh, getting this to council and uh, getting the development permit for uh, granting purposes uh, and adding the supportive housing use wouldn't, couldn't have been just restricted to the site. It would have had to open up the entire Strathcona Junction, which would have added uh, additional public consultation and a longer timeline to the application. So for that reason, we decided not to include it uh, because the multi-unit housing would be sufficient for the needs as described by the mustard seed. Perfect. Yeah, I really appreciate council expedit. Oh, sorry, administration expediting this this application and this instance. I think that's that was a great approach, um, and really pleased to hear that that there is that practice moving forward. That that the opportunity is taken when it comes up, just so that in the future other. Uh, other developments may may be able to avoid going through a rezoning process altogether uh, and be able to provide that really highly needed uh, housing in our in our community. But thank you, great great work, great to see this coming forward. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson, Councillor Jans. Thank you. I just want to say, as the word, can I can I comment or can I only ask questions right now? You can ask questions when uh, the bylaw is closed, then uh, you can speak to that at that time. Okay, I'm, I'm ready to speak to it. I think this is outstanding. Okay, good, we'll wait for that. Councillor Knack. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just one question, just hearing some of the earlier questions, I wanna double check it. It's uh, from legal, it's Ms. Inkman is here with us today, right? That... Yes. That's there. correct, yeah. Councillor. Uh, Ms. Inkman, I just wanna double check. Um, you know, and I appreciate why sometimes the questions of something like a security plan or safety plan come up. 
Um, but I, I want to just double check that that wouldn't be relevant to this land use decision before us. It would be a very relevant conversation to have with the provider at a separate time, but I don't think we can use that to influence our decision today, correct? Well, Councillor, I think that security is a broad concept is a relevant land use consideration. If we look at our um, zoning bylaw, we talk about SEPTED principles, so um, crime prevention through environmental design. So security of, of a development is not irrelevant. And so I think um, wading too deep into the details of these sorts of things uh, could start to border on irrelevant, and I certainly will be here to uh, catch you if that does happen. But the question of is this going to be a secure development is a relevant question. What, okay, that's helpful. What would it be safe to say that, that security may be based on the outside? I guess what I'm trying to make sure I, I uh, that there's that we're not stepping on any toes here, but if we're talking about security related to uh, you know the clients that might be inside the building. That that is not something we we would be taking into account. Whereas maybe the design of the building and how it impacts safety would be more relevant. Is that is that fair? I I think, Councillor. Um... You know, I, I think it's a bit of a, a line that we have to walk with this, but but certainly understanding that the development is safe in terms of how it is constructed is a relevant consideration. Um, and I understand where you're headed. We we certainly don't zone for the users, but just you know the question of is there security at a place uh, or at a at a development, I think is is probably relevant in this context. That's helpful. Okay, yeah. great. I just wanted to make sure I was understanding that. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. What's wrong with my questions? Thank you, Councillor Nat. So, Councillor Rice, questions to admin. If you uh, do that, no, I, I just want to finish the question and I want to give the opportunity to, to just, make and yeah, finish that. We have to move a second round. Councillor Nack, can you move? Uh, second? Happy to move that, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Nack. Second. second by Councillor Stevenson. Any questions on the second round? Seeing none. Call the vote. Okay. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay. Now, Councillor Rice, go ahead to uh, questions to admin. You're on See, mute. Oh, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Mayor, um, thank you for this. And, and then my question is still, and I would like to give the opportunity uh, to make for last run and when you stopped. No, no, no worries, no worries. Finish, yeah, yeah, to finish that. And so my question is not about the user for the uh, safety and the security, it's about the impo uh, impact and how this mind rezoning and impact and around the environment. And from that perspective, the safety and the security. And is there any plan in place? Is there anything uh, from mind developer perspective and how we can ensure that safety and the security in the, around the area? I, so if no, you're- No, sorry, if you're, this again. Taylor, this, this, sorry, this, is this question for no, administration this, or this, is it for this, the- No, yeah. this is a question to administration uh, yet. Still to administration. Okay, thank this you. is a oh. question to administration. Councillor, thanks for the question. Um, from administrative perspective, the application at hand is uh, a very slight adjustment to allow multi-unit housing on the ground floor. Uh, and due to that, um, and not uh, looking at the users of the group or of the application, we uh, recommended support. So we did not look at the overall security or uh, safety of the neighborhood in reviewing the application. So, Ms. Mayor, can I defer my question and to uh, to applicant? Yes, you can. I Just have to wait for uh, for this part to be concluded to admin. Once we're done with the administration, then we can come back to uh, uh, to the uh, uh, the proponent of the application. Okay. Okay, good, thank you. Councillor Prince Bay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my question to admin is why, why um, originally was it, did it not allow for ground floor units? Thank you for the question, Councillor Prince Bay. So the Strathcona Junction Area Redevelopment Plan 
Um, it sees this area as transitioning to more urban styled commercial. Um, so more walkable, more vibrant, um, and given that the primary primary uses that exist already are industrial, moving to office uses, that you would see people moving in and out of businesses from uh, the ground level, and that residential would be above. Okay, that, I see that answers my question. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Principe. Any any more questions to admin? I see none. Then I can go back to the uh, any clarifying questions to the uh, members of the public and the proponent. So, Councillor Rice, this would be your opportunity to ask questions to uh, to the proponents. If you could sign up, go ahead. Now, go ahead. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just want to continue the conversation um, in the first round. Uh, make and you are talking about. Can you just continue to finish the points? Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, yes. Um, so we have taken into account, um, you know, that there's going to be 85 new people moving into this into this environment. Um, we are doing a lot of things around security. As I indicated, we've had the Edmonton City Police walk through with us. I've talked to the um, BEATS officers uh, in the area about having agency status. Um, we do have uh, security 20, like we have our staffing, it's the staff 24 uh, seven. We have appropriate and ex extensive cameras, et cetera, around the area. Also in our um, lease agreements that we'll be writing up with folks who move in, there are um, expectations around usage, just like it would be in any apartment building that you would move into. Um, and we do hope to have more of a, one of the other things that we wanted to do is become part of the community. So things that we've written in as being, you know, part of the community league, um, we would be part of having uh, different events going on. Um, maybe it's a garage sale, maybe it's a barbecue, maybe it's whatever that looks like. But we do know that when you, anyone takes ownership and, and becomes part of a community that they're in, they're much more respectful of it. And this is permanent housing. This is someone's permanent home. So we're hoping to involve them in all of those areas, which then of course reduces crime um, because they own it. They become part of the neighborhood. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, so if it's a, it's a permanent home, do we have specific criteria and how we uh, conduct the intake and for this home? Councillor, I like, just, I'm oh, sorry, just before you jump in, sorry, Meg, I think you're um, wading into sort of the idea of, of talking about users. And so I would yeah. caution you not to talk about the intake of individuals living at this property. So that's the legal advice from our legal counsel, okay. Councillor Rice? Okay, sure. Yeah. yeah, so I I will take my question back. That is my question for. Thank Good. you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. I see no more questions on this. Thank you, everyone. And uh, for to close the public hearing, we are ready to close the public hearing on this, Madam Clerk. And uh, Councillor Jens, would you like to move the closing of the public hearing on this? With pleasure. Okay. Go ahead then. Mm -hmm. I move that the public hearing on Charter Bylaw 19986 be closed. Thank you, Councillor Jen. Seconded by? Second. Councillor Tang? Ning. Any questions? Call the vote. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Councilor Jans. I move that Charter Bylaw 19986 be read a first time. Thank you. Second by Second. Councilor Tang. All right. So people to speak. Councilor Rutherford. 
Yes, I'll just make this really quick in that I emphatically support this bylaw. Um, you know, when we're talking about, you know, we say 13 units and 13 people, I actually think it's well more than 13 people that will be affected when you think of the lifetime of these units and families and all of the cascading effects um, from these kind, this kind of housing. It's exactly what we need. And so I'm very excited to see that expansion in this project to add those 13 units and we'll wholeheartedly support this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Tang. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I just want to um, commend all the teams for working on this project. Uh, you know, several years ago when I worked on urban wellness, uh, we actually covered the Strathcona Ritchie area. And one of the huge gap was uh, sort of the lack of services and, you know, housing opportunities. So I am happy to see that this is moving towards the, dis uh, the direction of a distributed um, housing approach. I think it's really important to fill that gap. Um, and so, you know, I will be following the uh, project very closely and I look forward to the day it opens. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Rutherford, can you take the chair? So taken. Thank you. I, I just want to reiterate uh, my earlier comments about uh, appreciating all the compassion and care that we have seen coming from a uh, number of organizations, in this case, uh, the Mustard Seed and the people who have been working on this, uh, this application and, uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Prince on, uh, on the, uh, such a deep commitment to community, right? And uh, I really, really deeply appreciate, and I agree with Councillor Rutherford, this is not just about 13 people. This is not about just 13 lives, it's about 13 families and who will be coming in and there will be more families coming in. I was at a housing announcement this morning. Uh, you know, we are chipping away on this problem. Slowly and slowly, we are doing what we can, right? So uh, um, I really want to appreciate uh, all the hard work that uh, that community has been doing on this. So appreciate that. And I'll take the chair back. So yours. And I'll go to Councillor Jans to close. I have nothing to add. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Councillor Jans. I move that Charter Bylaw 19986 be read a second time. And I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, if I may request when the vote is carried, could you read out if there is an opposition? It cuts off on the screen for those of us on Zoom. Okay, I will do that. And okay. Councillor Tang seconded. Yeah. Any questions? Call the vote. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried 12 to 1. Or so, no, sorry. Yes, correct. Correct. Yep. got it, got 12 to 1. Uh, Councillor Jans. I move consideration of the third reading. All right, Councillor Tang Second. seconded. So this yeah. is this is to consider third reading. Uh, consideration be given for third reading, please. Uh, any questions? Please vote. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. Consideration is granted. Councillor Jans. I move third and final reading of uh, Charter Bylaw 19986 for a third time. Second. Thank you, Councillor Rai. Sorry, Councillor Jans seconded it. Sorry, Councillor Tang seconded it. Councillor Jans moved. Councillor Tang seconded. Uh, any questions? Seeing none, call the vote, please.
We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried 12 to 1. All right. We are now moving into our next item, which is 3.6, the Charter Bylaw 19992, to allow for a mix of commercial uses on a site with high visibility Calgary Trail North. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, would Council like a presentation or just straight to questions only? Uh, just getting sense. But, uh, I'm good to go straight to questions, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, we, I don't see any... Thank you. Questions. Questions. Okay, good. All right. Questions. Huh? Sure. Sign up, please, for questions. Councillor Stevenson exempted this, but also uh, confirming that Sylvia Summers um, does or does not want to make a presentation. Yeah, I'll check that. I I would like to make a presentation, if possible, please. Okay. Okay. Just hold on. Give me one second. Just go on a second. Let me know when I can start. Okay, we had uh, three members of public, Sylvia Summers to uh, make a presentation, Demir Barzella to answer questions only, Bijan Manani to answer questions only. So Sylvia, over to you for a presentation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and members of City Council. It's our pleasure to be here today in front of you requesting approval for this application. I'm here today with my colleagues, Mr. Demir Blazeka, the architect for this project with Stantec Consulting LTD, who's available for questions, and Mr. Bijan Manani, CEO of Everred Real Estate Developments LTD, who's also available for questions. Next slide, please. This project is located at 4607 Calgary Trail Northwest and 4710 Gateway Boulevard Northwest. The site's located between Gateway Boulevard and Calgary Trail, south of 51st Avenue and north of White Mud Drive. As can be seen, the surrounding areas host a variety of uses, including industrial uses in the Papa Chase Industrial Area to the east, commercial and retail uses in the Calgary Trail Corridor, and the Empire Park Residential Neighborhood to the west. Next slide, please. The project proposes the redevelopment of a brownfield site, which is currently being used as temporary storage for vehicles. This proposed rezoning would allow for the development of multiple buildings on a 2.34 hectare parcel in keeping with the vision of the Calgary Trail land use study. Potential uses would include a mix of commercial, retail, professional services, office uses, and extended medical. No residential development is being proposed for this project. Next slide, please. The proposed development is in alignment with the new city plan. The site is located in the Calgary Trail primary corridor. Primary Corridor is a prominent urban street designed for living, working, and moving. It serves as a destination in itself, but also provides critical connections between nodes throughout the city and beyond. City Plan identifies desired overall density in a primary corridor as a minimum of 150 people and or jobs per hectare. In addition to complying with City Plan, the proposed development aligns with the Calgary Trail Land Use Study, which identifies this area for commercial and retail development adjacent to Gateway Boulevard and Calgary Trail. The study envisions higher intensity office and auto related on an oriented retail for this location. Next slide, please. As previously mentioned, the proposed rezoning would allow for commercial office retail and mixed use medical development. To allow for the proposed development, the site would be rezoned from DC2986 site specific development control provision to DC2 site specific development control provision. The existing DC2 currently allows for an FAR of four and building heights up to 80 meters. The proposed rezoning would allow for a floor ratio of one, a range of building heights from 12 meters to 36 meters. Amenity area is a minimum of 1.5% of the non-residential floor area, which would be provided within the site. Parking will be located in underground parkades and at grade. Next slide, please. 
technical studies indicate there are no traffic or servicing issues. Next slide, please. This project has city administration and Edmonton design committee support. The development reflects design excellence. The development will be designed with durable, timeless materials, articulated facades, and pedestrian friendly ground oriented commercial and retail uses. Opportunities for active frontages have been provided to allow for opportunities for furnishings, amenity areas, bicycle parking, and additional landscaping. The development is pedestrian friendly with internal and offsite pedestrian connections. The development will upgrade and install pedestrian walkways adjacent to the site on Calgary Trail, Gateway Boulevard, and 48th Avenue. Next slide, please. Thank you. Questions? Thank you so much for your presentation. I'll check with council members if they have questions to uh, uh, the proponent, Councillor Jans. I may defer to Councillor Stevenson as she's the one who exempted this. Yeah, she said anyone else can go ahead. She's, uh, she's willing to do that. So if you want okay. to go ahead, you go ahead. All right, if I am not stepping on toes, no. I just want to thank the applicant again for this presentation. Uh, however, concern has been raised by uh, uh, one of some of my colleagues in discussion about um, the active transportation corridor in this area uh, as we're close to the LRT and this could be both a east-west and a north-south thoroughfare. Uh, I was wondering if the applicant was willing to uh, consider inclusion of active transportation corridors. Um, at the moment the DC2 is uh, allows for uh, 1.8 meter wide uh, sidewalks and on the Calgary Trail side we are providing a minimum of a three point three point meter uh, boulevard uh, on that side. Uh, Gateway Boulevard already has a, a wide um, beyond 3.8 meter boulevard and uh, we're providing that same width on uh, 48th Avenue as well. Uh, so are you asking if the applicant would specifically like to increase or be, would be willing to increase the 1.8 meter sidewalk to a three meter sidewalk, Councilor Jans? Uh, it, if, yes, if that is. Uh, <laughs> no, well, I, the, I'm just, I'm just seeking, I'm just seeking clarification. Yes, that would, I so, believe, I believe that, I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me, but I believe that would be the standard and I believe with the uh, city plan, transportation plan being on Calgary Trail and everything else, I think this is the the long term intent there. So I don't want to be quibbling over a few feet of concrete, but so I'd I'd also like to, if I may, take um, some time. Um, so as part of this rezoning process, we also undertook a traffic impact assessment. Um, as part of that, um, our transportation consultant in um, discussions with the city transportation group also looked at the city's new bike plan, which was approved in September 2020. Uh, currently, the city's bike plan does not show active transportation anywhere along Gateway Boulevard or Calgary Trail. It's indicated for future extension along, uh, along 106th Street. Um, with a uh, potential connection from 51st Avenue. So as part of our consultation through the rezoning process, um, it was determined in consultation with city transportation um, that the proposed widths uh, that you see in the DC, um, those, those suggested uh, provisions were provided to us and we accepted them from city administration and city transportation. So if I may, if I may change gears slightly, um, I know I asked you this when, when we met, but the, if you could share for council, um, this is a down zoning. Why, why was the, like, why are we considering a, a reduction in density in a, a, a lot of this nature in this location? So the current DC two allows for, Basically, it's a tower development uh, that uh, with a podium that covers almost the entirety of the site and uh, four towers up to 80 meters. So um, uh, my applicant, my client, um, has, they purchased the site and have looked at it and basically believe that that type of development just isn't appropriate for this area. We're proposing a development that's more in line with what city plan is calling for and um, with with the Calgary Trail land use study as well. Um, if you would like to ask more specific questions for rationale, uh, Bijan is available for questions as well. 
Uh, I guess it's it, it may be a question I need to ask admin, but I think as we look at city plan and we look at the intention and we look at such a, a beautiful um, blank blank piece, like we have the opportunity here today, um, the, the the question I think for for council to consider is is why would we be be taking a different direction than what's contemplated in the city plan? And it may not. Yeah, I guess I guess I can save that question for for administration. If I may respond, please, please, please. So we are in line with what city plan is looking for in that um, the number of units uh, or jobs being proposed is in line and city plan is also looks at um, not only is Calgary Trail a primary corridor, but it's identified for non residential uses. So um, more commercial non residential uses and the proposed heights are in line with the kind of the anticipated um, medium rise a development that is looked at in city plan, as well as being in line with the Calgary uh, trail land use study. So from that perspective, we are very much in alignment with the new city plan and existing city policy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Jans, Councillor Stevenson. Uh, yes, thank you very much for the presentation and, and for the application. I think most of my questions are, are to administration. Um, but I just had a quick question to the applicant around, just to make sure I'm reading the site plan correctly. So, so at first I was thinking that there, that there was just sort of like a perimeter road around uh, the buildings, but it's looking like, so there's, is that um, parking that, that, is that parallel parking or uh, um, what would you call it? S straight in parking along, along the, the edges of the development, along the three edges of the development? So basically, um, we have um, on the north and the south, there's basically the buildings. And then on the east and the west, there is some par parking um, adjacent to a landscape buffer. So you have the city's extensive right away on both sides. We've provided landscaping and then there is parking. So there is at grade parking as well as underground parking at the, on the site. And then working through with administration, we've also tried to ensure really great um, pedestrian connection routes through and around the site as well. And then also provided um, uh, landscaping, uh, parking islands, um, additional amenity, uh, furniture and landscaping beyond the requirements of what uh, the current uh, zoning bylaw requires. Okay, yeah, and just to confirm, there's so there's underground parking with it looks like building A, um, and then there is some surface parking along that that north edge of building A. Let me just so there might be a, a bit of surface parking, but we've or like I said, the a, a, a number of parking stalls. The bulk of the parking is provided within the interior of the site with some peripheral parking on the edges. And then that will be landscaped with uh, trees and shrubs to provide some visual screening uh, from the uh, from the roadways onto the site as well. Great, thank you for that. Uh, I'll I'll be I'll follow up with a few more questions, admin. But appreciate the presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Rutherford, can you take the chair? So taken. Thank you. So, Mr. Uh, Manani. Uh, can you clarify that question uh, earlier on about uh, the uh, um, what is permitted now and what is being proposed and the difference between the re reduction in density? Can you prov provide your perspective on that? Good afternoon, uh, council members, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to present this development to you for approval for rezoning. Uh, the market study that we have shown and the interest that we have uh, received prior to the development indicates the uh, absorption and the attraction and interest uh, providing a demand of FAR of one uh, or below. And uh, considering the status in the market and the vacant land that has been there for decades, uh, we looked at it as the opportunity to add value and uh, create opportunities uh, to enhance the corridor 
uh, in the areas that we are living in. So that with, with that, we are, uh, the, I mean, the amount of interest that we have has been presented, uh, we have chosen to uh, proceed with the development with FAR of one. You did the market analysis and this is what is uh, the market. That is correct. Okay, that is correct. Okay, good. Thank you. And I'll take the chair back. And Councillor Tang. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I guess just a quick one. Um, you were mentioning increasing the, the width of the sidewalk to three meters. That was one of the conditions from the design committee, correct? Um, so, yeah, Ms. hi. So that was a condition on the internal building frontages and we did that. So for okay. buildings A, and D, we have a minimum three meter wide uh, walkways in front of those buildings. And then on building B, we have a two meter wide walkways. Okay. So we received gotcha. feedback from EDC and worked with administration to try and address all of EDC's concerns. So you have been able to accept all the conditions and, and uh, work that yep. into this application? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. I just want to check on that. Okay. That's Thank it. You. Thank you, Councillor Tang. So no more questions to uh, the applicant. Uh, thank you every, everyone for your presentation. And now we can go to questions to uh, admin. Right. And uh, Councillor Stevenson, you selected this. You want to go first or can I go to Councillor Knack or does it matter? Does it matter? Okay, Councillor Knack. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and, um, so I, I want to ask a few, and I know it seems really odd for, it seems like such a small detail because overall, I think most of the changes make sense, but I do want to dig in a little bit to the, um, to the walkway piece and uh, we're appreciating that, uh, you know, this is maybe not an area that was identified for say the, the bike plan. Um, this is a pretty major north south corridor and, and, and I'm wondering if we have any thoughts around these types of corridors. Um, particularly as we start to redevelop these spaces. I mean, this is the first one, but if you don't do it here, then you're not gonna do it for 50 or hundred years. Um, would it not make sense in an area where you have so much space to, to put that in as a requirement for say even a three meter walkway? Thank you, Councillor. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll try and give a, um, I guess a quick answer and then I'll defer to my transportation colleague for some additional comments. Um, this, this isn't really the first. Um, if you look directly across the street uh, at a fairly recent commercial development on the west side of Calgary Trail, yeah. there's a relatively new commercial development over there as well. Um, and recognizing that um, neither Calgary Trail or Gateway Boulevard are very, um, I guess, attractive pedestrian environments today, there were still efforts by um, administration in the, in the transportation side to try and make improvements along the boulevard um, along these ways. So we're taking advantage of that in this uh, case for this application and uh, to the west as well. The, um, the boulevard and sidewalk were increased, although not to this three meter standard of a, of a multimodal trail. Um, there is a, a fairly generous boulevard and sidewalk that was provided immediately west of the site when that development occurred. And I'll, and I'll pass it over to uh, Mr. Saeed if he has any other comments to add to that. Thank you. Um, if you have any follow-up uh, on that, Councillor Nack, I'll be happy to provide more clarification. Well, yeah, I guess, and and I mean, maybe this is just a, and I, and I feel like I said, I feel bad even just like picking on this here because I mean, the overall change I think is is reasonable. I'm just, thinking 50 years out and are we going to wish we had taken advantage of an opportunity where you have that ability on such a major corridor to uh, to start to rectify a, a bit of a gap that I think does exist. I mean, this is obviously going to be a major vehicle commuter corridor. You're not going to throw, you know, you're not going to take away lanes of traffic on this roadway in the future, but where you have a wide boulevard space, um, it it feels like we're, we're missing potentially something that, that uh, could be challenging to rectify in at a certain time in the future. And so I, uh, this, is, this is where I, I'm just wondering, I know that's, you know, generally our approach is 1.8 meters, but in an area where you have so much vehicle traffic, where it isn't maybe the most uh, friendly for 
uh, folks not using vehicles. Um, should you, we start to fix that? Considering there are residential properties very close by, a grocery store right across the avenue. And, and is this the place where we should start to fix that design error? So, Councilor Mack, uh, in terms of uh, the land use, uh, looking at the corridor itself, the current functionality and uh, the functionality in foreseeable future, as you mentioned that it's uh, going to remain very much auto-oriented uh, corridor. Um, based on that, uh, I think um, uh, what we worked with was uh, whatever road right of way was available, uh, along the western uh, boundary of uh, the site. Uh, we have requested uh, or conditioned rather um, better pedestrian realm. Um, and then uh, same, same for, for Wade Avenue as well. Um, this uh, we see adequate because of a number of other considerations as well. We looked at the bike plan, uh, active modes connectivity overall, uh, um, if you go towards the east, 91 Street is the major north-south active modes connection to the west, 106 Street is, and to the north, 51 Avenue is the east-west future connector. So um, looking at that as alternatives available for uh, developments, I think uh, uh, this uh, we are uh, confident in terms of uh, um, for now, this, this being a viable solution. Do we have sort of a estimated distance we would want to have for an ideal active, uh, I'm out of time, I'm gonna come back, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nack, Councillor Stevenson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and, and, you know, really picking up from uh, where Councillor Nack was headed, although a bit more on on the site layout and design. So I think, I think you put it very well to say, you know, we recognize that, or I recognize that Calgary Trail right now is very auto-oriented. Um, but again, the, the city plan vision for this primary corridor is you know, an increasingly dense uh, place with a sense of place, human scaled, walkable. Um, as you travel down the corridor, you experience rich and vibrant street life. Um, so again, recognizing that that's not the reality today, um, is this the place where we start to fix that and, and create that opportunity to shift away from, um, again, the more, more auto-oriented uh, development? So maybe my question to administration um, is just sort of how we interpret those elements of, of city plan in terms of the, the design and, and sense of place. Uh, and also the Calgary Trail Land Use Study, which again speaks to transitioning away from highway commercial to more general commercial uses. Um, and again, wh what I feel like I'm seeing is, is still, still a fairly highway oriented uh, commercial with, with the significant setbacks the considerable and highly visible surface parking um, and, and drive-through uses as well. So I'll, I'll put that to administration. Thank you, Councillor. Um, yeah, yeah, your observations are good. Um, the primary corridors and city plan, um, there, there, there's a certain degree of uh, flexibility that, uh, that we sometimes look at as far as the different natures. Yes, they're intended to be intense. They're also intended to accommodate a variety of land uses. And in, in some places it will be more residential oriented, in some places it'll be more mixed. Um, I guess our sense um, in this case is that this is very, uh, Calgary Trail is very, has a strong foundation in auto oriented commercial uses. Um, the intensity of the office uses uh, we feel is a shift towards more intensity away from your traditional highway commercial, which is gas stations, hotels, um, uh, motels along, along you know, major traveling corridors. Um, another part of the consideration was the existing zoning bylaw has the major commercial corridor overlay, which has some design regulations that um, require larger setbacks. And we rolled that into this uh, DC as well, in order that the existing regulations along these major roadways would be consistent um, as well. Um, in addition, I guess, uh, to, to the question about perhaps related to down zoning, um, the original rezoning, which was design oriented around a, uh, a, a hotel and entertainment complex with the sculpted towers and the podium, that original rezoning occurred in 2010. And it's been 
there's been uh, the, the vision that that had has not materialized in 12 years now. And as the applicant had noted, the property's changed hands, uh, new owners have come in, they have a different vision for the site. And so that's what's reflected in the zoning that uh, that's here today. Um, as my colleague, uh, Mr. Saeed said, we're um, taking steps to make uh, smaller improvements to pedestrian transportation corridor access along what is a strong or auto oriented um, primary corridor. Um, so it, it, it's a bit of a compromise um, that seems to, we, we think will recognize and address both aspects. Thank, thank you for that. And, and again, really appreciating the, the nuance of how we achieve that transition to our, our desired future state of, of city plan and sort of how quickly we move towards that. Uh, and I think in this case, I, I worry that, um, that again, recognizing there's a transition, I just worry that we're sort of retrenching um, the existing conditions a bit too much in, in you know, what will likely be buildings that will be there for quite some time. So I'm just wondering if, if other um, site orientations were considered, if there has been discussion of um, sort of future phasing of this as well, so that, again, maybe this is what works. So I'm looking at, you know, the building C, for example, that that sort of, um, drive-through use maybe makes sense for the next five, 10 years, but then the site can be redeveloped and re-intensified in the future. I know we have some other DCs that have contemplated that, sort of a current current state and then transitioning to higher density in the future. Was that considered at all? Uh, not part of this application. Um, I, I will say, Councillor, um, that throughout this process, uh, initially we did encourage the use of a standard zone at CB3 um, would, come very close to uh, achieving the aspirations of what the applicant seemed to be seeking and would have allowed that kind of flexibility as opposed to a DC. Um, but the, it was the applicant's wish to uh, continue with a direct control um, path. And uh, so here we are today. Thank you so much, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Salvador? Yeah, thanks so much. Um, so I, I share some of those concerns around uh, sort of the active transportation corridor, but I, I also just wanted to ask, um, you know, recognizing we always we always see the maximum build out and what the full potential is um, on these sites based on the applications coming forward. But I'm also wondering, um, you know, is there is there a possibility here that we actually see uh, much less than what is what is in front of us today? Sort of that minimum build out, if you will, because um, I guess I'd just be concerned around seeing sort of the the large scale um, almost big box uh, style of, of office space. I'm just wondering if you could comment on that. Thank you, Councillor. Um, there are some components of flexibility built in. Uh, we, even we on the administration side recognize that sometimes direct control zones can be a bit too restrictive. Um, and through the process, uh, working with the applicant, um, there was, uh, of course, the applicants driven by changing demands on, on their, their tenants. Um, we have built into the DC regulation some flexibility um, in the site plan. So the site plan shows some rather large uh, blocks of buildings, but the regulations within the DC allow opportunities for those to be carved up into smaller buildings. And, and if that were to occur, um, as the market developed, it would be, uh, we, we would warmly welcome that because it would make the site more interesting and more diverse. Um, the site plan illustrates the maximum footprint, the maximum build out, but it allows opportunities to kind of segment it into smaller, more attractive um, buildings as demands may change throughout the life of the project. Okay. Okay. I appreciate that. Um, I'm also wondering, just picking up on Councillor Stevenson's question around sort of future adaptation and flexibility. Uh, one one example that comes to mind, I, I believe the the brewery district uh, has a significant amount of underground parking with the you know future intention of uh, intensification on that site. I guess is that's that's what uh, Councillor Stevenson's question sparked in me, and I'm just looking for further clarity there. It sounds like that hasn't been contemplated at all. Um, is that right? Uh, the current site plan and the current regulations uh, allow for uh, underground parking on a portion of the site. Um, Naturally, we would we would have we always like to see more of that underground, but there, those are there, there's significant cost factors uh, in placing parking underground, and and per, you know the applicant may have uh, a more robust explanation as to 
why the decision was made to only put underground parking on part of the site as opposed to surface. Yeah. Um, the surface parking is obviously more attractive to ultimate users of the site and easier for them to access the businesses in and out. So I'm sure there are other marketing and business reasons why um, it's it's hard for us to push all parking underground. For sure, yeah, I, I understand that, um, that component, that difficulty. I also wanted to ask about, you know, beyond, beyond active transportation, uh, I guess what else is included in this application to contribute to a positive public realm? Um, you know, the obviously, you know, widths of, of sidewalks is one part of that, um, but are there, are there other elements that you feel are really important that actually add to that public realm? Um, because yeah, my my concern is that we're just sort of solidifying that this is going to be uh, an auto oriented corridor for for decades to come, and um, yeah, looking for other other elements of positive public realm. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, fair points. Um, it, it's a challenge to uh, try and go to a highly urban design and, and environment in, in a, an auto-oriented um, corridor like this, but we feel we've uh, compromised and made, we're, we're achieving some improvements to the boulevards and sidewalks around the periphery of the site. Um, we have ensured, and, and the applicant was agreeable to, um, containing some landscaped pedestrian linkages, um, emphasizing you know, good quality pedestrian connections on the internal connections on the site because the way the buildings are proposed to be laid out, it's, there is some uh, inward focus on the, uh, the site layout. So naturally we, we uh, wanted to see some uh, landscaping and pedestrian uh, corridors identified internal to the site to help uh, create an interesting environment there and, and, and ensure that we just don't get a, a sea of asphalt parking. Um, and then with the EDC review there, there and uh, the regs also have some attention to building aesthetics, um, architectural design, uh, not being overly restrictive, but in, in providing a framework that encourages interesting building design, use of landscape to um, minimize uh, blank uh, walls and, and building masses and, and, and the like. Okay, I'm out of time. Thank you for those answers. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. We'll be back at 3.47.
Okay, I would like to call this meeting back to order. We'll do a quick roll call. Councillor Wright. I'm here. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Councillor Prince Bay. Hello. Councillor Stevenson. Good afternoon. Councillor Paquette. Bonjour. Councillor Tang. Good afternoon. Councillor Hamilton. Good afternoon. Councillor Rutherford. Good afternoon. Councillor Salvador. Good afternoon. Councillor Cartmel. Good afternoon. Councillor Rice. Good afternoon. And Councillor Jans. Good afternoon. And you're next, Councillor Jans, for questions to admin. Thank you. I guess um, I'm going to ask this to legal because I'm not sure, but um, and maybe if it can be asked to admin, then it, then legal can tell me. Um, what are our parameters if we're if we are concerned about city plan and our our objectives and our densification, and we're seeing down zonings coming forward? Is it what parameters do we have as a council to try and direct? a more city plan aligned development application. Councillor Jens, um, if it is council's pleasure to direct um, administration to look at this with more of a keen eye to city plan or however you'd like to phrase that, there's certainly an opportunity for a referral motion back to administration to address those issues. Right, and um, similarly on the active transportation pieces, if there's concerns about that um, because we do have some sort of high level visions right now, like the bike plan and city plan, which we may not have materially seen dictated yet in, in say a, a formal zoning bylaw, but there seems to be shared intent or agreement. Is that is that fair to say, but it's not legislated? Um, Councillor, I think you have certain policies and those tie into your city plan, which is a legislated document. And certainly as it relates to active transportation, that's a relevant consideration. And if you folks, um, or, and, and by, by folks, I mean, if, if it's council's desire to refer this back to administration to look at more of those item in, items, sorry, more granularly or, or with a specific eye, then it would be within your purview to do so. Okay. Um, May I ask administration about their thinking on, well, you know what, I'm, I'm just, I'll follow it up offline, but I, I, uh, I have some comments for debate. Councillor, I, I just would ask that um, any of your comments happen or occur during the public hearing forum, as opposed to offline, just a caution there. Oh, okay. Well, what I was going to say is like, I, I guess I'm looking for um, better understanding of how we are going to see the city plan vision realized into these development applications not specifically about this application in general, more about our high level process. My apologies, Councillor. Yeah, that would be appropriate on an offline discussion. I just wanted to ensure that anything in relation to this specific application was heard in the public forum. Yeah, no, no, I, uh, yeah, certainly I, I think I had my opportunity to clarify the question there. Yeah, another option would be a subsequent motion after the, the bylaw. Uh, Councillor Jens, that if you want broader information, that's an, an option available as a subsequent motion. Councillor Paquette. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and thank you, everyone, for your excellent questions and for the answers. Um, I'm a simple guy, so I'd like to just get this uh, out nice and bluntly. Why? Why not, uh, why not uh, have a, a bike lane uh, or shared use path here? Uh, is it that we're worried that the traffic is just too intense, it's going to be dangerous for folks, or is it just sort of, uh, maybe it just doesn't, um, it's not already contemplated as a path in the city plan? Um, you know, because obviously, it, to me, it sounds like there's a will from a component of council to, to uh, have as many uh, multimodal connections as humanly possible in the city. So the rationale in a really simple way uh, put forward would probably be really helpful. So, Councillor Paquette, um, in terms of uh, um, what uh, what is the best location or appropriate location for a bike uh, lane? Yeah, exactly. Um, I would refer to the bike plan, and uh, the bike plan states uh, uh, one of the important 
uh, lens that it takes is a level of traffic uh, stress. And the level of traffic stress is directly related to the experience and the comfortability of uh, uh, bikers using a certain corridor. And that is why if you see uh, most of, or in most of the cases, uh, we, we look for if, if we are navigating through um, a high traffic area, then the preference is obviously uh, we keep the bikers on a separate uh, pathway rather than mixing. And then when we see the lower traffic, then there, there is that shared street concept as well. Um, this corridor, uh, uh, we, we use those as our guiding principles, uh, it's guiding documents as we review these applications. So to date, what I've seen in the bike plan um, and even more recently in, in the mobility network assessment that came to the committee last month, uh, this particular corridor has not been identified as, as any priority to enhance active modes in this area. So that's, that's uh, okay. I hope that answers. So just to be clear, um, it's not about safety, it's about that it hasn't been defined as a priority. I talked about the safety first and then the priority. So- Okay, so, uh, okay. so let's, let's like, and that's why I, I'm asking this question so we can just unpack all the words into simple concepts. So uh, on one hand, you've got, it's not a priority in the, in the plan. On the other hand, uh, you've got uh, the idea that because of uh, where this site is uh, situated, it just won't be safe for people. And even if we build in the architecture, the built form, we still can't make it safe for people. Is that sort of the contention? Um, sort of, I would say partially, yes, because uh, uh, I think I'll, I'll just reiterate that You're which traffic. part am I mixing that's all I need to know so uh, let's uh, go to the basic principle that uh, what is the level of traffic stress at this color door and that level of traffic stress is is to the point where this corridor up until now has not been identified as part of the bike plan Okay, so there's so many cars that we don't want to add any other sort of mobility issues because we'll add to the stress of the traffic. Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, it's the safety component for for the bike bike users, uh -huh. and uh, and then if we are placing a bike uh, network in this area, then its integration with other modes is an important consideration as well. Like. Uh, uh, if I'm biking from there, am I getting into a transit? Uh, yeah, no, no, I, I get it. I'm just thinking about this site uh, alone, not the whole plan. Uh, so, Councillor, I, I think I you're answering my questions, but it's uh, we're, I feel like we're also talking, going around in circles. Councillor, if I just may add um, part uh, and parcel of Mr. Saeed's commentary is the fact but as you mentioned, it's not identified in the bike, uh, the bike plan. Uh, so if we were to put a active transportation uh, facility on this parcel only, it wouldn't connect to anywhere. Uh, the nearest north east west okay. route okay. is 51st, uh, and the parallel north south are on 106th Street and 91st. So it would be an, an orphan piece of infrastructure uh, that wouldn't connect anywhere, which I think is uh, another major consideration here. Thank you. Yeah, I'm out of time. In order not to come back, I'll just sum up. It would be Thank an you. orphan segment, and that just wouldn't make sense. Correct. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Ms. Mayor. Um, uh, my question is about uh, the report and administration provided. Uh, it's it's my understanding based on reports and this site and currently as used as a temporary storage um, as a temporary development permit. Um, so right now we are actually uh, to rezoning for the more comprehensive commercial develop redevelopment for the sites. So can you tell me a little bit more and I try to find the information in the report about uh, the uh, impact 
area employee just resume to the comprehensive commercial development from temporary storage uh, purpose. Thank you, Councillor. Um, yes, you're correct that the site is currently vacant and has been used as temporary storage. Um, I believe primarily for fleet vehicles. Um, you, when the original direct control zone was uh, rezoned back in 2010, as I mentioned earlier, that was for a very um, design heavy um, oriented, very intense development that um, has not developed, has not come to fruition. Um, I, I guess if, uh, if, if it, uh, it's probably reasonable to say that that is a more, that is a, a zoning that is more in line with city plan aspirations as far as highly intense primary corridors. But uh, as with all city building, there's, there's a middle ground, there's a balance. We can put these uh, zones and frameworks in place, but if nobody comes along and there's no market for it and nobody wants to build it, it'll just sit there as a vacant piece of land and be used to store vehicles on like it has for the last 12 years. Um, this zoning in front of us today, it's my understanding, and, and you could probably clarify with the applicant that they are ready to put shovels in the ground and develop this site um, after it's sitting vacant for 12 years. There are some um, environmental remediation steps that also need to be um, performed on this site because of its previous industrial history. And one of the uh, um, additional elements that it, the direct control zone in front of you today has is that it, it helps to facilitate the redevelopment of the site by um, deferring that cleanup to be more efficiently done at the development permit stage as well. So uh, those are the positives uh, and the change impacts that would would result from uh, the zoning that's before you today. Uh, that, that actually, that's great. Uh, thank you for that information. And also I would like to uh, to say, and then this, uh, is that safe to say, and for this comprehensive commercial develop, redevelopment actually will benefit and to, to the uh, surround, surrounding area. If you look at the surrounding area here, and so, so other, uh, area and then in this in this site development will be benefit from. So um, I I would yes I guess uh, it's quite safe to say that uh, having the site developed for uh, commercial uses would be more beneficial than having it remain uh, in its current state um, as, as a vacant lot. Yes, that's a safe statement. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so is there any specific reason or or any specific concern about uh, for us to stop this redevelopment. So what's, what could be like the negative consequence? Well, uh, we've brought the report to you with uh, our recommendation of support. Um, it's not as intense as the current zoning on the site right now, but it does, uh, it, it does strike a middle ground. Uh, we believe that uh, we'll see the site developed in an attractive manner in a comprehensive manner that'll bring uh, some opportunity for commercial development in this busy corridor and, and intensify the site. We've uh, um, taken, moved the needle slightly on providing some improved um, uh, boulevard and sidewalks around the site. Um, now, you know, we're, we're hearing that there's some concern from council, which uh, for that, that there may be opportunity or, or desire for um, more enhanced multi-use trail systems or, or active transportation modes, and that's perfectly within your purview. Um, but those, those, those are the positive elements that are before you today. Oh, I, I know my time will be out soon. And it's just last but very quick question. And then for all the multi-use trails and how many, what is the uh, population uh, data in that area? If we are talking about all these multi-use trails um, sorry, I don't have the information uh, at my fingertips, but uh, as with a, a primary corridor like this, I don't think it's, it's uh, directly tied to the resident population of nearby because it is a major transportation corridor. It'll, it'll convey and draw people from a very wide area um, in its movements. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. That's my question. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor... Salvador, please. So next round, but I uh, so Councillor 
Rutherford, can you take the chair? Yep, so taken. Yeah. So, to our legal, if I'm getting out of the scope of the discussion, please do let me know. Uh, but I just want to understand about the bike plan and relations to this site. When was when did we develop our bike plan? What year did we develop it? That was in 2020. So very recently, and leading up to that development, all the corridors were explored, which would be like to determine which would be the appropriate bike path. That's correct. And under that consider under that review, Calgary Trail Gateway Bull Award were not selected for obvious reasons, right? Safety reasons, traffic reasons, um, and high high traffic vehicular corridor. The segment uh, between um, 63 Avenue and uh, 51 and South uh, all the way to White Mud, those segments were, were not identified as a uh, yeah. bike okay. part of the bike plan. And we do have bike pathways in the vicinity of the area, right? On 106th Street, uh, then I think 91st Street has a multi-use trail bike path. 97th Street is also, I think, a multi uh, bike path as well. Am I, am I correct? Yes, 106th Street is identified as a future connector. Uh, and along with that, 51 Avenue as well as the east-west uh, uh, district connector. Okay. So if we were to add more bike paths, uh, I know this is a funding question. I know that ties into probably I'll be stepping out of the realm of this discussion. Like there's only limited limited amount of resources for the city to build bike paths, and if we continue to add beyond what is already contemplated in the bike plan, that would have to take resources away from other plans. Maybe that's I'm going out of out of school. Sorry about that. Uh, it does economic development, economic growth, part of city plan? Uh, city yes, Mr. city, city uh, plan economic, contemplates economic, economic growth, growth economic development, and this site does create economic opportunities, right? Yeah, so the rezoning facilitates that uh, potential redevelopment here, uh, as Mr. Heinrichs alluded to in the in his previous answers, uh, we've had a site that's sat vacant for the last 12 years. Uh, yes, there may be a zoning on it that contemplates a very intense use. However, I would go as far to say that that use is unrealistic as we have not seen it develop in those 12 years or even move forward past that initial rezoning. Uh, so the I think the, the notion of this being a down zone um, may be uh, a, a little bit um, too far uh, in, in the fact that uh, the development that's being proposed here uh, is, although over a large site of one FAR, it has uh, multi-story buildings within it, uh, a large amount of commercial space um, uh, that will help that area grow. Yeah, because the last zoning was 2010. Since then, nothing had happened on this site. So we have a choice. We can let it sit maybe another 10 years until mark, market, market conditions allow something to happen if that happens or look at this opportunity to have a possible development, not certain, but at least more likelihood. Correct. Okay, good. All right, thanks. And I'll take the, uh, so I'll move the- uh, Yeah, I was gonna say I'll, move. I'll move the uh, second round. Second. Okay, moved by Mayor Sohi and seconded, I, I missed who seconded it. Uh, Councillor Stevenson here, sorry. Councillor Stevenson. Any questions? Okay, I'll call the vote. We have 13 votes. Okay, please display. That is carried. Now I will hand the chair back to Mr. Uh, Amarjeet Sohi. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. And I'll go to, con sorry, Councillor Rutherford, I'll go to Councillor Salvador next. Uh, thank you, Marissa. I, I think I'll be brief here, but I'm just trying to, I guess, get an understanding of um, how, 
how we anticipate that transition to roll out uh, as we move towards those more, you know, pedestrian oriented, um, rich public realm type primary corridors, if not through incremental development, like the one that we have in front of us today. Like, do, do, does that make sense? I'm, I'm just trying to, trying to bridge that gap. Like if we're not sort of building to what we want to see eventually in, uh, 20, 30, 40 years, because these buildings are going to stand for decades. How do we make that, that transition? Um, that's what I'm grappling with. Thank you, Councillor. Um, again, a, a good question, a fair observation. Um, I think in answering it, it's, it's probably um, fair to, to think of the degree of change. So, for example, we've, we've touched a couple times on here that, that we are uh, requiring as part of this development um, an, an enhanced boulevard and sidewalk that again it's not the active mode uh, multi-use trail three meter standard but it is an improvement over what's there if, if you look immediately south of this site on the gateway boulevard side um, you're looking at monolithic sidewalks um, on a six lane highway penetrator where you, so you've got six lanes of traffic whizzing by your right elbow as you're walking along a, a monolithic sidewalk right next to the travel lane. So um, we are incrementally moving the needle towards making those improvements. It's it's maybe not to the degree of a, of a three meter multi-use trail, but it is an improvement. We're taking those steps where the opportunities pre present themselves with these kinds of applications. We did it to the land to the west of this site on the west side of Calgary Trail. And we're 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 doing it here as well, and and so I, I think that is a reasonable effort to incrementally improve, um, move the needle, and, and improve these these sites and the development in these corridors. Councillor, just to add on to what Mr. Hendricks was saying here, uh, throughout the city plan, uh, there's identification of those nodes and corridors, but not all of those nodes and corridors are treated the same. Uh, there, it's not an expectation that every single primary corridor become a high street or a main street. Uh, you look at the function of Calgary Trail and Gateway Boulevard, that function is gonna continue on as a major vehicle uh, corridor for the next, well, till the life of the city plan for the next million people. Uh, so as you said, how do you transition that? How do we incrementally increase that? And as Mr. Hendrick said, uh, we believe this, this site uh, improves on the condition of the existing uh, buildings on Gateway Boulevard and adds a little bit more. Could more be done for it? Sure, but that can be said uh, uh, for most sites as well. Uh, and I think there's a balance that's being reached here between developability as well as uh, increasing that uh, or furthering that transition towards that future state. Great, thank you both so much for those answers. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor Salvador, Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thanks very much and thanks for the conversation and, and you know, really, really appreciating the complexity of, of this work. Um, but I, I do feel that a, a bit further reflection on this proposal um, could be really beneficial in terms of really, really setting that, um, that standard for how we want to be transitioning our site. So I'd, I'd like to move um, that Charter Bylaw 19992 be referred back to administration to work with the applicant to provide a development that is more street oriented and incorporates opportunities for active transportation adjacent to the site and if appropriate explore the use of the CB3 standard zone uh, and return to a future public hearing. Um, so you know I think I we need a second. Oh, thank you. Second it Councillor Jans. Councillor Jans second it. Councillor Stevenson go ahead to introduce it. Yeah, so the intent is really, you know, in full recognition of the complexities of, of the current state um, and where we want to go, just feeling that there is a bit further work that could be done on this site in particular to help us get, get us further towards our, our future desired vision. Um, so, you know, really just using this as an opportunity. I mean, we, we talk about it a lot, but city plan, city plan is implemented in these decisions. Every single one of these decisions we make either moves us towards or away from where we want to go. Uh, and it's vital that we we provide rigor to each one and ensure that we're doing the absolute most that we can do in each each case to get us closer uh, to that, that future vision. So that's why I'd like to see a bit more work on it, um, but look forward to the, the comments um, and any questions that anyone may have for me, for my colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. So we have uh a referral motion on the floor. Any more questions on this? 
Anyone? Okay, seeing none, I call the vote. Uh, sorry, Mr. Mayor, uh, you just are asking for questions. I just wanted to speak. Yeah. Good. I want to speak too. Okay. Thank you. Okay, good. All right, so just hold on. Let me go back. All right, Councillor, no questions to admin. So uh, before we vote, anyone to speak? Councillor Knack. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, I've, I've been going back and forth on this one quite a bit um, because originally when I read this one over the weekend, the, the, the biggest thing I really flagged was um, should, we, should we require a larger multi-use trail? Um, uh, and, and the thinking behind that is that absolutely, this is not going to be a main street like we would have a White Ave, a Jasper Ave, a Stony Plain Road, anything like that. And, and we shouldn't strive for that on this street because it's designed differently. That doesn't mean though that we should ignore the other elements of how we move throughout our communities. And you know, I think about this area and how there is a grocery store uh, immediately across the avenue. There are residential areas on the other side of, of Calgary Trail. And so the reason right now nobody uses it uh, using any other mode is because it isn't really the most uh, comfortable experience to try to, to partake. But if you had a new office development, what would be stopping somebody from going into the grocery store at lunchtime to, to use that space? And so my question I'm left with is, um, not not to design, not every road needs to be the same thing. So, so I want to just acknowledge that from the very start. Um, but should we set ourselves a higher standard, even on the roads that are going to be primarily auto dependent? Um, and, and and so that's one piece. The other piece, though, and that was my my only thing I had originally flagged. But as I've heard Councillor Stevenson bring up some points today, um, thinking about that street you know the building design how we're trying to integrate i'm not worried about a bigger site uh you know if you want to if we need to use the three you know if there's a desire to use this cd3 zone and build something larger great but i also recognize the economic realities of developments and that i don't want to force a, a, a landowner to try to build something that is just not within their ability or maybe the market doesn't support that right now so i'd hate to restrict um doing this style of design um, because we, we should strive for something larger. But that doesn't, again, that doesn't mean that we have to take the building design and say, well, then we're only going to design it a very specific way that we're not going to strive for that, that heightened ability. So um, I, I, this is tough because I, I feel like the changes that we're talking about here don't have to be that significant. And I hate the idea of referring it back. I wish I wish we had, you know, two or three items we just could amend today to get it done. Um, but I'm not sure that's a smart approach of trying to amend this on the fly. You know, if it was just a three meter trail on the other side that doesn't have a three meter trail, we could amend that today. But in terms of some of the other pieces and how it better fits within our city plan, I, I do think we need a little bit more time. I'd love to put a due date that isn't to be determined and hopefully have it um, much sooner because I'm not looking to, to hold up this development by any uh, ex large amount of time, but see if we can refine a couple of these things maybe over the next month, um, month and a half, and then have it come back. And then we might need, based on some of this conversation, a broader, a broader discussion around what we want to do on primary corridors, depending on how they're designed. Recognizing a primary corridor that's a main street might be very different than a primary corridor like a Calgary Trail. And we probably need to have a bit more of a thorough discussion as a council about that, but that's not for here today. So I think based off where we're at, I'm gonna support this, uh, uh, although I would like to see if maybe we can get a date, a hard date of a month to six weeks out uh, to, to give some great, much greater certainty for the applicant. And so that probably should have been a question, but I, I think we can probably address it because 2 dB determined is not usually what we accept in the form of motion. So um, without making it a question, it is a statement that will hopefully result in a date on that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Knapp. Councillor Rutherford. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So like Andrew, I've been going back and forth, but I've actually come to 
sorry, like Councillor Nack, I have been going back and forth on this one and listening to my colleagues, um, but I've actually landed on the, uh, the other side of not supporting this. I feel that there was compelling arguments about some of those concerns around traffic. And I do think that piecemeal work it can create more confusion and actually can create bigger risk because then they're like, well, why do you have a shared use path here? And then there's no uh, crosswalk at this intersection. So I think it actually can do more harm than good. We have these plans that we need to see through and those plans include a vision for the city at 2 million and it's not gonna happen overnight. And I don't see the purpose of delaying this zoning um, for a little bit of a wider sidewalk, especially when I don't see that adding the value to the bike plan that we have, or uh, frankly, the city plan. And so I I will not be supporting this, this uh, refer back motion on the floor today. I think what's before us is very prudent and, and a good example of how we need to slowly over time assess the current context while looking future for focused and I feel that balance has been struck with this application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Jans. I will be supporting the motion. I think it's important to recognize that what we're doing will be here for uh, a century and uh, I think that uh, um, even a, the thing about the bike plan that, that I experience is when you bike down, say for example, 106th Street, you don't just bike down 106th Street. You end up biking down 106th Street to a lot more other locations around, like over to the White Mud Public Library or over to Alberts on 99th or over to the, the you know, destinations along adjacent areas. So I think anytime we have an opportunity to work with a development from scratch, from a big dirt square lot like we have now, we should be demanding the best and, and we should be uh, pushing for it accordingly. And I think that's what the climate emergency demands. I think that's what our plans call for. And uh, I think this is a, a very, very minor adjustment that uh, uh, I, I think we should we should put for it. I think Councillor Stevenson's other other suggestions in the motion about um, just enhancing, I think, some of the, the streetscape and, and, and making it making it just a little bit better, I think, are, are worthy of consideration as well, too. So full support. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Councillor Paquette. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, okay, so uh, just a quick question for administration, if I may. Um, Can just we? taking a look at the motion and... Uh, we're speaking into it now. Yeah, uh, Mr. Mayor, you're speaking to the motion. Yeah, we're point. speaking to the motion you're now. You're speaking to it? Yeah. I, uh, yeah. Is my opportunity to ask a question over? Yeah, we. I, I did ask for questions to admit. Okay, and well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll rephrase my question in the form of a uh, puzzled statement. Uh, so... <laughs> I'm just thinking about the, the um, item before us and then this motion and then the, the larger concept. And it occurs to me that um, maybe this is a really clumsy mechanism for getting to that conversation. Um, if we actually want to talk about extending, uh, you know, these uh, shared use paths, um, great. We should have that conversation. Um, understanding that if this, if, if, uh, this item passes, the development uh, gets paused um, and this may be the catalyst to that conversation, but at the same time, it leaves the uh, person or the uh, entity in question in a bit of a limbo. And so um, maybe there's no clear path for this uh, that is uh, satisfactory, but um, the idea is that a segment uh, is only orphaned until it's not, uh, as we build out but Council Rutherford makes an extremely excellent point. If people just see that segment, one, it can be unsafe. Two, uh, it can cause confusion among the public and uh, frustration. Like why would the city have only this little section uh, and nothing else connecting to it? Just another, you know, uh, befuddling decision from city council. And so I'm a little worried about those, those things. So. I think we need to have this conversation. I'm not sure if this motion is the is the right way to get there. And I know that's a little bit wonky, but at the same time, I'm, I'm thinking about, uh, um, I mean, and I don't know what to do because we've got uh, someone with an application in front of us. If they build without this in mind, we lose the opportunity. 
but um, yeah, it, it is actually a, a little bit concerning to me that uh, that we are using um, public hearing as a method of uh, going ahead and having a larger policy question and uh, planning question. So. And not as a subsequent, but as act an actual pause on this development. I, I hope that's making sense. It it is concerning. Like I, I really under like uh, I understand the will, but I also agree with Councillor Rutherford on this uh, quite a bit. So, um, I probably won't be supporting this, um, but I but I am absolutely concerned that if uh, uh, the development goes ahead without this in mind then uh, that's a lost opportunity and a, and a longer term frustration. Um, but I also know that we need to have this conversation, although I do believe also that administration has already gone through um, uh, the whole uh, transportation uh, strategy and determine you know, the best places for routes. So, but if council wants to open it up, um, I'm not opposed. I wouldn't mind uh, shared use paths everywhere. So. I won't be supporting this, but I absolutely support having the larger conversation because if it means that we're going to expand the idea of shared use pass, I think that that's phenomenal. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Wright. Hi, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I I cannot support um, this motion. I Gateway and Calgary Trail have always been major corridors going uh, in and out of our city and, and for, for vehicles, buses. Um, I think there's safer routes um, that can be used for active transportation. And I think the city plan um, did look at that and the, um, uh, with, with 106th Street and how it connects in with 51st Avenue. Um, and I don't want to see this development being delayed any longer. Um, I'd rather see some building going on rather than just a, a paved parking lot. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Hamilton. Sorry, I was anticipating Councillor Wright would uh, speak a lot longer. So thank you for your brevity, um, but it took me a second to, to get myself together. Uh, so I will also um, be brief. Um, I, I appreciate the sentiment here, but I can't support this motion. Um, something that I think uh, uh, you, that I consider, and, and I wanna make clear that the I, it's not the sentiment I disagree with, um, but whose responsibility is it um, to execute on um, on, on a, a plan to sort of build up multi-use uh, trails. I, I absolutely love multi-use trails um, and, and we see the value of them across the city. What I um, am concerned here is that uh, the conform, the, the premise of conforming with our bike plan, what administration has talked about in terms of safer pathways, and I think Councillor Wright articulated that well. And, um, and if, it, if, it's, if it's not an issue um, uh, uh, how do you say this? Um, th this development, uh, is it the responsibility of this development to initiate that work? And I hear um, some, perhaps some folks saying yes, um, but I, I don't think so. And I also know that space to be um, vacant and in desperate need of development. I, I know this area has sort of between the, um, the, the superstore and, and the white mud area so we do have i think quite a bit of intensification to happen and i think planning wise you would see that intensification come south from the the old strathcona white avenue area um so at this time i think until we have better planning in place sorry um until we have better planning in place i, I can't support this uh to um uh, at this time and and the impact it would have on the development um uh, application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Cartmel. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to. I'll say it quickly. I, I understand that these there's some laudable goals here, but I think that policy's got to come before the application and not the other way around. I don't think it's fair to penalize this developer who's finally moving forward on a on a piece of property for not conforming uh, to council's. Um, desire to craft policy on the fly. I think it's got to, it's got to be the other way first. And so uh, without a standing policy that says that this is a, a targeted path for uh, active transportation, I think that for other reasons that have been already said that um, 
the need to move forward and the desire to get something done on this site uh, trumps the, the the delay and effectively the penalty to this developer. So I will not be supporting the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. Councillor Rice. I will be very quick as well. And for the other reasons already uh, stated uh, by my colleagues, and I will not repeat that. Uh, so I really appreciate the uh, motivation and from mover and for this motion. And then just based on two reasons, and I cannot support it. Uh, the first reason is about that. I think for this public hearing and session, we need to focus on the purpose of this redevelopment. What is purpose for? And so, uh, like my colleague said, and, and then the policy and the public hearing is two separate uh, discussion. And then I, I, I'd rather to focus on the purpose for this. And specifically, and in this mind uh, has been empty for over 12 years. And this is the first step for us to get this mind and into the redevelopment, actually to support our city's economy recovery after COVID-19. I think that first step we need to take, and then if we cannot take first step, we never can get go to achieve our long-term goals. So I would, that's the reason I would like to say, and, and I will not support uh, this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Rutherford, can you take the chair? So taken. Thank you. No, I, I really appreciate the intent of Councillor Stevenson here. Uh, you know, we, our city and our public has put a lot of time and effort into, a, into developing a plan. And that plan is something that we are trying to implement. So if we developed our active transportation plan in 2020, and during that process, we determined that Gateway Boulevard and Calgary Trail are not appropriate active modes of transportation. Then just doing this piecemeal uh, upgrade, if, if even if it's possible, leads to confusion, as Councillor Rutherford was further uh, uh, earlier suggesting. So I, that's one point. The second is that we need to be very uh, focused on where we need to put our resources. Because if we do this on this particular site, then the pressure would be we need to upgrade the entire corridor, which would mean that we will not be able to allocate resources on the corridors that we have already agreed upon. And that's why I was so excited and still excited when Councillor uh, Salvador uh, brought forward a motion earlier on in the uh, uh, in the in the uh, committee process to uh, focus on implementing the bike path and a uh, bike plan master plan and really honing on on what we can do right things so I think we we need to focus on what we have already decided and uh, really do a good job and not be uh, uh, deviating away from uh, from that opportunities will come absolutely and we will look at things differently but uh, uh, and I you know and this complies with city plan too. Uh, it's not that this development is against the city plan. This does comply with the, the city plan. But city plan is not just about transportation. City plan is not just about how we build. City is also about, city plan is also how we grow our economy, how we recover from COVID, and how we create jobs and opportunities for construction and workers and, every, and everything else. And I think uh, we need to facilitate economic growth and if we're going to start building policy and developing policy on the fly, I think we do not get a good signal. We don't don't send send a good signal to uh, to the development industry that uh, when administration does does the review, they look at the city plan, they look at whether application complies, and they make a recommendation. Yes, we have the ability to reject the recommendations, but they do that. They make a recommendation based on our current policies and our government plan, and this has been supported by the uh, city administration. I think we need to support this and move forward, and that's why I will not be uh, uh, supporting the referral motion, because we need to give certainty uh, to our business leaders and business community that uh, when they comply with the policies, that their applications can get through. And I will take the chair back. So okay. good. And I will go to Councillor Stevenson to close. 
Thank you very much, and thanks to everyone for the, the comments. Uh, so to clarify, you know, my, my interest in this referral motion is really around the, the layout of the site, not so much the, the act of transportation, although I think it's a great opportunity as well. And I think what our, our conversation has really touched on for me is that in my mind, we, we have had this policy conversation. Uh, not only ha do we have it in, in city plan, it's a conversation we've been having for many years about improving the urban design of our city, improving the quality of our neighborhoods, and providing um, a beautiful city uh, for us to enjoy and live in. So I think that the discussion that is ahead of us is not a policy conversation, but an implementation of that policy and, and how we achieve the spirit and the intent of the policies rather than a very strict uh, reading of some specific criteria that are, that are set out. So regardless of the outcome of this uh, particular referral back motion, I, I am really excited to continue that conversation. I think it is the most essential and pressing one that we face as a, as a council and as a city. So I look forward to, to further constructive conversations with administration about how we, we elevate this work and how we continue to um, implement the, the spirit and intent of city plan through each and every one of these applications coming forward to us and how we on council can support that work. Um, to applicants coming in, again, you know, really encouraging a look to those higher, higher order um, objectives and visions and, and thinking holistically about how each parcel contributes to that. Um, I will leave it there, actually. Thank you. Thank you again, everyone, uh, for the comments. And uh, I, I will be supporting my motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Uh, I'll call the vote. Just looking for Councillor Wright's vote. Yeah, I've got a circle there in front of me. I'm a no. Thank you. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is defeated. Okay, we are back to the list. I don't know if we have people on the list, council members. If not, I think Mr. Stevenson was the last one. So uh, uh, any new information, any respond to the new information? Any questions for clarification? Oh, no, questions, sorry. Questions for clarification. Farm council members. Yeah, I would, I would, I would have some additional just, just new hold information. Just, it's uh, Demir Blazakam. Just hold on, Demir. Yeah. Just hold on. A question needs to be asked to you in order oh, to respond. Okay. Yeah, so if, if council members have any questions to clarifying questions to uh, the public and to the administration at the same time, or first to the public, right? First to the public. Yes. Yeah, okay, good. Councillor Jans. May I ask uh, Mr. Blazenka if he has any new information to share? Yes, uh, thank you, Councillor Jans. Uh, I would just re reiterate uh, two points here. Uh, first one is uh, uh, coming back to a discussion of that enhanced uh, kind of a, a pedestrian public corridors on alongside the Calgary Trail and, and Gateway Boulevard. So although we are uh, allowing for uh, only 1800 wide uh, uh, sidewalk and, and uh, adjacent boulevard, if in the in the future, there is a, a possibility or, a, or, or city plan changes, there is a possibility to widen that corridor that's within the uh, kind of a, the kind of a, uh, what do you call it, cities right of ways, you know. So technically, it, it would be possible to achieve that and it wouldn't be uh, whatever we build now wouldn't preclude that happening in the future. My, my second point is we would just like to reiterate that uh, our client's intent is to develop this site as soon as possible. And to that extent, we are acting as an architect for this development for the client. And we are well underway of pre pre preparing uh, and developing the design and drawings in preparation for the development permit. And uh, as far as we know, it's client's intention to proceed with this development as soon as possible. And uh, so uh, that would be a welcome addition after 
the site being empty for more than a decade to, to develop it and, and proceed with this development, which would provide a great economic benefit uh, for the surrounding area and for the city of, of Edmonton as well. So just those two points. So I'll, I'll take any other questions if anybody has. Good. Councilor Jones. I have no, I have no further questions, Mr. Record. Thank you so much. Any more questions? Seeing none, we are ready to uh, move the closing of the bylaw. All right, would someone move that we uh, close bylaw six? Sorry. Oops. I can move. One nine 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 two. That was Councillor Wright. Councillor Rice, yes. Second. Councillor Rice and Councillor Principe seconded it. Any questions on the uh, public hearing close closing on one nine 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 two? Seeing none. Call the vote, please. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Councillor Rice, would you like to move the readings? Happy to do. I move the chart by law 19992 be read a first time. Councillor Principe, seconding. Second. Second by Councillor Principe. Any questions? Anyone to speak? Seeing none, call the vote. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried 11 to 2. Councillor Rice. I, I move that chart bylaw 1992 be read a second time. Second. Second by Councillor Principe. Any questions? Seeing none, call the vote, please. We have 13 votes. Display the votes. That is carried 11 to Councillor Rice. I move. This is waiting for the wording. There you go. Is the chart by now 1992 be considered for third reading? Councillor Principe seconded, right? Second. Thank you, Councillor Principe. So this is for the consideration for third reading, please. No questions. Please vote. Just looking for Councillor Jans's vote. Councillor Jans? We have 13 votes. Got it. Display the votes, please. Consideration is granted. Councillor Rice. I move the chart by law 1992 be read a third time. Second. Second, Councillor Principe. Questions? Seeing none, call the vote. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried 12, 11 to 2. Okay. Going into our next bylaw, which is 3.7, right? The uh, Charter Bylaw 1990 to allow for general industrial development and the preservation of natural areas and parkland associated with NAT. North Saskatchewan River, Edmonton Energy and Technology Park. Over to administration, if you have a presentation or not. We do have a presentation ready, but understanding there's 
a question of admin, we can go straight to that if it is council's wish. Uh, questions? Any desire to have a presentation? If not, then we can go directly into the questions because we don't have any members of the public to uh, make presentations. So we can go directly into the questions. So if you could please sign up. I'll wait for the names to pop up. Seeing none, nobody has any questions. To admin? Sorry, Mr. Mayor. Uh, was this, did this have to be selected? This was selected. 3.7 was selected. I, I selected. Councillor Rice, you I, selected this, right? Yes. Oh, okay. I selected, I selected the positive questions. Yeah, so and we can ask questions. That I found, that I found the answer an easy report. Oh, then so, would you like to move the uh, closing of the bylaw? Uh, happy to do. Okay, good. Second. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Any questions? Seeing none, please call the vote. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I move. The chart by now 1990. Be read it first time. Second. Second by Councillor Paquette. Any questions? Anyone to speak? Seeing none, call the vote, please. We have 13 votes. Display the votes. That is carried. I move the chart by law 1990 be read a second time. Second. Councillor Paquette seconded it. Any questions? Seeing none, please call the vote. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. I move. Just hold on, Councillor. I need to, uh, uh, it's carried, 13. Go, go, go ahead, Councillor uh, Rice. I move the chart by now, 1990, be considered for third reading. Second. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Consideration for third reading, please. No questions. Seeing none, call the vote. We have 13 oh. votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I move the chart by now, <clears throat> 1990, be read a third time. Second. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Any questions? Seeing none, call the vote, please. We have 13 votes. Display the votes. That is carried. Thank you, Councillor Rice and Councillor Paquette. My apologies for uh, select this item. After selected, I found the answer in the report. No problem. Thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, mentioning that. So we move forward on it. Thank you, Councilor Rice. Okay. Now we are heading into 3.9, right? Uh, the Charter Bylaw 198562 Rezone Land for Commercial Use Secord. Administration. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, same question. Uh, would you like a presentation or straight to questions considering there's no opposition? All right, so the SONA 3.9. There's no opposition. We do have members of, of the applicant. Uh, they're all for to answer questions only as well. So, uh, council members, questions? Just questions? Yes. Just questions? Okay, no problem. So, 
Madam Clerk, members, the proponents are only to answer questions only. So we go to them first now from council members, if council members have questions to the proponent. Right? Correct, yeah. Okay, council members, any questions to the proponent? We have three people, Sarah Sermon, Ainsley Brown, and PJ Pescott. Councilor Salvador? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I, I don't know who exactly uh, to, to direct this to in terms of the proponents, but uh, I guess I was just curious and, and wondering, you know, we're, we're talking about a town center here and I believe town center commercial. Um, and, you know, we're, we're going from RF6 and some other uses agricultural public utility to, to a DC. Uh, were, were more conventional zones considered, uh, you know, CB3 in particular, I think that allows for a lot of flexibility. Um, I'm just seeing, yeah, that, that trend of a lot of DCs coming up. So if, if you could comment on that, why, why a DC was necessary and conventional zones did not meet your needs. Um, I can take that question. I'm Sarah Sherman from IBI group, um, the file planner for this. Um, and the, uh, with the applicant. Um, so actually the uh, neighborhood structure plan for c -Cord actually required that this be a direct control. Um, so we were just trying to comply with that um, NSP policy. Um, it was mainly uh, to direct like urban design, site planning, um, vehicu vehicular and pedestrian circulation, um, mainly to ensure that there was pedestrian linkage and good connection to the stormwater management pond that is um, north of the site. Okay, yeah, so the, the NSP then just calls for that DC and uh, I guess I'm, I'm referencing the NSP as well. Uh, and I noticed that uh, it talks about the town center providing uh, a range of residential and commercial development within the town center, uh, ensuring, as you said, that all, all quadrants are connected um, by pedestrians and, uh, pedestrian access as well as transit, but I noticed that the DC does not include any residential. Yeah, that's correct. Um, actually, sorry, just one more point on that. Um, this DC is actually almost a cookie cutter of the um, CSC shopping center zone, which would be um, the typical standard kind of example um, that you would put uh, for, th for this type of town center. Um, so we, we, we kept as close as we could to it, obviously trying to bring in those urban design requirements that the, the NSP required. Um, uh, however, we, yes, we did leave out the uh, residential piece. Um, you'll note uh, directly to the west of it, there is a medium density residential. So not specifically kept on the site, but it is within you know, the vicinity of the town center that um, that kind of mixed use is still considered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I guess I, I would just be concerned that it's not that true, true mixed use. Um, and the intention of the NSP is to, to have that uh, from my perspective. And it still is kind of rooted in that Euclidean, um, Euclidean model. Um, okay, and then the other question I had, just looking at the maximum height of, I believe, 15 meters um, and a floor area ratio of 1.2, I, I assume that means we're going to see a lot of sort of single story um, sort of strip mall style style development, maybe maybe some some two story. Is that right in terms of what could be expected? Um, just speaking from the a zoning perspective, and maybe I'll let PJ comment on um, uh, the intended use. But um, when comparing the CSC zone um, to this DC, uh, your heights we've only added an extra half a meter um, in here. So your typical Height for the CSC is 14.5 meters. Uh, this height in this DC2 is 15. Uh, same thing with the floor area ratio. Um, the CSC is a one FAR and the DC2 is a 1.2. So we haven't really strayed from, from that standard zone again, um, but uh, it is your, your typical shopping center um, format. Um, Hi, Councillor Salvador. Oh, sorry, sir. Go ahead. Hi, Councillor Salvador. Sorry, I, I'll interject as well, um, just to kind of help add some clarity. Um, so the area that we kind of label as a town centre is really all-encompassing within that Secor development. As Sarah noted, to the west, we've got a couple RE8 sites to really add the density, to make sure the walkability to this commercial site is there. We also have to be very careful of the existing residents to the north of this site, uh, which is in an existing Secor area. The residents have been there for um, numerous years. 
and we didn't want to put a commercial site or a six-story building right up against their fence. Uh, so we put in a, a storm pond right there and move the density from those other sites towards 92nd Ave. Um, and so this is kind of meant to be within the city plan of the uh, walkability of the entire basin to get to this commercial amenity, um, to use the storm pond. Uh, we also, within this direct control, added a walking corridor um, along the storm pond so that no commercial building can get put on it so that everyone can kind of enjoy that amenity together. Um, so lots of connectivity around the area. Uh, uh, which is going to incorporate the rec center site uh, in the future as well. Okay, uh, I'm out of time. I have a question for administration, though. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Salvador. Councilor Stevenson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I mean, yeah, really picking up on on where Council Councilor Salvador left off. So that's that's really interesting. Uh, I wasn't aware of the NSP policy that was requiring this to be a DC two, and I guess sort of recognizing that 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 requirement was there. I was just a, I think a, a bit. Um, a bit unclear, just in terms of the lack of detail around some of those pedestrian connections. Um, so, so again, recognizing that a DC two had to be used, um, it seems like we didn't didn't sort of take an opportunity to to really lay out that the pedestrian connectivity through the site. Uh, I was just wondering if you could speak to that a bit. Hi, yeah, sorry, I can answer that one as well. Thanks for the question, Councillor Stevenson. Um, so, a lot of the connectivity comes from the uh, the density around the site, um, and then towards uh, entering into the site from the storm pond. As I noted, there is an easement uh, that is put on title uh, right now that uh, uh, is along the storm pipe that helps for the walkability and the visibility of the storm pond. Uh, there's there's uh, walking paths coming in from, as I noted, uh, the bordering community of Secord that's been there uh, for uh, over a decade now. So there's multiple accesses on uh, towards the site. Uh, and then we have made room for a corridor uh, with kind of a viewing area that I believe is noted in the, in the application as well um, uh, to really enhance the site uh, and the amenities that are around it. Yeah, and I think I think that's just so, you know, I, I do see on the on the site plan sort of the two pedestrian entry points into the site. But but again, just learning about the, the detail about how people move through the site um, in terms of that pedestrian connectivity. Um, yeah, sorry, I don't have a map in front of me, but there is a, on the entrance, I believe it's off of 90, uh, 93rd Ave. Um, uh, there, there is a, like, as I noted, a walking corridor, um, that is red, that is on title that, um, a commercial building can't be built on top of, uh, as, uh, I can't really show it in the, in the, in a picture right now because I can't share anything, but, um, but we definitely did take that into, into consideration. Okay. And, and I can follow up with administration on that. And then. Um, just wondering as well if there was any conversation about having uh, sort of a complete walkway around the storm pond. So I heard you mention sort of having that that pathway um, along the multi-use site and just wondering if there was ever conversation about having it along, um, you know, the edges of this site that are uh, adjacent to the storm pond. Yeah, yeah uh, so uh, um, there is, a, there is a, a walkway that is currently installed all the way around uh, three ends of the site and then it enters you in at both sites and then once you get into the site, as I mentioned, through that one corridor, uh, you should be able to move through the site to the north side. Um, that hasn't been completely mapped out yet, but uh, as I noted, um, pretty much the entire site has a walking path uh, towards it, and then there is one that is registered on top of it. Um, uh, in terms of going on the side of the commercial site, um, it likely won't be necessary because uh, you'll be entering the site uh, through that easement, uh, which will then uh, lead you through the viewing paths that we have. Okay, thank you. Um, oh. Sorry, if I may add as well, um, just to answer that question um, in addition, that um, in terms of the site planning and considering septed issues, um, just based on kind of where building placement is, and then as well as um, grading changes um, as you move further north, um, would make it a bit challenging to have that walkway that encircles um, the full kind of northern edge. So. There were kind of multiple um, considerations for that and then just kind of adding on to PJ's comment that um, we thought it was sufficient that um, we did offer multiple pedestrian accesses um, on either edge of the site as well as, you know, on through the uh, public right of ways surrounding it along 215 and uh, uh, 92nd Avenue um, and then with um, given that this is just a zoning um, concept plan that um, the further site development um, and connectivity um, for pedestrians, vehicle movement, et cetera, um, would be um, further developed through um, the development permit. 
Thanks. Yeah, I think um, I I hear those points. I think I think that uh, I think the questions is just around the the tool and and um, the the level of specificity we're seeing here when we are using a DC two. Um, but but certainly happy to follow those up with administration. Just really quickly, uh, the north. I just want to make sure. So the the Vista viewpoint corridor. My understanding that's primarily sort of building frontages, having patios or windows onto the, the storm pond. Just that very northern section, the tiny little jut out, um, it also has that designation, but it wasn't clear to me that a building could be located there. So I was just wondering what the, the Vista viewpoint corridor in that location signified. Um, I think I can answer that. Well, the, the part to the north uh, is mainly just an entrance to get into the site. It's fairly skinny. Um, you wouldn't really be able to put a building to, on that north uh, entrance uh, as you'd be uh, pushed up against the storm pond. But the main uh, uh, vista viewpoint is coming from the south side um, on the other entrance to the site. Um, as you come in, uh, you're, uh, as mentioned, that is where the easement uh, is placed so that uh, all pedestrians can enjoy the, the storm pond without a commercial building in its place. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Uh, let's see, no more questions to the proponent. We'll go to questions to admin. Questions to administration. Councillor Salvador, I know you had some questions, right? So go ahead, Councillor Salvador. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So just to, to administration, you know, recognizing that again, the, the NSP does call for that range of residential and commercial uses um, as part of that sort of mixed use town center. Um, how, I mean, I, I obviously know your recommendation, but uh, I'm, I'm struggling to see how this is uh, in line with, with some of the goals of city plan around having that, that true mixed use and, um, and how it, it is lined up with the NSP because it's, it's not in my mind. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, good question. The uh, I think to, to answer that, um, one of the things that we've experienced um, as the planning regulator uh, from trends in the development industry is that uh, often, often the term mixed use has uh, been automatically assumed to be a vertical orientation of mixed use with residential above commercial on main floor. Um, much of the industry in the, in the last several years has been uh, seeking flexibility and, and promoting the use of horizontal mixed use where you may not have that vertical component. There are, there are additional building challenges, architectural challenges of mixing uses within the same building, but much easier to facilitate mixed uses in a horizontal fashion. You could have a freestanding residential building and freestanding commercial buildings and in the development industry that, that makes life a lot easier to implement. Um, so as was referred to earlier, when it comes to the town center for Secord and not only Secord, but Rosenthal to the south and the rest of the Lewis Farms area in general, um, there have been some a lot of up zonings around this site um, in the last several years. The Some of the medium density sites to the west have uh, been up zoned to high density RA8 zones uh, and to the southwest as well. So we're, we're seeing from the industry a, a desire to have that mixed use within close proximity and walking distance but it's it's more horizontally oriented um when this when the secord plan was first uh, approved it, it did kind of paint a picture of a um a funky trendy town center with and used words like mixed use and and sought to use tools like uh, direct control zones to to implement them but that may not necessarily be uh, as time has gone on uh, ultimately uh, as desirable or realistic now, but it's being achieved through through other means, through standard zones and through horizontal mixed use. Yeah, and I think um, I, I appreciate that answer. I, I can understand from from industry perspective how yeah that that horizontal mixed use as you referred to might be more more appealing. But I I do think that there's huge value in having that that vertical sort of missing middle mixed use. Um, cause the more we spread ourselves horizontally, it just inherently becomes less, less walkable and more, uh, more auto oriented. Um, okay. And then just recognizing that we are going to the extent of a DC, which inherently has a lot of, uh, sort of specificity built into it. Why not include provisions for, for multi-unit housing? Um, I, I know we're obviously going through a zoning bylaw renewal, but DCs in particular are going to be 
sticking around regardless of of what other zones may change and it, it just feels like we're kind of locking ourselves in there even if uh future potential might be there for some of that mixed use in a vertical sense yeah there 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 are some confusing elements in this lewis farms area because uh in between the area structure plan, which talks about a town center, a community center, and in between the individual neighborhood plans. Um, I'm just noticing, remembering that um, when it comes to this C chord NSP, this particular site is designated purely as town center commercial. Um, but it is within this larger town center aspect and concept of the Lewis Farms area. Um, which which goes so far as to extend into the Rosenthal neighborhood to the southwest, includes the district uh, rec center and the park there as well as as part of the larger town center concept from the area structure plan. Okay, so this is a town center within <laughs> the sorry town center commercial within town center. Is that correct? It's it's a bit confusing, but it is it does appear to be segmented that way. Yes. Okay, I'll ponder that and uh, yield the rest of my time. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Councillor Jans. Thank you. I also wanted to ask about active transportation connectivity. Um, similar to the conversation we had on the Calgary Trail site, I was just wondering um, if the administration could uh, clarify, given this is a DC2, what sort of things that they uh, insisted on or suggested. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, as far as the pedestrian connection, as, as was alluded to uh, by the applicant or, or spoken to by the applicant, the uh, concept or the intent of the DC as, as, uh, as it's drawn out uh, was intended on protecting some interface with the amenity next door, that being the, the, the park-like storm pond. Um, ensuring that there was exposed vistas. There is uh, an access, a public access easement requirement as well as access into the storm pond area that connects to um, the pedestrian pathway through um, the storm pond and, and elsewhere through the neighborhood and into the into the larger system. But uh, that, that's, the, that's the bulk of, of where this direct control zone focused was just ensuring that this commercial development did not impede any of those connections and in fact protected them. Thank you and I have to admit now I'm a I'm a little confused to following uh, Councillor Salvador's questions. This, uh, could you clarify this was uh, in the NSP, the site was designated to be a mixed commercial and residential, but then it's now being changed or was this site in question today always designated to be solely commercial? Uh, thank you for clarity. I, I mean, if I could ask the clerk to bring up uh, the second slide of this presentation, if that's possible, it does show the neighborhood structure plan. And in the neighborhood structure plan, it is uh, designated as town center commercial. Um, and, and, and admittedly, uh, between the independent neighborhood structure plans and the larger area structure plans, there does seem to be some the words mixed use and town center and, and uh, do get conflated a little bit. And so it is a little bit confusing, but as you can see on the left side of this slide, uh, the pink element in the Southwest corner of the neighborhood is, is identified in the legend as purely town center commercial. And so it does comply with the plan. Okay. So, cause I, I guess my concern is we're, we're sort of compromising our, our city plan ideal. And, and I hear you saying, no, no, we're, we're not uh, because we, this is from the NSP, what it was um, designated and, and supposed to be, is that correct? Uh, yes, it's accurate with the NSP. Um, I don't have a slide for the area structure plan, but it does uh, identify the town center as uh, basically encompassing all four of those, all, all four corners around that intersection of 92 Ave and Winterburn Road. So yeah, it, it captures get, the four neighbor pieces of the four neighborhoods around the area structure plan town center. And I guess if if the DC two is is virtually um, mirrors the original zoning, um, why why would administration uh, not encourage the applicant just to stick with the original zoning? Um, I, I, as was, as I guess alluded to earlier is it's directed by the plan. Uh, and again, it's probably a dated statement from the plan that uh, originally wanted to uh, 
uh, maybe create an impression of, of a special town center area. And, and it did make the commitment to use a direct control zone to ensure that there would be additional controls over this. Um, a standard zone certainly could be entertained. It would have required an amendment to the plan in order to do that as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess I, I I worry about I guess the the again the missed opportunity that we're going to be building a building that could be with us for you know over a century that it uh, um, if we have this opportunity now to to uh, um, suggest a more uh, uh, am ambitious uh, uh, city plan uh, aligned or or maybe city plan uh, ideal uh, site then uh, I guess that that's what I'm trying to clarify so uh, appreciate your your responses there thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jens. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, just really wanting to, to dig into some of the, the details or, or maybe lack thereof. So, so again, I guess I'm just wondering from administration's perspective, uh, why sort of on the site plan, more of those pedestrian routes and corridors weren't, uh, weren't identified? Thank you, Councillor. Um, the, the, the primary focus was for this particular site, a, a direct control zone is, is a specific zone to address specific issues on a, on, on a, on a specific site. Um, in this case, the greatest concern, the primary concern was um, not so much how, how the site would, would function internally, but uh, the primary um, concern was how it would integrate around the periphery. So that, that's where this particular DC focused. Um, it is an older file that was uh, originally applied for in 2019 or, or 2020, and, and it, it was paused for a while. Um, well, well, so maybe... it could have been considered the internal circulation, but in, in this case, it was not. And uh, yeah. no, I pre there's always a, a balance between being too prescriptive in a DC and in greenfield situations versus um, providing a concept, communicating the intent of the zone, protecting the important elements and allowing and trusting the, uh, the development officers and the development permitting process to kind of uh, let those details flush out as it gets down lower, lower on the ladder sure. of the development chain. Yeah, no, no, I appreciate that. And, and you're right, there's always that balance of specificity and, um, and flexibility. But I think, you know, some of the elements of the DC itself, though, I feel sort of lock in, um, you know, a lack of, of good connectivity with, with the storm pond. So I noticed that quite a bit of that interface is fenced. Um, so I'm just, that, that to me doesn't speak to permeability or, or connecting people to that space. Um, I'm a bit unclear about what the what the Vista viewpoint corridor truly means and, in, and how the development officer may interpret that. I think the wording is that it provides a Vista from storefronts. So, so again, I'm unclear if that's storefronts fronting that or if that's an area where buildings won't be built. I'm just wondering how the, the DO may interpret that. Um, and also just, it seems to me from my reading that that you know, for for the majority of the length along the storm pond, you could have parking, like right along that edge with no screening. I think there's maybe a three meter setback. I, I may have missed a screening component, but my understanding was only loading, and storage areas that required screening. So, yeah, hoping you could talk me through those provisions. Uh, good question, Councillor. Uh, primarily, um, I mean, there's also safety concerns with a storm pond, so there are some fencing elements and separation required. The, 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 the primary intent of this DC was to protect the integrity of, of a view corridor, as it's worded in the DC. So it, it's, it's not so much intended to protect uh, or, or in, ensure that there's physical connection, except for the area where... Um, a public access easement is contained in the in the eastern part of the site, but the uh, the primary focus and concern of this DC was to protect the visual um, the view corridor and visual exposure to the amenity. And so you're you're very right. Uh, what what's envisioned there is as as being most attractive would be you know coffee shops with patios that could oversee um, the amenity and and take advantage of that exposure along those sides instead of having buildings turn their back and have their loading bays, uh, you know, against the back of the, right. of the storm pond. 
but that that could be the case outside of the areas demarcated for the the Vista Viewpoint corridor, is that correct? And I, I know there's some language around like making sure that those are attractive and not monolithic, but I believe that the buildings could be backing onto the rest of the storm pond. Yes, for the areas that are not protected by the DC, um, you're correct. Yeah, yeah, I, I appreciate it. I guess I, I just, I, I have those con concerns and um, again, I think Councillor Salvador raised some excellent questions just around that, that mix as well. Um, so I will, I will reflect on that further, but thank you very much for the responses. That was, that was very helpful. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. I see no more questions at this time. So uh, any clarifying questions to uh, members of the public or the proponent from council members? Seeing none, we are ready to uh, close the bylaw. Okay. All right, would someone move to close this bylaw, please? Yes, Mr. Mayor, sorry. Councillor Knack. I'll move that we close the uh, bylaw, uh, close the public hearing for bylaw 19856. Seconded by? Second. Councillor Cartmel. Any questions? Call the vote. I'm um, yes, Madam Kurt. Thank you, Councilor Rice. Yes. Thank you, Councilor Paquette. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I will move first reading of Charter Bylaw 19856. Second. Second by Councillor Cartmel. Any questions and to speak? Councillor Stevenson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, similar similar to our conversation on the last item, I. I feel that this uh, this is a missed opportunity to do something really great in an exciting area uh, with an exciting uh, community amenity. So, you know, certainly always pleased to see uh, investment happening in our neighborhoods, but uh, I think that with the urgency of the climate crisis, with our objectives for a city plan, uh, we need to be um, raising the standards so that, again, every site is is to the highest, highest quality, and we have that in, in our zoning. Uh, with the DC, we have a unique opportunity to, to be somewhat specific, to, to have some really clear direction there, and I, I don't feel that this uh, application met, met that full potential. So um, I will not be supporting this bylaw, but uh, appreciate the comments and, and clarifications from uh, applicants and, and city administration. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Salvador. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, really, really echo some of the, the comments that Councillor Stevenson made. Um, I think one of the, the big challenges for me is that uh, through, through the conversation today, we learned that although this is a DC, it is essentially a, a carbon copy of the, the CSC zone that, um, that was kind of the basis for the DC. And, and that in and of itself is quite concerning to me, knowing that we're going through zoning bylaw renewal and we're, we're locking ourselves into a zone that is going to be um, changed and, and likely expanded where there's greater opportunity uh, to, to have some more flexibility in the future. So, so that was a flag for me. Um, I do uh, really still question the, uh, the mixed use nature of this site. I understand that there's, there's some discrepancy there around um, this being the, the town center commercial versus the town center and, and having reviewed both the, the ASP and the NSP, and I'm still left uh, feeling that this is an opportunity to have that true mixed use. Um, and by mixed use, I do mean that vertical mixed use that I find is often missing in more of our, our suburban contexts. Um, yeah, so for, for all of those reasons, uh, I think that uh, there's, there is huge potential on the site but this, this doesn't, um, doesn't meet that for me. So I will not be supporting this, but appreciate the conversation today. Thanks so much. Thank you, Councillor Salvador, Councillor Knack. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just, uh, uh, you know, and I appreciate those points. And I, and I think for me, 
why I look at this one a little different than the last one. Uh, I, I always feel fairly strongly about trying to stay within the neighborhood structure plans, even if they are not ideal. Um, uh, you know, if, if this council had been presented with a neighborhood structure plan um, that included this today, um, I'd probably want to see quite a bit more done with that. At the same time, there, this is an area that's fairly uh, built out quite significantly, actually, in Secord. And there was a lot of work done uh, in and around the area to, to alter some of these, these areas. Uh, and so the community has a pretty good expectation of, of what they're going to be getting. Um, yes, I'd love to see mixed use on this site, especially across the street from what will be the future rec center, which we just approved uh, the borough for yesterday. Uh, I, I think with that said, at the same time, we did increase um, some of the development rights further west of the site. And, uh, and so because this complies with the NSP, uh, it's not an ideal NSP and NSPs going forward, I think need to be more thoughtful about some of this, some of this here. Um, but I am able to support this, um, recognizing it's not perfect, uh, but it's not nearly as, um, there could have, there, there could have, well, I mean, and I hate to sort of say it could have been a lot worse, <laughs> uh, but it could have been. And I think with this development, it's, it's when we, when we sort of think about that, can what perfect be the enemy of good? This is good. It's fine. Uh, and it complies with the plan, which is something that the community has a pretty good understanding of at this point, especially for the residents that are closest to the site. And, uh, and it's for that reason, I'll support this plan and would encourage other folks to support it. And, and at the same time, uh, be aware and remember these types of zoning applications when a new NSP comes forward uh, or when somebody's looking to amend an NSP and uh, making sure that we're, we're being very thoughtful about that in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nack. I'll call the vote. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay. Mr. Mayor, I'll move second reading of Charter Bylaw 19856. Second. Second by Councillor Cartmel. Any questions? Seeing none, please vote. Just looking for Councillor, oh, we have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mr. Mayor, I'll move consideration of third reading on, on that item, 3.9. Thank you, Councillor, second by Councillor Cartmel, right? Second. Thank you. This is for consideration for third reading, please. No questions, please vote. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And Mr. Mayor, I'll move uh, third reading of Charter Bylaw 19856. Second. Second by Councilor Cartmel. Any questions? Seeing none, please vote. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. So we are at 526. Uh, we probably break here and uh, break for supper and be back at 7. Councillor Rutherford, I might be a little late coming in. I'll try to be by here, but be here by 7 o'clock, but if I don't, can you please resume the uh, proceedings of the meeting uh, in my absence at 7 o'clock? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. All right, we are in the recess till 7 o'clock.
Okay, I'd like to call this meeting to order at seven o'clock. I'll start with uh, roll call just to see who's here. Councillor Wright. Good evening. Councillor Knack. Good evening. Councillor Principe. Hello. Councillor Stevenson. Good evening. Councillor Paquette. I am here. Great. Councillor Tang. Good evening. Councillor Hamilton. Good evening. Good evening to you too. Councillor Stevenson. I meant, I meant sorry. I meant Salvador. <laughs> <laughs> Happens all the time. <laughs> uh, good evening, Madam Chair. Uh, Councillor Carmo. Good evening. Uh, Council Rice. Good evening. And Councilor Jans. Councilor Jans. Well, I'm sure he'll join in in a minute, so we'll get started. Uh, Madam Clerk, can you let me know what the next item is that we're on? I don't have the sheet in front of me. Item three point eleven, please. Okay, so we'll we'll go to 6.11 and are there any speakers for this item? There are speakers to answer questions only and just a friendly reminder that Councillor Jans did exempt this item. Would you like the presentation from administration? I'm wondering if he's not here, if we should call forward another item. What's the next item on the list? That would be Going items 3.13 and 3.14, which are being dealt who, with together. Who exempted those? Councillor Hamilton, and I believe it was uh, for a gentleman who was here in person, but I don't see him in council chamber at the moment. Okay, well, I think we'll just continue then with 6.11, and yes, we will have the presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor. Good, good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of Council. Item 311 pertains to the rezoning of a 0 0.3 hectare parcel of land in the eastern portion of the Charlesworth neighbourhood in southeast Edmonton. Slide number one shows the land in context of the surrounding development and zoning. From this, we can see that the subject site is an in an active state of development and surrounded by a variety of low and medium density residential residentially zoned lands, save for a park site that is uh, located southwest of the site. This bylaw proposes to rezone the subject site from RLD, residential low density zone to DC1, direct development control provision for the purpose of developing a unique form of row housing with reduced lot depth and slightly increased height. The lands to the immediate west of the site are also zoned DC1 and are designed to accommodate a reverse row housing built form that will be complementary to the proposed DC1. Slide number two shows a comparison of the regulations between the existing RLD zone and the proposed DC1 provision, as well as the westerly abutting DC1 provision. While the proposed DC1 will allow a row housing product with slightly more height on a, on a site with slightly reduced depth, the regulations between the zones are generally comparable. The third slide shows the proposed rezoning area in the context of city plan as shown on the left and the Charlesworth NSP as shown on the right. From this, we can see that the Charlesworth neighborhood is expected to accommodate a significant share of the city's growth to a threshold population of 1.25 million people. And with regard to the Charlesworth, Charlesworth neighborhood structure plan, the site is located in the heart of a large area designated for mixed residential densities. This application complies with both plans. With regard to public engagement, notifications were sent to 202 surrounding properties. No responses were received and an open house was not held. Next slide, please. Administration supports this application as an appropriate use of land at this location and recommends that council approve this charter bylaw. 
This concludes my presentation. Great, thank you very much. And uh, so I'm gonna ask for any questions of the public first. We do have folks here to answer questions only. Going once, twice, thrice. Okay, uh, any questions for administration? Councillor Jans, I know you exempted this item. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Stevenson. Yes, um, you know, we've had this conversation before just around the use of the DC1 in this instance. And I was wondering actually just more of a, a process question, something that I'm all, always, I, I was just wondering, you know, the comparison table where you provide sort of the existing zoning and the proposed zoning with the DC, is it also possible to potentially provide information around the sort of next closest standard zones just so we can understand where the, the, the deviations are from the standard zone in the DC one? Um, yes, it's, we, we certainly could. Um, in this case, we, we chose the standard zone, which is the current zoning, um, but, but your, your point is a good one. Um, probably the UCRH grow housing zone would be comparable. Um, we did look at it. it. It's not present in this chart, but it is uh, something that we have compared it to and certainly make note of that and uh, accommodate that request on future presentations. Oh, wonderful. I really appreciate that because um, I, I think what that would help illustrate as well is is instances where, um, it, you know, understanding if it's a if it's a difference in height, then obviously that's not workable. If the issue is that RA7 would fit it quite well, but the servicing requirements from EPCOR are too high, or that um, potentially the proposed development could be accommodated with, with some variances under a standard zone, I think that just helps us kind of really pin down exactly the, the, the purpose and, and use of the DC1 in that instance. But um, no, no questions beyond that, um, but appreciate, appreciate the, the potential bringing that further information forward uh, for future applications. Thank you. Great, thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Any other questions on this item? Okay, so I will now call for consideration of closure of this bylaw. Uh, and can, um, maybe, um, could, could clerks clarify, can we close public? Oh, I'm just concerned that, that Councillor Jans hasn't had an opportunity to ask his questions. I, I am sorry, I am here, Madam oh, Chair. Right here. Great. Yes, and um, I, I'm i not sure I was the one who actually exempted it. This may have been a mistake. Okay, well, either way, we're I'm calling a request for the closure of this public hearing on this bylaw. Councilor Madam Chair, Rutherford, apologies to interrupt. Uh, just may you please call for clarifying questions just to confirm that councillors do not have oh, any sure, questions yes. of the public hearing. I appreciate centers. that. Are there any clarifying questions? Okay, I will call for uh, consideration of closure of the public hearing on this bylaw. Madam Chair, I close that, or I move that the public hearing on Charter Bylaw 19998 be closed. Second. Second. Okay, seconded by Councillor Rice and moved by Councillor Tang. Any questions or anyone want to speak to this motion? Okay, I will call the vote. Just looking for councillors Cartmel and Jans's votes. Sorry, I'm a yes, got timed out. Thank you, Councillor Jans. We have 12 votes. Great, and that is carried. Madam Chair, I move that Charter Bylaw 1998 be read the first time. Councillor Rice? Second. Great, right. so moved by Councillor Tang, seconded by Councillor Rice. Any questions or anyone to speak to this motion? Okay, I'm gonna call the vote. A 
we have 12 votes. Okay, let's display. Great, carried 12 to zero. I move that Charter Bylaw 19998 be read a second time. Second. Moved by Councillor Tang, seconded by Councillor Rice. Any questions? Do I have to ask that every time? I don't know, but I'm gonna say I'm gonna call the vote. We have 12 votes. Please display. Great, that is carried. And I move that Charter Bylaw 19998 be considered for third reading. Second. Great, <clears throat> moved by Councillor Tang, seconded by Councillor Rice. Anyone to speak to this? Okay, I'll call the vote. We have 12 votes. Great, that is carried. And Madam Chair, I move that Charter Bylaw 19998 be read a third time. Second. Great, moved by Councillor Tang, seconded by Councillor Rice. And uh, for expediency, I'm just gonna call the vote. We have all the votes. Great. That is carried. Right, we are ready to move on to our next item, which my understanding is 3.13. And 3.14, they're dealt with together. And 3.14, they're gonna be dealt with to, together. Um, who, who, and it was Councillor Hamilton, I believe, that exempted this item. Would you care for a presentation, Councillor Hamilton? Uh, no, I only exempted it because we had a speaker on the item and uh, I haven't heard from that speaker. I don't know if um, the clerks have. We um, have not heard have from heard. the speaker. He registered at the beginning of the meeting and was present in chamber, but is no longer present in chamber. So I would just like to call um, to make sure that David Bouton is not online. And confirming he is still not present in the chamber. And I, I, I haven't heard from the speaker either. So in the absence of, and it wasn't in op, it, it's important to note that wasn't in opposition to this. He registered correct. in favor, correct. Okay. All right. Um, so madam, Madam Chair, uh, after you call for new information or, or anyone to speak to it, I'm happy to move closure. Great, thank you. So, uh, so we, don't, we don't need a presentation. We do not have anybody to speak to it. So there would be no new information. So I think you can go ahead and do that, Councillor Hamilton. Uh, I will move closer, closure of item 3.13 and 3. 14. Second. Uh, so mo moved by Councillor Hamilton, seconded by Aaron, yes, Councillor Paquette. Sorry. And uh, would anybody like to speak to the closing of this item? Okay, I will call the vote. We have 12 votes. Great, please display. And that is carried. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I will move first reading of item 3.13 and 3.14. Second. Moved by Councillor Hamilton, seconded by Councillor Paquette. Anyone to speak to or have questions on this motion? It's a good motion, please support it. <laughs> Great, I call the vote. Just looking for Councillor Jans's vote. We have 12 votes. Please display. 
And that is carried. I will move second reading of items 3.13 and 3.14. Second. Okay, moved by Councillor Hamilton, seconded by Councillor Paquette. I will call that vote. Just missing Councillor Paquette's vote. We have 12 votes, thank you. And that is carried. I will move consideration of third read reading on items 3.13 and 3.14. Second. Moved by Councillor Hamilton, seconded by Councillor Paquette. And are there any comments or questions on consideration for third re reading? Okay, I will call the vote. We have 12 votes. Great, and that is carried. And I will move third reading on bylaw 2003 and bylaw 2004. Second. Great, and again, for the sake of expediency, I'm gonna call the vote. We have 12 votes. Yeah, and that is carried. Look at how efficient we are. I think we got three items done in 15 minutes. <laughs> so just saying, what's the next item? Madam Clerk, again, I apologize. I don't have the sheet in front of me to know what was exempted. Items 3.21 and 3.22 will be dealt with together. Okay, and then who would be um, the, not the deputy mayor, but the, who, 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 Councillor who Rice would I hand the chair the, off to in this? Councillor Rice is the acting mayor. Okay, okay, acting mayor, thank you. Just because this is an item in my ward, so just wanna, okay, and so, for the speakers, I know we have speakers uh, in uh, in favor and opposed to this item. Is that correct, Madam Clark? Correct. Um, can you, can you call for those item, those those would, individuals? Would you like um, administration's presentation first? Yes, please. Okay, we will have the presentation first. Thank you. Good evening, Deputy Mayor, members of Council. These bylaws amend the Greasebar Neighbourhood Area Structure Plan to accommodate mid-rise apartments on the site and amend the zoning bylaw from the GVC, GVC Greasebar Village Centre Zone to the RA8G Greasebar Medium Rise Apartment Zone to allow for the development of two apartment buildings on the site. Next slide, please. The 1.7 hectare site is located at the southeast corner of the Greasebar Village Centre at the intersection of 137th Avenue, 97th Street. The site was zoned to the existing Greasebar Village Centre zone in 2002 and has since remained vacant. The surrounding land to the north and west of the site is zoned as well for the Greasebar Village Centre zone and is partially developed with a four-storey hotel and various commercial uses. To the east and south, land is also developed with a variety of commercial uses. Next slide, please. This slide shows the site in the context of the neighborhood with the general development pattern progressing from the southeast to the west and the north. And frequent transit is available along both 97th Street and 137th Avenue. Next slide, please. Under the existing GVC zoning on the site, multi-unit housing up to 18 meters or four stories in height is permitted when the first story is dedicated to commercial uses. The proposed zone allows for a building of up to 23 meters or six stories in height. And while the RA8 zone is primarily a residential zone, it does also allow for the opportunity to develop commercial uses on the ground floor. The proposed increase in density and height does not have a significant land use impacts in terms of density, views, traffic generation, and availability of off-street parking over and above the development potential already under the existing zone. The site is suitably located for multi-unit housing at the entrance to the neighborhood with access from public, from arterial roadways and good public transportation routes. Next slide, please. 
The Grease Bar NSP designates the site for village centre uses. In order to encourage an active and vibrant village centre, the approved NSP recognises that a critical density of uses, including housing, must be attained, and the highest and best use of this portion of the neighbourhood will be based on market conditions. If approved, the two dwellings are anticipated to generate approximately 230 additional dwelling units. That's approximately uh, 340 people. Next slide, please. The amendment to the plan would allow for freestanding mid-rise apartments or high density development up to six storeys as mentioned in this portion of the village centre and the residential statistics for the neighbourhood have been updated accordingly. Next slide please. City plan identifies 137th Avenue and 97th Street as primary, primary corridors. The, this application aligns with the goals and policies of the plan by contributing towards residential densification along two primary corridors, integrating services, amenities, housing, and multimodal transportation options. It utilizes land and infrastructure efficiently and does increase housing choice in the neighborhood. Next slide, please. In July and November of last year, advance notices were sent to 1,800 recipients in the Grease Bar area, as well as the Grease Bar Community League. In September of 21, the applicant hosted a virtual community information session again with residents, sorry, with representatives from the community. And the city ourselves uh, had a, hosted an engaged Edmonton page and we collected the input for the application from November of last year to January 3rd of this year. This page received 129 visitors with 24 respondents expressing concerns and one respondent expressing support. Concerns mostly dealt with the number of condos or apartments already in the neighborhood potential of density that would worsen traffic congestion, the fact that the recent developments in the village center have taken away from the unique character of the area, and a preference to remain up to the development of four stories in the village center. Next slide, please. In summary, the application contribute, contributes to achieving a critical density to support existing and future commercial uses in the village center. It'll lead people to the community to support these commercial uses and increase housing choice. It contributes towards the completion of the village center, thereby utilizing land and infrastructure efficiently and allow and will allow for residential development of a long-standing underutilized site. To close, administration recommends approval of these bylaws and that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Great, and now I will go to speakers in favor. So just Bear with me while I re-pull up that list. I had it, but I'm on my tablet, so it's hard to switch back and forth. But... Okay, and we have um, Mr. Ramtula. Yep, I'm here. Great. And do you have a presentation or questions only? Uh, I have uh, more of a speaking presentation, yeah. Great. And Ms. Smith? I'm present, thank you. And I do have a presentation. Okay, we'll start with Mr. Rimchula. Uh, is it okay if I go first for the presentation? Because his kind of follows um, mine, if, if, that, um, if that's, that's okay with council. That's fine. So yeah. Go ahead. And just, um, again, just a reminder, there's five minutes. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're, we should stay pretty strict to that, so. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, and uh, thank you members of council. My name is Belinda Morales-Smith and I'm an urban planner with Dialogue. Next slide, please. Before you today is a land use amendment application, which if approved will allow for a comprehensive mid-rise housing development through an amendment to the Griesbaugh Neighborhood Structure Plan and through a rezoning to rezone the site to Griesbaugh Medium Rise Apartment Zone or what is known as RA8G. Policies in the NSP recognize that in order for the Griesbaugh Village Center to be successful, there must be a critical density of uses, which includes housing, to encourage an active and vibrant center. And in order to achieve this, minor tax amendments are required to the NSP to permit mid-rise apartments up to six stories. With respect to the zoning bylaw, the RA8G zone will permit multi-unit housing buildings with a maximum height of six stories 
a minimum density of 75 dwelling units per hectare, a maximum floor area ratio of three, and opportunities for ground floor commercial uses. The RA8G zone is the same, same zoning that was approved in July of 2020 on the lands adjacent to Griesbaugh Village Parade in the Griesbaugh Center. Next slide, please. We submit that the proposed land use amendments align with policies of the city plan, as the plan calls for placing density along major corridors adjacent to public transit in district nodes. The plan identifies 137th Avenue and 97th Street as mass transit streets and designates this intersection as a district node. The proposal also aligns with the city plan by integrating services, amenities, housing, and multimodal transportation off uh, options within the Griesbaugh Village. The amendments will assist the city in achieving its goal of 1.25 million people within the city boundaries. Next slide, please. We have established a set of planning principles to guide this application and any future development on the site. These principles speak to providing a variety of housing options, to creating a vibrant, complete community by bringing critical mass to the village center, to providing uses that integrate and complement the Griesbach community, and to creating resiliency by efficiently utilizing land and infrastructure, which in turn reduces our carbon footprint. Next slide, please. Throughout the application process, we have met with community league executives, and in September, we held a virtual community information session so that we could hear from residents if they had any concerns and try to answer any questions they had. In uh, November, December, and January, the, the city held a three-week online, or the city held an online engagement event. Uh, next page, please. This slide depicts what we heard throughout the consultation process. Um, starting with the restricted covenant, there is a restricted covenant registered on title, which restricts commercial development on this site. And more information will be provided to this in the next presentation from uh, Samir. But basically the removal of this restricted covenant has been requested and denied. With respect to traffic, residential uses generate less trips and therefore mid-rise residential uses will have a comparable traffic generation to the commercial uses that are currently permitted under the current zone. With respect to parking, while the city has no minimum parking requirements, we can advise that parking will be consistent with demand in the area so that the site will be adequately parked. With respect to height and density, we submit that this proposal is meeting the intent of the city plan, which aims to place density along major transit routes. Furthermore, the heights and densities permitted under the RA8 zone will not have any negative impacts on the Griesbach community. We recognize that this site has been vacant for a very long time, and we understand that there has been some questionable activity on the site. Adding housing will bring people to the site who will activate and take ownership of the space. And this in turn assists with mitigating crime in the area. There is a tree stand on 97 Avenue and we heard that, uh, that it, it is a cherished by the neighborhood and that, um, that they would like it maintained. And, and we're here to say that, yes, we absolutely will be maintaining that tree stand. And lastly, deviation from the NSP. There were comments made that any proposed development should not deviate from the NSP. As we are all aware, plans are living documents that get amended over time as cities evolve and grow and change, and there are processes in place for allow this, that allow this to occur. Next slide. This concludes my presentation, and in summary, we respectfully submit that this land use amendment is appropriate because it aligns with the city plan objectives by increasing density along transit routes, making efficient use of existing infrastructure. It also has, adds housing options to the area. It creates a critical mass necessary to support existing businesses and attract new ones, and it will contribute to the completion of the Griesbaugh Village Centre. Thank you. Great, thank you very much for that presentation. Now over to our other our other public speaker on the in favor of this development. Great, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members of council. My name is Samir Ontula, the Director of Development and Design with Devereaux Developments, one of the landowners and the applicant on the file. I'm here to speak in favor of the rezoning application on behalf of the ownership group made, uh, made up of ourselves, along with Forum Properties and Tagata Investments, uh, also known as Daytona Homes, uh, two long-standing Edmontonian builder, developers, and property owners. Uh, further to Belinda's presentation, I wanted to quickly add some additional commentary in, in regards to the restrictive covenant and the history behind it. This parcel that we're rezoning was originally purchased by Sobeys directly from Canada Lands, uh, the developer of Griesbach. 
Around that time, Sobeys was also involved in the acquisition of Safeway Canada, effectively owning the Safeway grocery store that's actually located kitty corner to this site. Around this time, uh, Sobeys registered the restrictive covenant on title of this property that we are rezoning to not allow a standalone large scale single grocery store, department store or, or retail operation. There were other various commercial uses that were also limited under the restrictive covenant, rendering the site essentially sterile from large, from certain larger and more common commercial uses, which effectively is the reason why the site has remained vacant for many years. This mechanism has also deterred any of Sobeys competitors who would want to add a grocer to the site as a removal of the restrictive covenant can only be authorized by Sobeys, which is not in their intent given they were the ones who registered the restrictive covenant in place. Um, this also eliminates the ability for any other competition to enter the area as there is, it directly contradicts uh, the NSP requirements. With this information that I just stated, our group is committed to not only rezone the site, but committed to build the site out. We at Devereaux are not only a builder and developer, we're also long-term owners of these properties with the intent to integrate within the community. We have already built over 300 units in Edmonton and currently will be proceeding with construction on additional 220 units and other sites in Greaseville. The development of this site will not only create vibrancy to the area, but also reduce crime, provide a sense of community, and also provide the additional density to attract more preferred retailers to the area, accelerating the build out of this quadrant of Griesbach. Uh, in regards to our product, our objective is always to provide an amenity rich resort style development, including a full clubhouse, which includes game rooms, breakout workspaces, full commercial grade gym, outdoor pool, barbecues, fire pits for our residents. This style of development is, our, is a standard amongst all of Devereaux developments in the past 10 years, with sites across from Edmonton, Calgary, Regina, and Winnipeg. We've also proceeded with our own internal climate resiliency strategy, which also includes incorporating solar, electric vehicle charging, air source heat pumps, and other technologies. In regards to ensuring that, this develop, that our development will be high quality and fits within the Griesbach area, um, just want to make a point of note that all development permits are still required to be reviewed by Canada Lands to ensure to provide an additional level of assurance that our development will meet the values and design intent for the Griesbach com community. Uh, thank you for your time and uh, I would welcome between myself and Belinda would welcome any questions. Sure and can I just request uh, council members if you're remote can you please keep your camera on so we can ensure we have quorum. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. And I'll, oh. take, I'll take the chair back. Thank you so much Perfect. for uh, filling yes. in. You got, a lot, back. you got a lot done while I was gone in half an hour. Like, you shouldn't come back. <laughs> Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Uh, okay, so questions to uh, uh, Samir Ramtula and Belinda Morel Smith, uh, Council members. Councillor Rutherford. You're on mute. I said Councillor Salvador exempted this item. She can go first. Okay, Councillor Salvador. I mean, I can defer to you. It's your choice. Good? Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, sure, yeah, I'll I'll go ahead. Most of my questions for are for admin, but I do have uh, two for um, the proponents. So I guess one of the things that that I'm wondering, you know, recognizing that uh, the current zoning GBC is up to four stories, if you do that at grade commercial, um, was the was the rezoning prompted by the need for additional height up to six stories, or was it uh, so that there's the flexibility to not have to have the the commercial at grade? Um, wondering if you could speak to that. Samir, do you want me to go ahead and answer that? Yeah, sure. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a combination of both. I mean, we, um, we desire the additional density on the site to make it work and also the flexibility of not, um, of not having to have that commercial at grade given the restrictive covenant and um, given that the site is surrounded heavily by commercial uses and that the existing commercial uses on the site have not fully um, been built out and there's still some there's there's still a bit of vacant uh, commercial 
uses uh, within the portion of the commercial site that has been built out it is the reason why we're seeking this rezoning to the RA8G zone. Samir, was there anything you wanted to add to that? Nope, that's, that's exactly it. Okay, yeah, I appreciate that answer. Um, and just to follow up, uh, one of the, the things I heard was that the building, by having more you know, residential, uh, would actually help attract more retail to, to the area. Is that to the village center in particular, or are you thinking more you know, contextually um, across other sites? I'm just trying to understand that, because my understanding is that there's not a lot of area left in the actual village center. Um, I believe there's a, another RAAG on the sort of northwest side of the site. Um, but yeah, I, I'm just trying to understand the relationship there. Yeah, definitely. Um, so there is still an adjacent site, or there's still a vacant site that hasn't been built on for commercial, as well as vacancies throughout the area directly immediately to us, which uh, is owned by Forum, one of our partners. And so the objective of bringing in the additional density will drive um, will drive and increase the marketability of those commercial pieces just because you have that critical mass that you'd be looking for in the area. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much for those answers. Um, the rest of my questions I'll direct to admin, but I, I do just want to say I am excited to see some movement on this property um, that has been vacant for, for many years. So yeah, I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thank you, Council Salvador. Council Rutherford. Great. Thank you so much. So there, I have had many conversations with residents over the last little while regarding this pro project, very mixed feelings, um, as I'm sure you have heard as well in the engagement. One of the concerns though that, uh, keep, that keeps coming up, while it's not directly related to zone, uh, there's two, um, is around the structure uh, being a full wood frame structure. Many are concerned about that and, and historically those have you know, not done so well in other places, they've had to be evacuated, they've got lit up like a matchbox. Can you speak to that structural element of this, propo this proposed build to six stories? Yeah, I think um, it, it really comes down to obviously once we get into a development permit till we can actually map out those details. So uh, from a rezoning to the development permit, they're, they're quite different. Uh, we do obviously have quite a bit of experience with wood frame. Um, so wood frame is, uh, it is a standard acceptable building practice. Uh, there are a lot of strategies that we actually deploy to ensure the safety of it and to ensure um, that all fire codes are met and regulated. And in times we are also exceeding those as well. So we are testing new technologies, um, especially in regards to wood frame development for safety, not only on construction, but the longevity of the project. And just, also to tag on to that, uh, to ensure long-term maintenance and that the buildings are up appropriately, we are the long-term owners. So we do own these buildings for the duration as, as we build them. So it is very important for us to ensure that it is um, properly maintained and properly built. So the intention of these are to be rentals? Um, presently, we're looking at that. Uh, but of course, once again, once you get into the development permits where we would really dive into that. Okay, and again, I think this is a bigger conversation that us is, uh, we have to have, but you know, one of the things that Greaseball has won awards, they're the best neighborhood in Canada. They just won that award again uh, this year. And many of that is to pretty rigid uh, design features. Do you have to follow those design guidelines? Like this doesn't change any of that in your, in your build, correct? That, that so is Oh, oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> sorry about that. I'll answer this. Yes, as we go through the development permit process, all of our plans need to be reviewed by Canada Lands, and they review them in the context of their design guidelines. Um, so there is uh, a rigorous process that we have to follow and rigorous guidelines that we have to adhere to in terms of urban design. Great. And can you speak to uh, the plan for parking? Because that is, again, another concern that's come up. Sure, I, I'll, uh, I'll start and Samir, if you have anything to add. Um, so we don't have a definite plan yet as we're not in the detailed design uh, stages yet. Um, we do intend to properly park the site um, right now in the area for this type of product, uh, parking rates are approximately 
1.2, 1.3 spaces per um, per unit, and uh, and that is what we're seeing as uh, as the demand in the area and demand for this type of product in a location that is on a transit route and adjacent to a transit station. So as you know, if if we were to go ahead and and put a permit in today, those would be the type of um, parking standards we would be looking at. Again, as we move through the process and as we move more into detailed design, all those details will be flushed out. But there's a parkade. Can you confirm that? There is one level of underground parking. That is the intent at this point in time. Again, nothing has been designed to that level of detail, but through our test fit analysis, through our due diligence process, um, we are considering one level of uh, below grade parking and surface parking. It's pretty significant difference if that parking is above ground or, or underground, which is yeah. challenging when these zones are before us, uh, knowing that site very well. You know, how many units did you, again, can you reiterate how many units? Yeah, again, so nothing is finalized, but through our test fit analysis, we're, we're looking at approximately 230 units that could potentially uh, be built out on this site that, that fit within the regulations of this RA8 zone. Sure. So, but if we're saying one car even per household, that's also 230 cars. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Jans. Thank you. Um, when I was discussing this with a few constituents in my ward, uh, they raised the point about equity in terms of equity of density throughout the city. And I mean, in the middle of Garneau here, you could have a six story complex in the middle of a block surrounded by homes. And on this lot on 137th and 97th, right close to a shopping center, surrounded by a lot of retail, six stories to be blunt seems a little light and i was wondering if the applicant would share a little bit more about why they never went a little bit taller a little bit bigger a little bit uh more compliant with with city plan because as it stands right now when i'm thinking about optimal land use uh this doesn't this seems like a missed opportunity so I'll, I'll start um, in, in responding to that and how it aligns with the city plan. And then Samir, if you have anything to add. So in the city plan at, uh, at this location, it actually calls for mid-rise apartment buildings. So um, in terms of the built form that the RA8G allows, it is, it is in keeping and it, is in, uh, in, it does align with what the city plan proposes at, uh, at this, at, at this uh, intersection, which is mid-rise apartment. Um, Samir, was there anything else you wanted to add? Yeah, just in, in terms of our business model, we are mid-rise developers. We we don't generally do anything higher than that. So that's, okay. that's thank you for that. Yeah, and that, and that and that's fair. I just wanted to relay that question on on their behalf. Uh, you know, they're 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 looking at much higher 18-story type properties here along along White Ave. Uh, I guess in your definition of mid-rise, is that six stories? Is that eight stories? Um, have we agreed that six, eight is the new six or six is the new eight or four is the new six? Are, are you asking me that question? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's a range. You know, I think mid-rise can start anywhere from, from six up to 10 stories. Yeah, because I think that was sort of the sentiment here is, is a, a feeling from other parts of the city that why, why are we concentrating density elsewhere and looking at this opportunity to live in you know, one of like the best neighborhood in Canada, close to all these other amenities, that was a concern that it came up. So I promised I would ask the developer why, what the barrier was to going higher. Is it building material? Is it, is it parking? What, what would it take to, to look at something different here? Yeah, on our side, uh, our business model is that mid-rise, that's what we kind of focus on. So I can't really comment more than that, that might just be a, a different market. How, how, how about uh, seven? How about seven then? For the sake of argument, what would it take? Like, what's the difference between a six going up to a seven story or an eight story? Uh, it's it. It really it could just come down. It comes down to the metrics and the detailed design. I, I can't really comment a whole lot on that. If if it falls within the zoning, it is definitely something we would consider because um, obviously 
we do want to be able to hit a certain type of uh, density for the site, but we also have to ensure that we can balance parking and we can balance having an external clubhouse like we have in our model. So that just fits within our business model. So when we look at designing a site based on this, the acres of the land, it, it, this has just been our optimal model. Okay, yeah, no, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, uh, I will take that back to, to my constituents. Um, another question was, I, I just needed a little clarity as you were talking about the restrictive covenant around the grocery store. Are you, you just to confirm, you are not challenging that you are, there will be no grocery store in this space. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, it was, uh, it was previously challenged for years. And unfortunately, it, it is only at Sobey's discretion to remove that restrictive covenant. So it has been done in the past. There, there has been some conversations with Forum on other areas in in Griesbach to allow for a grocer use. And so there are some some mechanisms there, but not a large scale grocer like a competitor to Sobeys. Are you aware of any jurisdiction in Alberta that has uh, challenged uh, challenged a restrictive covenant on a grocery store? Like maybe using expropriation powers or something else? No, I, I, I don't believe so. I'm not I'm not too sure on that. I, I can't comment on that. It, it is restricted covenants are common amongst a lot of properties. So it, so it is common whether it comes from EPCOR, whether it comes from the city of Edmonton, there are restrictive covenants that are very common. I, I don't know mechanisms beyond that. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate the answer. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you uh, for this uh, presentation that is great information provided. Uh, I have one question regarding uh, the amount of commercial square, square footage. So if this rezoning approved and the amount of commercial square footage will, uh, within the village center and would be decreased uh, by almost 200 square meters, and as I understand, these apartments will increase like 230 unions. And so why is this commercial scale footage and be decreased? Is it because of, uh, is it needs, is not needed or something, uh, some else, something else reason? The reason why it will be decreased is to allow for the mid-rise apartment units to locate on the site. So right now in the Griesbaugh neighborhood structure plan, in, uh, in, this, in, this, in the statistical parts of it, it allocates a certain amount of uh, square meters towards uh, commercial uses and, and allocates a certain number of units in the whole village area. So in order to allow for this uh, mid-rise apartment to go up, we need to amend those statistics so that it balances out between residential and commercial uses. So to allow for more uh, residential units within the within the village center itself and to decrease the amount of commercial space that is required within the village center itself. Uh, if this reason approved and with the increase of the unions, we will have more population and in the neighborhood. So how can we address that needs, and even for example, specific exam example, and I, I, I did see the concern from the resident about the grocery store. So I think the question is, if we are increasing the population density yeah. in, um, on the site, then then how come we're not, how come we're decreasing the uh, commercial use on, on the site if they're trying to balance out? So my response, for that would be that um, this zone, the RA8G, still allows for commercial opportunity on the ground floor of, uh, of any development that would go there. So if there is demand, there's certainly the opportunity to put um, those commercial uses in. I would also say that um, there, there was a map that I think the uh, that uh, Mr. Ford put up that showed the site in its context. And this site is surrounded by commercial uses on all on all four sides. Um, so there is by no means a lack of commercial amenities within uh, within this area. And um, in fact, the, and Samir might be able to speak to this a little better, but 
the commercial uses that are existing within the village center itself um, are, are struggling. There are units that are built that are vacant and um, there are parcels of land within the village center that haven't been built yet because the demand for these commercial spaces aren't there. So our hope is that by adding the population to the village center itself, it will help and it will attract the type of businesses and uses that the community as a whole want to see directly in that village center and really promote the vibrancy and, um, and character of that area. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you for the answer. So uh, you are my time. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Cartmel. Uh, good evening, thank you for the presentation. Uh, maybe just a, a quick follow-up on Councillor Jans's questions. Um, uh, is it not true that um, uh, the building code changed a year ago, perhaps to, to allow wood frame buildings to be built up to six stories. Uh, and previously the limit was four stories. Have I got that right? Yeah, yeah, this was, uh, I can't recall when it was. It was, it was a few years back though, but yes, that's correct. And there's, um, you know, so a building that's higher than six stories uh, cannot be built out of wood by code and would therefore need to be built out of concrete or steel or, or light gauge steel, fair? Yep, that's correct. So there's a there is a there is an affordability uh, step function change between six and seven stories. That's true. Yep, definitely. Yeah. And not too long ago, that step function change happened at four stories. That's correct. Yeah. So this code change has made six story buildings uh, much more affordable than a six story building would have been a few years ago. Uh, yes. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so would you, would you say that there's been some upward pressure on, on building to six, whereas maybe building to four and then, and then the, the economics really change? Uh, and that, so that line has changed over the last couple of years? Um, I, I can't, I guess in terms of, what do you mean by the economics behind it? Like, I think in terms of the, between going to a four story to six story, your call it your cost per unit is very similar either way at the end of the day, right? There are, there are some metrics that get spread amongst the rest of the units, but it is, it falls within the same metrics. It, yeah, but it's, but it, you know, the cost you know, in a six story building, the cost per door would have been more expensive than the cost per door on a four story building a couple of years ago. And now that's, that's, that gap is closed. Yeah, so a six yeah. story building has become less expensive to build. Yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. And a parkade chases that economics in the other direction, potentially depending on the site, the context, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, there, there's obviously some other pressures over time. Like, of course, you've got inflation that adds into that. You've got land prices that change into that as well. You got financing insurances that change with that as well. So it, it's not a static calculation, especially over the years. It, it does definitely vary over the years. And proximity to amenities speaks to uh, desirability, which speaks to uh, you know uh, 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 market value for those units uh, and as compared to affordability. Sorry, I missed the first part of that question. Uh, the proximity to amenities, to transit, to other you know things that make a community livable, or you know add to the value on a per unit basis, and speak to not only the economics of the building, but um, the market value would be for those units in the building. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. Those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cardinal, Councillor Wright. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I, I think this was the um, some of the commercial mixed residential that some of us were looking at from the um, item yeah, in Secord. So I kind of like this idea. But I'm just wondering, Councillor uh, Rutherford had talked about um, parking availability. Um, was there other factors, I guess, maybe um, that you've taken into account, other transportation options? where parking wouldn't be an issue for this type of development? Um, I, Belinda, I don't know if you want to comment or you want me to comment on this? You can go ahead and I'll add if... Um... Yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess in terms of the parking viability, we've, like I mentioned, we've got a long history of doing these types of developments. And so for us, we definitely understand what works for us in terms of adequately parking the site. So I haven't, we haven't seen any red flags in terms of parking concerns on this site from our preliminary test fits. But of course, as we get into the detailed design, that's where we can really iron it out. But we haven't seen any red flags to it. And then of course, with transit adjacent to it, with the walkability of commercial, those all play factors to it at the end of the day. But um, if, for the most part, we, we haven't seen any concerns. Okay, thank you. And Belinda, you were gonna add? No, he covered everything. Thank you. Okay. 
Okay. Um, yeah. So I'm. So it wouldn't necessarily um, be marketed to somebody who had a vehicle. Like, there's other options for people to. Well, I, 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 we definitely still have a baseline of what we want to hit for a target. So if we are targeting that 1.2, you do have sufficient for somebody who has a vehicle. Uh, there is sufficient parking for them for their on our site. Okay, but there's other options like the transit, and I think I noticed a bike somewhere on the one of the maps that were in the presentation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That's all I want to know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Prince Bay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to uh, ask, because I've heard a lot the 230 additional units, but from what I'm reading, it's 875 dwellings in that area of uh, village, what is it, village center, correct? Uh, I can clarify for you. So the, the, the village center, which is not just our site, it encompasses the um, commercial the commercial space as well as the other two sites that were recently zoned RA8G. So within that whole um, area, you, the NSP will allow for up to 875 units, um, which is an increase uh, from 675 units in that whole area. So even currently under the um, um, under the existing zone, you could have 675 units there by allowing these amendments to proceed, that would increase to 200, or sorry, 875 units. But it's within that whole area, not just within um, the site that's in question today. Okay, so with the rezoning, it could it could be 875 units, but in reality, will it be 875 units? So the, the area that was already zoned RA8G, um, development permits have been pulled on that. And between those two buildings, there's approximately 225 units. Um, anything that is currently built out with commercial um, has the potential to put more residential units on it, but they're not because they're already there, they're existing structures. And then if these two sites get rezoned, um, if that gets approved today, then there'll likely be another additional 200 to 230 units. So we're talking maybe a total of um, just under 500 units, 450 maybe, um, assuming that it gets this gets rezoned today. But currently, with the building permits that were just recently pulled, there's um, there we know there'll be a, about 225 units on the site and that's all we know right now because that's all that's been approved in terms of resident, residential development in the grease boss center mm -hmm. okay yeah that's good thank you you're welcome thank you councillor principal councillor rutherford could you take the chair so taken thank you i have a very simple question i looked at the map i couldn't see it uh, because it's, I mean, the design is not there, but uh, there's a transit center right across the street uh, from, the, the, from the site. Will there be a pathway, a walkable connection right onto 97th Street from the, from the building? Yes, um, there, there, the RAAG zone actually, requires any units that are on the ground floor to have direct access. So if uh, there, there, there is likely going to be units that face onto 97th Street, and so they'll have direct access onto 97th Street. And then through the development permit process and through the review process from Canada Lands, um, you know, there, there are mechanisms in place to sh ensure that the site will be connected and that pedestrian pass will be provided for. Well, that's good because sometimes you see developments backing onto main corridors where there's a high frequency bus service, but people have to walk around uh, the neighborhood to get to the back to the to those main corridors. So I'm glad to glad to see that happening. Good. That's all I needed to know. Uh, I'll take the chair back. So given. Thank you, and I see no more questions. To, uh, to both of you, thank you so much. And uh, now we go to Mr. Chahal, right? Yep. Yes, Your Worship. Just give me one Members second. Of 
Barry, just give me one second. Just hold on. Thank you. I'm going to set it, set it up again. All right. Now you can go ahead. Yes, Your Worship, members of council, thank you for the allowance to speak today. Today I'm speaking on, as the director of community and civic engagement for the community of Grease Spa. This request for zoning has upset and disappointed a lot of constituents, and my inbox is being flooded. As an Edmontonian, I personally understand the importance of mixed housing in Edmonton, and the issue of the lack of use of the land has hit national media through McLean's with the Sobeys. Um, the community uh, collectively has heard a lot of intent, yet lacks the commitment from the developer and the builder. Uh, lots of salesmanship. We understand uh, 230 residents. This will empower 230 residents to have ho um, have occupancy within rental. That's not controlled. Um, the builder states that uh, if there is a need for commercial, then if the intent we will the intent will be there. We also I, we have four residents that have commercial occupation within their uh, places of forum to say that they charge the highest rate of rent in the area. In addition to the 230 residents, we know that just north of this placement, we're having uh, a large abundance of uh, affordable housing being built there. So in addition to that, uh, we have residents within the community that sacrificed their personal safety as firefighters who stated that there's something has to happen to prevent this from being a wood uh, frame building as it could be a blazing inferno and have reached out and no reply has been sent back. As um, a representative of the Community League, we ask if uh, this could be referred back to administration to have some further dialogue with the builder to discuss these concerns. Um, parking is is one of the major concerns. As we know, Empton Grease Spa was a pilot project for the uh, snow grading uh, process. We have unique roads in here. We have tourniquets roads that go one way and narrow. So the roadways and everything need to be assessed. Um, the applicant said there's no red flags, but nothing has been studied. And underground parking uh, may be there with the intent. I support development in this area, and the community supports development in this area. Yet there has to be commitment, not intent, and there has to be something that we can work together to have. It's a great plan, yet a lot of intent without commitment. Uh, Grease Spa, the, the JVC, was created to assure the unique, uniqueness of Grease Spa, and the development of the community grows with the needs of the community. The proposed rezoning has no such underlying tones, just intent. I would like to thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Mr. Jahal. I'll see if go to members of council for if they have any questions to you. Just uh, give me a second. Here we go, Councillor Rutherford. Yes, thank you, Mr. Jahal. We're having a great evening. Thank you for waiting so long today. Um, can you, uh, so you, you mentioned wanting it referred back to discuss the concerns. Can you talk about the engagement process? Because I, I, what we're hearing from, from administration and the report and from, uh, from the proponent is sufficient engagement. But it sounds like there's a discrepancy between that and the the public perception. Yes, Councillor Rutherford, thank you for that question. It's a meaningful question because I would like to explore that uh, statement presented by administration and the builder, applicant. Um, we, as residents, received a little notification card and uh, it was a Google form where we provided our input and whereby 24 people, as the applicant stated, had concerns. None of those concerns were addressed by the builder to the residents. Uh, we have not met online, to the best of my knowledge, nor has the community league has met with the proposed builder. They may have met informally, not as, uh, or as an entity itself. 
So we would like to sit down and work with the builder and work with the city. If it was a Venn diagram, we have them on one side and the landowner on the other side, and we wouldn't be in the middle with the city of Edmonton. We want to work together and find a solution. We haven't been consulted. Okay. And I, I want to just clarify something because you said there's going to be lots of affordable housing built to the north, but at this point, that neighborhood structure plan hasn't been developed. So I just want to confirm that we don't know that there will be affordable housing there. You would know, uh, Councillor, you would know more than I do about that situation and application. I just know that Canada Lands and West Corp and the entities there um, are looking to build things. In turn, yeah. this, this wouldn't be affordable housing. This is a rental that's not controlled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And one of the things that, that I wonder, though, because when we're talking about zoning, it's really about the land itself, as opposed to some of the, the details. Like I mentioned, I asked about the wood frame, but it's not really a zoning question. Um, it's more for that development permit stage. Do you think, would there be any um, ease from the community if you know during the development process there's more there there would be engagement on those kind of things and responses and discussion on those concerns that are development related as opposed to zoning related yes uh, in both aspects i think we need to uh sit down and actually establish and write down the uh, meet together yes uh, absolutely Okay, and um, you, do you just, I know that when I went to the, the Greasebox Community League meeting, there was some community league members and, and in attendance that indicated that they were supportive of this project. Do you, you know, what kind of feedback did you hear in, in the positive of this project from your residents? Um, one of those individuals that is supportive of it um, is myself, just to be clear. I'm opposing it based on the community itself. Mm -hmm. I support it because I want something built in that corridor. Um, it's right now inhabited by and individuals that are using it for unsafe manners. Um, I had a knife pulled on me in that corner. My neighbor was assaulted in that little area. Yet, it's still, if we're just going to replace it with anything, we want to benefit the community. Uh, I just don't want something that's blocked into there. I want something that's going to benefit uh, the society. Councillor Jans mentioned, why can't we go higher? Yes, why not? If it's affordable, let's let's make sure that it's going to be properly used. A, this is the first time we've heard that Forum will own, take ownership of this property. They're not con making it condominiums. This is the first time. That's new information. We... Also, we are aware that Forum has the highest rental rates for uh, commercial use in the neighborhood. So is that going to coexist? They have a lot of intents, but we need commitments. Great. Thank you. I appreciate those answers. I'm out of time for any more questions, but I appreciate your being here tonight again. I just want to echo that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Knack. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Mr. Chahal, for for uh, joining tonight. And uh, I was interested the minute you said that that you you're supportive, so we have that unique uh, position where you you are representing the community, but maybe personally you feel a little bit differently than what you've heard uh, from from your neighbors. So, I guess the question I want to ask you, and and this is always the struggle with, uh, well, frankly, any rezoning is that we there's that desire to have every single detail sort of locked into place. And, and I mean, in an ideal world, if there was no cost difference, if there was no time difference, um, we would do every zoning as a direct control, which would give you that absolute certainty every step of the way down to, you know, the number of parking stalls, the specific, you know, look of the building. Um, at the same time, over the years, we, we do try to encourage the idea of standardized zoning, which has the ability to operate with certain element parameters, uh, but you don't, you don't get that same level of certainty. So I guess for yourselves personally, if you're uh, able to answer that, do you, what I heard from you is that outside of the wood frame piece, which, which is not really before us today, um, that is more of a building code conversation. Um, 
with what we heard from both the applicants and the proponents and, and the list of items you've heard from the community, it seems like, and correct me if I'm wrong, that they actually are addressing what has been raised by the residents. The issue is that you don't have that absolute certainty. So they're going to do an underground parking. They're going to do these other pieces, but you don't have that sort of in writing and a direct control. Is that, is, is that a fair summary? Uh, Councillor Knack, thank you for the uh, question. Uh, that is exactly, it's uh, right now everything's pie in the sky. Uh, ideally, this would be like Garrison Green in Calgary, um, where their shops are on the bottom and residents are on top and it's a little utopia. Awesome. Like, we're like Manchester downtown, Edmonton. Um, they have intents, but they're n not willing to commit. <laughs> so it, that is, uh, and... We do know from history, um, they have admitted they've been in Edmonton for quite a long time. They have a long track record here. And the track record needs to be proven. It's not all above board. It's not all great. So, yes, it needs to be in writing. Yes, Councillor Knack, thank you for asking that specific question. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. That, that's all I have for questions, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate your time. Thank, thank you, you Councillor Knack. Can you move a second round, Councillor Knack? I would be very happy to move a second round. Thank second. you. Seconded by Councillor Salvador, I heard. Okay. All right, so please, any questions for the second round? Seeing none, uh, call the vote. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Just looking for Councillor Stevenson's vote. I'm the yes, Kevin Clark. Apologies. Thank you. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And I'll go to Councillor Rutherford. Yes, thank you. And uh, just a, a question that we didn't dig into a little bit. Uh, Mr. Chahal, how long have you lived in Greasebaugh? Sorry, Councillor Rutherford, I had to unmute my phone. Um, I've lived here for eight years, I believe. I believe. <laughs> yeah. And and you're in walking distance to that, that shopping center. Yes, absolutely. I just walked to the Shopper's Drug Mart and Popeye's and go to Paramo. <laughs> yes. And... I think one of the things that I heard from, from residents in Greaseville that I've talked to on the phone or at the community league meetings is, is basically many of them bought into the idea of Greaseville through the neighborhood structure plan. And that is also we're dealing with together today to, to amend that. Um, I know that it's, it's controversial because of the restricted covenant, which is its own, its own beast. Um, what I worry about, though, is like without doing anything here, it will continue to be sterilized because of that restricted covenant. Would you see the opportunity or I guess the question I'm trying to ask is what impact or what are your understanding of the community's perception of that neighborhood structure plan? that they bought into when they when they bought into Grease Bar originally. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Councilor Rutherford. Um, again, this is why I, I, I would request to refer this back to administration for further discussions, as it doesn't align with the neighborhood uh, plan and the vision. Um, of course, we want to have mixed uh, density housing in the, in the area, yet um, we want to make sure it's accessible to all, even to individuals with cars. Um, that hasn't been addressed. Um, again, this is all new information to us is that these will be rentals. Um, what is, like, what's the requirements for people to get rent there? Uh, it's right beside a transportation corridor, and um, that, is, that is great. Uh, we w would like to have uh, discussions with the applicants about this and move forward. Um, it, it, I, I would like to bring other members from the community to sit down with the applicant and talk about these aspects and see if their vision and overall plan aligns. Okay, and 
there's still a lot of development to happen. There's going to be a potential another commercial corner in the the southwest corner of Grisba. The whole north east quadrant still needs to be developed, which will likely include commercial as well. And, and I think that was alluded to with would a grocery store and other commercial in that area kind of help add to the vibrancy, even in the absence of that grocery store in that section? Absolutely. Yeah. Personally, I, I feel yes. I, sh I, I walk to Shopper Drug Mart and get our daily groceries. So yes, uh, it would. Again, I can't speak on behalf of the entire board of directors for mm -hmm. the Free Spot Community League, which I'm speaking on behalf of today. Individually, mm -hmm. yes. Um, again, if this uh, applicant was serious, their intent could be proven by making an application to court or whatever it's Solby's <laughs> to have this aspect lifted. Um, it, well, it would, I, I, I will that's I'll, a beast. I'll speak to that and I'll ask the, the solicitor some questions on the restricted covenant, but I, I think it's a completely dead end just, and I don't think that's yeah. a indicator of the, the effort from the, the, the applicant to be fair. I, yeah. I think that restricted covenants are, are a whole pro challenge in and of themselves. But thank you so much for that, Mr. Chahal. I'm glad that I did a second round and I appreciate my colleagues' patience as I did a second round. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Councilor Rutherford. So that's it for questions to you, uh, Mr. Chahal. Thank you for waiting and uh, always nice to see you and uh, say hi to your lovely kids for us. Uh, and uh, now we go to our admin for questions. So council members, questions to admin. Councilor Salvador. Thank you. Um, so I guess first question uh, to administration, just, just getting that clarity, recognizing this as on sort of the corner of two primary corridors. Um, absolutely, you know, mid-res is, is appropriate, but there is that possibility of um, some high rise that's my understanding is that right councillor salvador under the re8 uh g zone that we have here it is uh typically six stories 23 meters right sorry i should clarify um i guess expectations uh of city plan there's that flexibility like this is definitely within the range but it's not uh sort of the high end of the, that range right that, that is correct and um you know as we've seen in the numerous uh, examples can we we can't pick and choose where we get this uh this higher density. Um, I will just offer that, uh, you know, the, the southwest corner of the neighborhood where the LRT may run one day, um, there is potentially for, for higher density there as well. So, yeah, but th to, to your point, this this would make a, a good site for, for even increased density. Okay. Um, well, thanks for that. And uh, just reflecting on sort of transit access to the site, obviously there's the transit uh, station just across 97th. Um, B1 eventually for our, our BRT system is expected to go down 97th. Is that right? Just reflecting on the mass transit conversation we had a little while ago. I would defer correct. that to my transportation colleague. Uh, yes, uh, that's correct, Councillor. Okay, okay. Um, so it's going to be really well connecting, which is great. Um, Okay, and then I have a question specifically for Griesbaugh zoning. So I recognize Griesbaugh is under sort of a special area. Uh, and is RA8G, is that kind of the highest possible density that is allowed under Griesbaugh's special area? Is that my understanding? I believe so, yes. Okay, okay. So this is kind of the, the upper end of what's even allowed uh, in Griesbaugh. Yes, typical to um, most developing neighborhoods, we do go up to the RA density. It's very unusual that we would get the RA9, yeah. uh, only in specific exa examples, and they're probably more recent neighborhoods than than when uh, Grease Bar was originally planned. Okay, great. And uh, also wanted to ask some questions around that balance of residential and commercial space. Uh, I was looking back at the NSP and I know, I think initially um, it, it outlined, uh, I think it was like 18,000 square meters of commercial space is what was uh, intended. And um, we've now, if this is approved, be going from, I think 11,000, maybe 12,000 down to about 9,000. And I'm just trying to think long-term because Griesbaugh, 
of course, is in uh, relatively early stages of development. There's still a lot of growing left to do. Um, are we feeling like the, the commercial um, area and the surrounding corners, I guess, across 97th, across 137th, is going to be able to serve this growing community? Because um, that was just something I flagged, because it seems like a fairly significant deviation from that original 18,000 uh, square meter mark. Yeah, Councillor Salvador, that, that's a that's a great question. I mean, coming out of COVID, um, there are a lot of uh, unknowns. Let's let's say for the commercial opportunities as we go forward, uh, there are other areas in Griesbach that may have some potential to pick up some um, commercial opportunities. We know of one proposal that may be uh, on the books, so to speak. We were reviewing that right now in another portion of the neighbourhood. Um, but I, I think given the, the surrounding opportunities with grocery stores on other corners, a uh, variety of uses, um, for the time being, it's probably well served given, given what we have. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate that answer. I'm just, yeah, really trying to think long-term and also recognizing it, geographically, you know, it's, it's relatively close to those other uses, but um, Having spent a lot of time in that area, I know actually crossing 97th and 137th, it's a bit of a barrier. I mean, those are some pretty large roadways. So actually having that access within Griesbach can facilitate a lot of walkability too. So yeah, I'm, I'm just reflecting on that commercial element. Uh, I'll sneak in one more question, um, just around parking. So my understanding with GBC, that actually requires parking to be located in the rear of the site. Uh, are there any requirements with RA8? G, around where parking is allocated. The, the two zones are almost identical is my understanding. It's just the front setbacks which can be reduced slightly and can be reduced within the RA8G. With, sorry, comparing GVC and, and RA8. Oh, sorry, GVC. Um, yeah. I'd have to go back and look at that and get back to you on that. Okay, because Mike can, I'm out of time. I'll come back. <laughs> now, so just to quickly add, uh, the parking is required to be behind to be behind the building, just like in the R8 zone uh, that was recently amended about two years ago. Okay, and by behind, that's not facing 97th or 137th? Correct. Is there behind? Okay, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Councillor Rutherford? Thank you. Um, to administration, what is the projected population growth for Greece over, let's say, the next five years, 10 years? I don't think that's anything we have at our fingertips. I know there's some work being done by the administration right now to do some uh, projections. We could get something to you offline, um, looking at what development permits have come in. And but we we just did this. We just did the building a city to 1.2 million that was based on growth projections. Yes, we could give you the uh, the potential build out for the neighborhood and uh, some projections of where we are right now versus how long it might take to complete that neighborhood. Yeah, because one of the concerns that I, I heard, and I, and I mean, it was echoed again by Mr. Chahal, is on traffic, and especially on 137th and 97th. Can administration confirm, and, and if, if they, the, the details of a traffic study on that intersection with the projected population growth in Greasebaugh? including sure. what would be potentially this development, but also bigger than that. Because as yes. Councillor Principe highlighted. So Councillor Rutherford, um, we have um, done um, a transportation assessment for the entire neighborhood back in 2009. Okay. That uh, analysis was uh, done keeping in mind uh, the corridors as well. Uh, the accessibility to the neighborhood and the overall population build out that is project, projected or identified in, in this neighborhood plan. So what we did for this uh, uh, change, land, uh, land use change, we, we looked at that uh, uh, land use scenario and compared it to uh, the change of uh, 230 units versus the change happening at the commercial front. And then uh, both numbers are fairly comparable. Uh, there's not a significant departure from what was identified uh, for network. Uh, so we were comfortable going forward with this change without any additional analysis. 
Yeah. And I think I get it when it's this small one for sure. I can see that the, the swapping between the in and outs of people going to the grocery store with their cars or this would be equivalent, but I'm starting to also see the accumulative impact of, of and especially when we talk about the neighborhood structure plan, uh, there's one quarter of the neighborhood structure plan that's not built out yet. Uh, right? Like we don't even have a plan for it yet. So I'm, I'm starting to see cumulative effects of the growth at Greaseball as an infill with existing infrastructure on those roads. And I think those concerns from residents are valid. So when I hear that the last traffic study was 2009, that is concerning to me, not for this necessarily the zoning, but in the context of the concerns of those residents. Um, the other thing that was mentioned by the proponent was that their commitment to protect the trees, but do we have any guarantee of that? Not if it's on private property, no. So why was the DC one not explored to, to protect those trees? Councillor, as we've uh, alluded to, we, we try to tend to stay away from uh, direct controls where possible. Um, this is a standard zone and it's um, typically not, not doesn't come up in the conversation as, as from us as part of that. I think as the applicant did state though, they are willing to uh, retain a number of those trees on site. But there's a lot of attentions just to add, Councillor, yeah. um, if you go north of this site on 97th Avenue, that same tree stand has been preserved uh, through previous development phases. Uh, those but was that by Canada developed. Lands or by private developers? Uh, I believe that uh, larger, I guess, I think it's a four-story building, uh, was done by a different developer as well. Um, and as it as I heard, uh, Canada Lands uh, still retains uh, some of the control, okay. uh, the architectural control through the... Uh, architectural agreements and the land sale agreement. So Canada lands would need to see like the development permit and approve that is, it. That is our understanding. Okay. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to come back for a second round because I have uh, questions on the restrictive covenant that I still want to ask. Thank you. Councillor Rutherford, we will follow up with the applicant also um, sending them a letter indicating that there was a discussion to protect the tree stand just so we can uh, make sure that they, uh, that they're, that will document that the discussion happened here tonight in terms of the, the protection of that tree stand. Yeah, well, and I think we it's important for our tree canopy as well as the sentimental value that those trees have. So, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Would you like to move a second round? Yes, please. Thank I've you. I've moved the second round. Thank you. Who would second that? Second. Second by Councillor Tang. Any questions? Seeing none, please vote. Just looking for Councillor Jans's vote. Oh, we have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. All right. And I'll go to Councillor Rutherford. Go ahead, Councillor Rutherford. Sorry, I was trying to click in, but I did not because I came back to the team's meeting. Um, so, yes, yeah, so this the next round of questions are for uh, our, our legal uh, department uh, with an administration. Uh, can you speak to, you know, one of the questions I get asked is how come we didn't have a time limit on the restricted covenant or why, do, why don't we just expropriate the land and then we can you know, start anew. Can you speak to some of those processes and why that, you know, that is something that has been explored and is maybe not likely possible? Yeah, Councillor, I'm happy to do that. <clears throat> As you're likely aware, um, administration has been struggling with these types of restrictive covenants for a number of decades. Um, unfortunately, you know, to your question about time limit, these aren't actual contracts that the city is a party to. These are contracts between private landowners. Um, and so the city does, A, did not, we're not a part of the formation of that contract, nor do we control what happens in that contract. 
So there's been decades of work put into this and, and, and law and administration have tried different avenues to try to petition the government to change the, the law that protects these restrictive covenants or to allow for court orders to discharge them to no avail over some time. So this is, this is certainly um, something that administration has been aware of and has been working at and, it, and you know, to, to sort of quote you from earlier, something that is a bit of a dead end from the legal perspective at current. And so if we want changes to this, just as for the, I really think it's important that Greaseball residents hear this, it's really advocacy we need to do to the provincial legislation, correct? Yeah, if we had an amendment to the provincial legislation, um, that would allow us uh, different rights or opportunities in certain circumstances, yes. Okay, great. Um, and is there anything else that you wanted to add specifically? Or, or an, oh yes, another question I had, is it just for that parcel of land or does the restrictive covenant also include caveats on the, the rest of the uh, retail area? Um, I'm not sure, maybe somebody from planning coordination would be able to be able to speak which titles the restrictive covenant are is registered on in terms of a survey of tenement. Um, as you know, Councillor, a restrictive covenant has two parcels of land that, that are affected. One is the dominant tenement and one is the Serviet tenement. And the Serviet tenement accepts certain restrictions on their land for the benefit of the dominant tenement. So um, just to explain that to you and then maybe kick it to planning coordination to let me know if there's other parcels included in that Serviet tenement outside of this one to address your question. Councillor, the last time we uh, inquired about it, the, the caveat was on the, the balance of the town centre, so to speak, um, which restricts the development of a grocery store um, or grocery offering. So so that's perfect, because that's something I don't think that this that my, all of my council colleagues might be aware of. So when we talk about the commercial areas struggling, for example, something as simple as a Cobb's bread cannot go in that location. Correct. Uh, it's possible because it's a food retail takeaway. It's 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 possible. It depends on uh, and, and and shoppers got a special permission. Right. Yeah. It depends on how they uphold uh, their instrument. How Sobeys uh, upholds their instrument on title. So it might not be the demand isn't there for the retail. It's that the retailers that would have used that space, as it said, are now not able to. So I just want to make it clear what's causing potentially those challenges from a retail perspective. Um, okay, uh, and I, that's all I had, questions on restrictive covenants. I, I uh, as I've learned more, it is more concerning. I see lots of former councillors from last term nodding their heads with the frustration of restricted covenants. So I'm sure this will not be the last <laughs> of these conversations, but uh, I think it's really important for them, to, for, for residents in Greece to hear uh, that our hands are really tied as a city on on this and so can you just confirm that again uh for the record um, yes madam councillor i can confirm that as a municipality our hands are tied um in regards to the restrictive covenant great thank you so much thank you councillor rutherford councillor paquette well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. To follow up on on that line of excellent questioning uh miss mccabe we still have that report we generated last term on restrictive covenants hanging around? Councillor, you're testing my memory tonight. I know we pa are we recently uh, sent a memo on it. Um, can yeah. somebody remind me if there's a report coming forward, if anybody else knows? Was, we actually got it back in the last term. Okay, uh, sorry. <laughs> simply because the frustration, at, the sheer frustration about food deserts. Um, and uh, there was one other option. The city can buy the land. Um, but there are challenges in there in that, uh, one, you have to have a willing seller. And two, what happens to the price when people understand that the city wants to buy land <laughs> to well, get rid of covenants? Uh, go ahead. Uh, uh, this uh, sorry about that, Councilor Burkett. Sorry for interrupting. But it just reminds you that the only way to take off a restrictive covenant is with the consent of the dominant tenement. So even if you bought the Serviet tenement land, that you would still be in the same position. So just, yeah. just a reminder that it's even a little bit more difficult than perhaps what you had outlined there. So because it's germane to this discussion, maybe we can go a little bit deeper into this because we advocated with this government. We advocated with the government before. The government before that was advocated with. 
why is there so much uh, resistance to maybe changing the way that we do this, understanding the um, negative impacts it has to municipalities across Alberta? Um, I'd be willing to wager a guess on this, although I can't sort of describe what would be in the mind of the legislatures, uh, legislators, but I do think that there are some policy reasons for allowing to preserve uh, restrictive covenants because they're not just used for these types of purposes. And so I think that there are some good policy reasons to make sure that they're not touchable, um, you know, uh, overall as, 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 as an instrument on title. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so... So when, when uh, a landowner finds themselves in this position, uh, they don't really have much of an option. You rezone so you can build something else. If yes, you don't really have an option for a grocery store counselor or food, a food store. Yeah. Yeah, it's a real frustration, uh, which uh, just point of uh, trivia, one reason we brought in mobile food markets. Okay, so, uh, in this situation, um, the community is not enthused. Uh, there is talk of maybe what if we built higher. Um, I'm just, I guess what I'm, I'm doing here, rather than asking a question, I'll, um, what do you think, folks? You think that uh, the proponent might have an answer to that if we go back to them? <laughs> I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Salvador. Uh, thank you. Just wanted to loop back to my questions around um, parking. So understanding that that all parking would have to be located um, sort of to the the rear of the the site. Um, I guess I I'll just be blunt. I'm I'm worried about seeing you know 200 stalls of surface parking um, in in an area that is supposed to be fairly walkable and, and pedestrian oriented and. Um, so far has been definitely tending in that direction. I went and visited uh, last night to take a peek and it's adorable. Um, it is turning into sort of a little little mini main street. Um, and I, I guess I'm looking for some reassurance there. <laughs> um, don't know if you can give it to me, uh, administration, but um, yeah, thoughts around the potential large impact of having a a parking space in between where there's gonna be some new residential and the the main street. Councillor, it's a good question. Um, I think when we were evaluated, evaluated this, uh, the RAG zone has a very similar impact to the GVC zone. Uh, and what we would probably see uh, through that development of the grocery store, uh, presumably the grocery store would be in the corner. Uh, as any typical grocery store, you have your pool of parking out uh, front, which would be in between the two buildings or that one, the back of the house of the main street, and then probably the front door of the, the grocery store. Uh, so with the regulations within the RAG zone and having the buildings uh, being required to line uh, the roads, uh, 97th and 135th here, uh, probably can expect a similar situation here. Um, what that also does is it allows uh, for future quote unquote infill as the neighborhood and the site progresses uh, and when those higher orders of transit are added in addition to that transit center next door. Um, so there's an opportunity there for this further uh, evolution of the neighborhood as well. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for that clarity. Um, and just really quickly on the restrictive covenants, uh, I guess a larger question, because it, it's come up, uh, have we ever challenged this on the basis of human rights around access to food? Do we know if any municipality has done that? Not to my knowledge, Councillor. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Those are all my questions. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. So that is... Uh, it for questions to admin. Any clarifying questions to uh, the public from council members? We have another item to deal with yet. Uh, uh, so just wondering if there are any qu clarifying questions to public. Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, I'll be I'll be quick, but I do uh, you know I do want to confirm with the proponent. Um, you know, the concerns that I'm hearing around the lack of dialogue with with the community. And and so I'm just, um, you know, I know you said that they, they, you held an online thing, how many people attended that? And yeah, I'm just trying to get a sense of, and would there be willingness to engage further in the development phase? 
Uh, Councillor, I can answer that question. Thank you. Um, we met on several occasions with the executives of the Community League, and uh, we, ha we did hold an online engagement on, uh, in September. Mm -hmm. There were about 30 members of the public that did okay. attend that hearing. And then, of course, there was uh, the city, uh, city online engagement process as well. And I know through the Community League, we um, left our, our names and numbers and made ourselves available to any individual member of the public that wanted to reach out to us directly. We did not receive anybody reaching out to us directly for any one-on-one um, -on -one meetings. Um, and then, yes, of course, our, our lines of communication are always open. And, um, and if any member of the public had any questions during the development permit process, we would make ourselves available to answer them. Great, thank you. That's all my questions. I appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Seeing no more questions, we're ready to uh, close the public hearing on this bylaw. Would someone move that we close the public hearing on this bylaw, please? I'll, I'll move. Second. Councillor Rutherford moved and Councillor Salvador seconded. Any questions? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. Just looking for two more votes, Councillors Paquette and Rice. I'm here. Yes. Thank you, I heard yeses from both Councillors yeah. Paquette and Rice. We have 13 votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. And I'll move for first reading. Uh, I'll move first reading of bylaw 2005 and charter bylaw 2006 uh, be read for the first time. Second. Second by Councillor Salvador. Any questions? Anyone to Mr. speak? Mayor, give me just a quick word. Yes, absolutely. Anyone yep. to speak? Councilor, yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Rutherford. Um, Councillor Rutherford first. Oh, I didn't see that. Oh, okay. maybe, or maybe just hold on, just hold on. Hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. Councillor Paquet. Can you yeah. click can you click on? Uh, I'm trying. You can't? Okay. Then I'll go to you first because Councillor Rutherford will close on it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so it's a, it's always a tricky thing when uh, when you're adding density to a neighborhood. Um, there's usually very similar concerns across the board in each neighborhood, and usually those concerns actually don't come to fruition. It actually works out pretty good. And uh, this is the trend that we're moving forward to as a city as we uh, go along with the city plan and start to right size our expenditures with our tax base and our density and our ability to uh, provide services. Um, you know, this is uh, this effort. Uh, spans uh, the spectrum from uh, keeping taxes at a, at a reasonable level uh, to being more environmentally friendly, to just being more efficient with uh, transit, to making sure that uh, fire and police are closer to areas where people live. And, um, and so that we actually have more density of the amenities that people want. Uh, including parkland. And so one of the concerns was the trees and we hear that those will be preserved, which is good. Um, the other uh, concern of course is, uh, is parking. And uh, this is something that uh, every city has to deal with, uh, including Edmonton. Uh, there's no escaping it. And it's part of, uh, part of growing. Uh, unfortunately, that's just the case with every big city because simply can't afford to provide um, an overabundance of parking in all areas at all times. It's just never going to happen in any large city if they are uh, keeping the budget in check. Uh, so uh, that's sort of the, the concern there. Um, but I do believe that uh, because of all the local amenities that uh, um, there are going to pe be people who move into a construction such as this who are uh, probably uh, more willing to be walking to their amenities, to be biking. Uh, and there will be um, more transit in the area as uh, we grow and refine as a city and as the BNR uh, slowly gets uh, more prudent expansion. Uh, 
it would have been nice to to um, see more uh, engagement and maybe to even see a little more density paired with um, more efforts to address some of the concerns. That would have been very nice to see. And the community is not wrong to have asked for those things. Um, so with all of that in mind, I will be supporting this. Um, and uh, simply for the reason that we don't let perfect get in the way of good. This was good. It is not perfect. Um, but uh, when someone finds perfection, please let me know. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Neck. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And excuse me. Uh, just a, a few quick thoughts on this, and and uh, I am going to be, I will be supporting this. Uh, but I appreciate some of the concerns we heard today from Mr. Chahal on behalf of the community, and and uh, the, this it's it's that tension that I was we were chatting about earlier during questions, which is that you know I've been doing this now for eight and a half years, and 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 of course the community wants every single item pre-written and predetermined and yet our standard zones don't give that same certainty that everyone seeks and uh and and so there's a worry that that what they're asking for will, won't ultimately materialize or in the case of what we heard today what has been suggested by the proponent won't actually materialize on that site because what I did hear today is that the proponent seems to be wanting to address most of the concerns that were raised by the community, having that underground garage as an example, retaining trees. Um, but because it's not written in a direct control, uh, there, there's that hesitancy to offer any support. So the only thing I would offer is that, generally speaking, over the years, um, our standard zones have really worked out. And, and folks that have come forward who have suggested that they're going to do certain things typically follow through on that. And, and yes, to be fair, in eight and a half years, that hasn't happened every single time, but it has happened far, far, far more often than not. And typically in those scenarios where something isn't going according to the, what was originally planned, usually has to result in somebody coming back for a rezoning to try to change their mind. In which case, then we have another mechanism to try to ensure that those concerns are being addressed. And, and so I wanted to just offer that as maybe some comfort that that uh, that is generally what we have seen over the years when these standard zones have been used. People don't say one thing and do another. Again, it has happened occasionally, but not not very often. Um, the other piece is that, you know, for, and, and we heard it through some of the discussion today, this site is very much a, a, a great site for this type of density. And uh, I, I appreciate Councillor Jans's point earlier, which is that, you know, on, on the corner of two arterial roads, we probably would generally support something substantially higher, but there's a, there's a well-designed plan that I think we should generally be following here. And so, uh, I, I very much support that. The only other thing, and, and I think there was already a lot of discussion on that, and I know it's not relevant so much to land use, but it came up because it impacts the commercials, that restrictive covenant. And those are terrible things, and I wish they could end. And, uh, and I, gosh, I'd love to give it another try just for just for fun, because like they, they are terrible and they harm communities and uh, they're not relevant to today's land use. But I just want to say it out loud that I was working on this years and years ago uh, with, the, with uh, I think, the provincial NDP originally and they in government worked on this afterwards. Gosh, it would be nice to change that. And and maybe one day we'll get that and we shouldn't give up as a council. Um, and I know it's not relevant to land use, but I just want to say we hear you on that. And uh, we would love the continued advocacy on this working together to solve that. So I'll support this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Nack. Councillor Salvador. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I will be supporting this uh, for, for several reasons. I think this site has sat vacant for far too long. Um, I spent a lot of time in this area in my youth. Uh, I remember when the entire site was was undeveloped. Um, so seeing a progress has been exciting, but this particular parcel has been a bit of a holdout. Um, I think that the proximity to transit is fantastic, uh, as well as proximity to future BRT. Um, and ultimately, you know, 
this does provide greater housing choice in a neighborhood that has huge potential to function as a 15 minute community where all of your needs can be met close to home. Um, I also think about, you know, opportunities for, for seniors in the area who, who might want to be able to downsize. Um, I think about my own family members who, who are in this neighborhood who um, no longer drive. You know, being able to live in uh, multi-unit, um, you know, multi-family dwelling directly across from transit, directly kitty corner from a grocery store with uh, amenities and commercial right across the street. It's a pretty fantastic opportunity. So um, while yes, I, I would have liked to have seen slightly more density on this site, uh, I think this does meet a lot of our goals around that missing middle density. It's in line with city plan. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to support it. Uh, just on the restrictive covenants piece, I think it is absolutely awful. It is predatory, um, actively harms communities. And I'll be looking for opportunities to continue pushing on that, even though I know previous councils have, have really uh, given it a go. Um, I always think it's worth it because yeah, like I said, it's really damaging. So that's it for me. Thanks so much for the discussion. Thank you, Councillor Salvador, and never give up on a good cause. Absolutely. Councillor Rutherford to close. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I just, I want to say thank you to everybody in Greasebot. I talked to many residents over the phone this last week and I asked them if they Councilor were coming Rutherford, to the public can you, If I may ask you to, because I did not see Councillor Rice click in, right? So oh, okay. So if you, if, you close, if you close, then she won't be able to speak. So if you don't mind, okay. Okay. I'll, I'll go to Councillor Rice first. Councillor Rice, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Ms. Ms. Mayor, and also thank you, uh, my colleague, Councillor Rutherford. Uh, I carefully listened to this debate uh, regarding this bylaw. So I heard lots of wonderful um, um, points and also great points and how uh, this bylaw passed and, and will have uh, some benefits from long-term perspective and also from city changes perspective. So I just want to bring different perspective in and then I know um, we have enough support uh, right now. And by listening to the concerns for the, from the community, uh, I just want to bring two points. The first point, so uh, I understand we have this regular uh, public hearing session and to open the door to accept a different perspective and for the city's mind development and use. Uh, but what message we want sent to our residents, to our neighbors, to our Edmontonians uh, in terms of uh, ending bylaw as a project could create some impact in their daily life and in their daily life around them, their home. So I just want to bring that point to, to the chamber and for my colleagues to think about. And that also I would like to say, and then every mind and in our neighborhoods is everybody's home. And that is our common community, is our common use the area. And it's, if we consider, if we say it's and um, everybody's voice deserves to be heard, um, I think with that point, I would like to say uh, um, for those reasons, and I heard enough concerns and for this bylaw. Um, so I'm going and to uh, vote no for this. Uh, so I will stop there. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Rutherford. Okay. Uh, so as I was saying, over the last week, I've been on the phone with many Greaseville residents and I, I asked them if they were gonna be coming to the public hearing. And many of them for, for various reasons, very intimidated by this space, didn't have the time. So again, I just wanna really ground this in, in recognizing how inaccessible this process can be to many average Edmontonians. And I know many of them said that they were gonna watch watch the footage even if they were not attending. And so I wanna let you know that I heard you. Um, I think your concerns are really, really valid and it's 
challenging because as we've shored up here today, many of those concerns are not necessarily zoning concerns. They're more about the build itself. And so it makes the decision before us challenging because the process does not allow for, you know, unless we do some kind of direct control, that that really prescriptive work. I think what was also interesting is I door knocked in Grease a lot during the campaign. And I heard so much concerns about this parcel of land staying um, vacant and not having any development on it. And I heard about how homelessness in camp encampments and violence and crime that were were spurring from that section uh, of that parcel of land and so I was really excited when I heard about this development proposal because I thought this was going to be a big win for the community and then as I started to learn more many community members were opposed to this um, so that was actually quite surprising as a new councillor I was not expecting that because it was very different from what I was hearing uh, when I was door knocking. And I understand that even with many people um, that I talk to, they want development there. They're, they're upset about the restricted covenant. They're upset about what was promised to them in the original design of that grease bond neighborhood and that that's not coming to fruition. And I wish if I had a magic wand that I could take that restricted covenant off and we could have that, but that is just not so. It is not possible in this world. And so to make sure that that land does get developed, this is a great opportunity. And as some of my colleagues have highlighted, you know, saying no to this or referring it back now could risk it being an even higher density uh, project. So I, I also want to know that that risk would be there if I was to refer this back right now. Um, it would delay the project, it would keep that land vacant, and it would likely come back as a higher density because as I've said to many of you on the phone and, and many that are listening today, this and what my colleagues have said, it does absolutely align with the city plan. It does absolutely uh, create that infill development along really major corridors. It creates, it'll help create vibrancy and, and business. Um, you know, I was talking to BIAs this morning, they were talking about they need people back at the bricks and mortar buildings and they really want people to be there. And they said the best way to do that is, is, is density. So this is an example to me of that in action from that conversation that I had today. I think there's lots of opportunities throughout Grease Spa. Uh, it is a really unique community. Uh, it, we want to preserve the heritage. We want to preserve that character. We want to work with Canada lands to make sure that it continues to be the the best neighborhood in Canada as it currently is. And, and I think we can. Um, I did contemplate a few subsequent motions for the meeting today. And given our time constraints, I've decided not to do them as subsequent, but I am contemplating a, a notice of motion regarding a traffic assessment and uh, around the grease spot development in that area. And I'm also contemplating one around uh, the restricted covenant. So maybe if Councillor Salvador and I can put our heads together, I feel like there might be some hope there. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold her to that. So I do want to let you know that those are still on my mind and your concerns were absolutely heard. And while this zoning is still going through, it's balancing many of those, those folks that I talked to on the doors that said they wanted something there. And this is something and it creates a lot of vibrancy and it will bring a lot of traffic and eyes um, and and people to that area. So I also will be supporting this this bylaw. And thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford, for those thoughtful words. Uh, I will call the vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried, 12 to 1. I'll move second reading of bylaw 2005 and charter bylaw 2006. Councilor 
Second by Councilor Salvador. Second. Got it. Thank you, Councilor Salvador. Uh, any questions? Seeing none, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried to out to one. And I'll move consideration of third reading for bylaw 2005 and charter bylaw 2006. Second. Second by Councillor Salvador. This is for consideration for third reading, please. Vote. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. Permission is granted. I will move third and final reading of bylaw 2005 and charter bylaw 2006. Second. Second by Council Salvador. Any questions? Seeing none, please vote. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried 12 to 1. Thank you, everyone. Now we are on to our last item, and we have 30 minutes to complete. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I selected this because there was a speaker, but I don't require a presentation. Okay. So we don't need a presentation from administration. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Anyone else need a presentation? Uh, seeing no... Okay, good. So we will go to members of the public. We have uh, Ian Morgan in uh, favor. We'll go to Ian first, then we'll I, go just to... A, a, sorry, Mr. Mayor, a point of order. When there's speakers either in favor or opposed, I think we need to hear the presentation so that they have context. And I look to law, but that's been the advice in the past. Okay. I think it's advisable to have the presentation. Okay, so well, that's good, good advice then. All right, we'll go to our administration for our president. Thank you for flagging that, Councilor Hamilton. Okay, admin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. This application is to rezone a site in the Oliver neighborhood from a DC-1 or direct development control provision to a DC-2 site-specific development control provision. This will be to allow for the development of a six-story residential building. An amendment to the Oliver Area Redevelopment Plan is also required. Next slide, please. The site is located on 122nd Street, half a block north of Jasper Avenue, and is an excellent location for an increase in development intensity. It is composed of six vacant residential parcels and is surrounded by a mix of land uses, ranging from small-scale character housing to high-rise mixed use. The site is well connected to alternative modes of transportation with frequent bus routes along Jasper Avenue and 102nd Avenue and a separated bike lane also along 102nd Avenue. Though not shown on the screen, the future brewery and 124th Street LRT stops are walking distance to the north along 104th Avenue. With the site's close proximity to Jasper Avenue and 124th Street, it has easy access to commercial and retail services including a new grocery store within the adjacent mixed-use building to the south. Next slide, please. When comparing the existing zoning to the proposed, the key differences are an increase in floor area ratio from 1 to 3.5 and height from approximately three stories to six stories. The proposed changes to height and floor area ratio are similar to RA8, which is the zoning bylaws standard zone for mid-rise apartment buildings and they are compatible with the surrounding buildings and zoning permissions. A mid-rise building in this location provides a balanced transition in scale between the high-rise context of Jasper Avenue and the smaller scale interior of the Oliver neighborhood. Next slide, please. The setbacks required by the proposed DC2 help the building transition to the street level and surrounding properties. 
The largest potential impact is to the northern property, and this is mitigated by a required three meter setback shown in blue on the slide. This is considered an adequate setback between a medium scale building and a small scale building. Front setbacks from 122nd Street range and are shown in purple on the slide, and as they range from 4.5 to 6 meters. These push the building further away from the public realm, providing generous front yard space and maintaining the overall pedestrian comfort, which contributes to the walkability of 122nd Street. Next slide, please. The image on the slide shows a rendering of the proposed development. From an urban design perspective, the building does a good job producing active frontages. It proposes ground-oriented residential units that are located along the front of the building facing 122nd Street. This interface complements the primarily residential nature of 122nd Street. It creates a sense of occupancy through prominent residential entryways and semi-private outdoor spaces that both activate and soften the edge. The Edmonton Design Committee reviewed this proposal and provided a letter of support. As the proposal is a direct control, a contribution of roughly $267,000 is required to comply with City Policy C599 community amenity contributions. The contribution will be made in the form of eight family-oriented units, which are to be at a minimum of three bedrooms in size, located on the main floor and have access to private outdoor amenity area. Next slide, please. To facilitate the proposed rezoning, an amendment is required to the Oliver Area Redevelopment Plan, or ARP. The ARP designates the site as being within the special character area and encourages the low density residential to be retained and that new development incorporate design features that reference the historical character. The site does con did contain a series of her heritage character homes, which have since been demolished. The proposal's ground-oriented units meet the ARP's goals for vibrancy and walkability. However, the building design is more modern. As such, the proposed ARP amendment would exempt this site from the special character area and its associated policy. The city plan locates Oliver within Centre City, which is intended to receive the highest density and mix of land uses in the city. This application aligns with this direction as it allows for mid-rise residential development in an area already supporting a mix of built forms, including high-rise towers. Next slide, please. Public engagement for this proposal included a pre-application notice by the applicant and online engagement conducted by administration. Comments received were largely supportive, citing the location and design of the building as positive contributions to the area. Administration did receive more feedback after the report was made public that the building is out of scale and character with the area. We also heard that the city's postcard was late in being delivered to one resident. Next slide, please. In summary, administration recommends support for this application. It allows for increased density at a location with immediate access to amenities and alternative transportation modes. It aligns with city plans goals for Centre City, and it provides an appropriate trans transition in built form between the high rise context of Jasper Avenue and smaller scale interior of the Oliver neighborhood. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Appreciate that. Now we'll go to uh, members of the public. First to the uh, people in favor, Ian Morgan. Next, act architecture in person. Mr. Morgan, thank you so much for waiting all, all uh, afternoon. Appreciate that. Over to you. You have five minutes. Your Worship, thank you very much. It's nice to be back in person, even though we're a little bit late in the evening and everybody seems to run off home. Um, I just want to thank administration for giving a presentation on the, um, on the main planning objectives here. So um, I have a very small presentation, the first part of it, uh, mostly touches on some of the aspects that Claire has spoken to you about, um, if it is able to be brought up on screen. 
Thank you very much. We can go to um, the third slide, please. I think you all know where the site is now. So I have a few images of the site and looking at the property from Jasper Avenue, you will see that um, at the moment we have a vacant site to the east of us, which is going to currently be developed for a 12-story development. And then predominantly, as we've said, this building creates a transition between the high-rise buildings of Jasper Avenue and the smaller three and four story multifamily and then the two stories and one and a half story single family of the Oliver neighborhood. Next slide, please. As we've discussed, we've looked at the setbacks associated with the site, with the access, and we feel that we're all very much in compliance with the city plan and with the city's drive to increase density within our inner core. Next slide, please. One of the things, though, that we've obviously fallen foul of is the special character area associated with uh, the Oliver area. Um, this area is designed to support mid and small scale development, row housing, townhouses, individual family houses, but not a mid-rise development. Um, we've also noted the fact that the um, existing heritage houses on the site were demolished over a period from 2016 to 2019. And the one thing that I wish to state here is like, I represent the city or the architecture association and the city's uh, historic resource review panel. And when we do look at heritage areas and heritage buildings, we start first by looking at the eligibility. We then look at significance criteria. And finally, we look at integrity. There are several aspects of integrity you see here. Unfortunately, with this site, with the removal of the houses that were previously there, we've lost that integrity. And we always ask ourselves, is the site able to convey its heritage value through its remaining character defining elements? And there are none on the site as we speak of right now. This is also an economic issue. Um, in order to get value out of this land, we need to develop more than a three-story development or a series of townhouses. At the same time, we recognize the fact that we want to create a really good urban design and a really strong connection to the street. Next slide, please. And one more, please. So the site's been developed with a series of eight townhomes that replicate the rhythm of the historic houses. And while they are designed in a modern context, we do have a step back above the second floor level to allow the townhouses to, to read well from the street. The townhouses themselves have a series of porches, verandas, bay windows to evoke some of the characteristics we would see in heritage houses, but they are developed in a more modern manner. Next one, please. As uh, presented, we are looking to create private outdoor amenity areas facing the street to encourage uh, families to live in these properties and to activate the street edges. Next slide, please. We also have a distinguishable entrance of a story and a half mid-block that will help to define and guide people to the main door. Next, please. And then our elevations. One of the things we heard from a meeting with the Civics Committee of the Oliver Community League was they didn't want to see a bland white gray building. So we've looked to use materials and colors that will animate the facade and create distinction between the distinct building elements. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Morgan. Uh, I'll go to council members for questions, if there are any questions to Mr. Morgan. I see none. Thank you so much for your presentation. And I'll go to uh, uh, Dolores Nord in opposition to the application. Councillor Tang Most has clicked on, I oh. believe, for questions. Councillor Tang, you have questions to Mr. Mr. Morgan? Yeah, I guess just a small one. Um, and I appreciate you being uh, waiting so patiently all day. Um, I appreciate you mentioning the, some of the feedback from the community league, uh, in particular to the winter design element and use of color, but I just wanna confirm. So you are saying that you're addressing this concern through the, the colors that we see in your rendering in terms of like the, 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 the black, brown, and blue, is that, am I correct? Yeah, we have a number of um, sort of brick elements and masonry on the townhomes, also a combination of metal cladding 
And then the materials for the upper portions of the building, again, will follow the same durability of using metal panels, cementitious cladding, potential of some stucco elements there. But overall, we're looking to do a good quality development using good, durable materials. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. I'm not, um, I don't know the winter design guideline that well, but I, um, I do understand that it's, uh, uh, you know, it is about encouraging use of bright colors uh, to kind of, you know, take away from the juries of, of winter. Um, and I'm not, I guess, kind of the design that, that, that is, that you just showed wasn't exactly what I thought um, perhaps aligned, but uh, if you feel that this is due to the, the use of materials, um, I suppose. Um, but thank you, That's, that, that is it. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Jans. Very quickly, my question to the applicant is again around the question of density. Um, this feels light. What would the candidate need or the applicant need, sorry, to, uh, to see a higher density in a desirable location like this? It mostly comes down to parking. Um, at the moment, we are looking at approximately, you know, 100 units on the site where almost every unit will have a parking stall. The cost to go down an extra level of parking in our city um, goes from approximately $110 a square foot to about $170 a square foot. So we really don't get that economy of a return by going down an extra level. That's why you see a lot of six-story developments now, which will have a combination of one level of underground parking with some surface parking in order to meet that parking requirement. We are also looking but, at, you know, again, oh. with our building codes, uh, six-story is that transition between a wood frame and non-combustible construction. And so a lot of developers look to stay within that six-story development for its economics. I mean, I think this is one of the most exciting parts of 124th Street that's turning over so well. You've got high Jasper Ave transit access there. You've got an LRT station blocks away. You've got that new Safeway grocery store. You, you can see the River Valley and all the way down to Councillor Cartmel's house. And it's, it's a beautiful opportunity. I wasn't thinking six stories. I was thinking more in the range of a... I mean, six stories is mid-block Garneau. This feels like it could be uh, uh, a significantly higher opportunity. And I was wondering, uh, just to hear a little bit more about that, why why we weren't looking at something in, in the, the sort of double digit stories. Well, if anybody could get funding for 70 or 80 million um, without having equity, then we'd all be doing it. Um, it's really- Right, so okay, that's, economics. well, that's helpful. That's, I was trying to get a sense of what the, what these barriers are as we look forward. It's, it's to do so with I hear parking, I hear equity. Parking, economics, equity. Um, you know our condo market right now is, is not doing so well. So most projects are being developed for good quality rental. Um, we have a number of residents looking for this style of development. Thank you very much for sharing. I appreciate that. Thank you, Constant Jens. No more questions to uh, Mr. Morgan. And I'll go to uh, Dolores Nord in opposition to the application. You have five minutes, Ms. Nord. I just have a couple questions first. I didn't put my slides in order. So if I wanted one uh, slide out of, um, I put it down as attachment one. Am I able to do that? And then I put down photos and the numbers. Am I able to do that? Uh, we received, um, your presentation is correspondence, so we don't have it available to display on the screen, yeah. but all of the counselors have received it. Oh, okay. All right, so one of the things that I want to comment, your lady from the city, uh, Claire and Mr. Morgan, uh, did not bring up any of the issues in the Oliver ARP. And there's eight sub areas in Oliver, and this one is sub area one and it's called special character. I don't know if you can see this, but in special character, there's only, in all of area, the only the gray areas in all of our special character. And this building does not follow any, 
anything to do with this. So the Municipal Government Act of 1994 empowers the municipality to develop and adopt an area development plan, an ARP, to promote a plan, a pattern of development that supports and builds on existing character of Oliver and a blend of housing types and forms. So the Oliver Area Redevelopment Plan in sub area one is called, is called special character commercial area or special character. Um, don't have that. So the current issues, this is in your 5.4 of the ARP is potential for redevelopment. There are portions of the sub area in which new forms of development are appropriate, but in the special character area, such development Developments shall be limited to row housing with individual access, street frontage for all units. These row housing structures should be designed that their form scale appearance mirror the look of the older housing stock in the area. 5.5.1 Land Use Demolition of any of the older housing stock is discouraged. So there was eight on this site. New development of the site within the special character area shall be limited to single attached housing, semi-detached housing, duplex housing, row housing, which are designed to replicate or evoke the architecture of older houses prevalent in the sub area, including pitched roofs, gables, dormers, front porches, verandas, vertical window treatments, design elements associated with modern architectures, including flat roofs and the use of metal finishes shall be distinguished. Now the next wording of this legal document is really important. Number five, no new low rise apartment development within the special character area shall not be allowed. Any use which is not a conversion of older housing stock shall not be allowed. This does not say discourage, it says shall not be allowed. This is your city of Edmonton legal document. Then the reason that I feel this rezoning should be demised by yourself is this, your photo number one in my presentation is 122nd street is the most beautiful street in all of Edmonton. The elm trees on each side of the street grow into a beautiful canopy. And this building does not follow the Oliver area redevelopment plan. And the trees, these uh, elm trees, we tried to designate them when all the, the when all the uh, buildings were designated. At the request of Mayor Mandel, the duplexes on the east side were done in accordance with the ARP. The applicant did not follow any of these characteristics. I and my neighbors, none of my neighbors received any of the notification and the feedback. I received mine on February 25th. I was president of the Community of Oliver Group for over 20 years, president and vice president of Oliver Community League. I organized the City of Edmonton survey and the inventory for Oliver. Um, so there is beautiful buildings in Edmonton that have followed the special character. One of them is the building on 104th Street. It's done extremely well. The Sidetrack Cafe, where it was, the Venetian. And uh, if you look north of 102nd, the reason this part of the street is not beautiful is all the 1950s walk-ups. And now you wonder if any of the developers follow the Oliver ARP Subarea One Special Character Commercial District. Yes, the duplexes were done. The house on 123rd Street was done. And the um, McLaren on the corner of 124th Street and 102nd Avenue was done. This is the area with uh, Christchurch, Robertson, Wesley. In this, there's two heritage houses on the west side. There's four heritage houses on the east side. Ms. Nord, your time is up. Oh, okay. And just to confirm, Ms. Nord's submission was um, processed as council correspondence and it's available online at edmonton.ca slash meetings as well. Okay, good. Thank you for, thank you for that. Okay, council members, questions to uh, 
Ms. Nord, Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you, Ms. Nord. Um, really appreciate you taking the time to join us today and for your earlier submission that I received uh, yesterday as well. Um, and you know, also just for your, your really long standing involvement in the community uh, and in all of work. So I just want to dig in a little bit. I know, I know, you know, there's always a bit of a tension with the, you know, the Oliver ARP, which has been around for many years, um, recognizing that the, the original heritage homes around the site have, have since been demolished. Just wondering if, um, you know, the, the design of this building with the townhomes at, at the base, uh, do you feel that that helps work towards the, the intent of some of that, uh, the ARP policy in terms of providing that street oriented housing? No, I think it goes directly against the uh, special character because it specifically says in here, no modern. And uh, when the architect came to the civic committee, he specifically said that they couldn't afford to put expensive finishes on the outside and that's why they were doing it cheaply. And to me, that brick stuff on the bottom it looks to me like the heritage buildings, they took the brick outhouses from the back and moved them to the front. And I, I, my experience is commercial real estate and I do zonings. I, I work with developers. My whole income for over 40 years is doing this. I know that you can build beautiful. You don't have to build modern where it says special character. I didn't say anything about the density or the FAR. I'm saying this building does not go in this street. They should have built special character. Where there's in the special character of all of Oliver, you've got one street from 103rd to 104th on 121st. You've got both sides of this street. Like there's very little in all of Oliver. You know, it's not asking a lot to retain like the building on 104th Street and 102nd Avenue, it's beautiful. It's, it's got the heritage on the bottom and it's got a modern tower on the top. The McLaren has the heritage, the original uh, Glenora Bed and Breakfast, Carrington Drugs, and then modern on the top. They could have done better, they just didn't. And they never came across the street and talked to one of the owners. They never contacted us. We never, none of us that I talked to got any of your notifications. Like I said, I got mine one business days before I got it for this meeting. It's not right. They should have worked with us. All I'm saying is work and make it work with special character. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks very much for that feedback. And I'll, I'll follow up with some questions with the administration for sure. But thank you again so much for staying with us on this very long evening. Uh, was, well, I have to, I've got two more minutes. I have to say. It's I not your so time, Ms. Nord. This is, Const this is Constable Stevenson's time. So, oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah, she has no more questions. We appreciate okay. your time. Really appreciate you uh, uh, participating and really... Uh, waiting for this item uh, uh, thank you for your thank you for your time all right so we have three more minutes i need to know how many questions are to admin so not to limit the debate but uh, if there're going to be number of speakers then uh, we would have to conclude at 9:30 and uh, uh, this item would have to go to the next council meeting because we have staff members here who needs to get home as well right so uh, I just want to get a sense from council members. I, uh, if you have questions, please sign up now so I get a sense. To administ we'll be going to administration next. Council Principal, anyone else? Anyone else? Councilor Principe, go ahead. But then we'll, I would say we will extend the order of the day by 10 minutes. Yep. Can I'll move that we extend orders till 9.45, Mr. Mayor. 9.45, thank you so much. Second. Seconded by Councilor Tang. Uh, any questions on extending the order of the day? Seeing none, please vote. I'm yes, Madam Kirk. 
Thank you, Jen. Councillor Rice. Yeah. And hearing Councillor Jones was also a yes. And yes. just looking for Mayor Sohi. I'm spoke. yes to my session, Rana. It's a kind of cancelled out, so I'm yes. yes. Thank you. We have 13 votes. Thank you. Okay, I have to sign up again. That is carried. Thank you so much. Councillor Principe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So my question is about uh, the what we heard portion of the report. I see zero opposed, but uh, Ms. Nord uh, made it clear that she just didn't get um, the notification in time, so she was not able to uh, relay her opposition. And I see one mixed and then three in support of this project. Is that correct? There were no other ones that came forward uh, in opposition or? That's correct. That, right. that we okay. received Ms. Nord's feedback later in the process um, when the report is made public um, and we captured her feedback um, in the presentation. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that there were no other ones that came forward after that, you know, possibly also didn't get um, notification or got late notification. We didn't hear from anyone. You didn't hear. Except okay. Ms. Nord. Okay, well, thank you for letting me know. That was my only question. Thank you. Thank you, Constable Principe. Constable Stevenson? Yeah, just a really quick question to administration around that question of architectural style and just wondering how how you interpreted and applied the Oliver ARP in this case and, and what elements you feel were were incorporated into the DC to reflect that, that uh, legacy of the heritage. Thank you for the question, Councillor Stevenson. Um, throughout the DC process, we did seek revisions to the building's design that would provide a stronger reference to the area's historic character, uh, the street pattern, uh, highlighting the townhouse uh, design. Um, ultimately, uh, the applicant chose the current design, which is more modern. Um, although it is, um, we do think it does partially strike a balance with the ARP. Um, because it provides individual street-oriented and ground-level entrances. Um, those agreed units and front patios that uh, mimic verandas. We'll also mention that the Edmonton Design Committee, um, although they provided a letter of support, did note the importance of the area's historical character and requested stronger language in the DC2 to reflect this. So the language you see in the DC2 um, ask that it reflect existing development in terms of rhythm, um, architectural finish finishes and colors. Great, and that's, you know, a really important point just around the, the materials. That was another concern I heard raised. So just wanted to, to confirm in terms of the quality of that development, um, what, what provisions might be in place to, to have that assurance. Um, yeah, and this speaks to some of the discussion around winter city design guidelines and um, considerations. So the DC2 does require that at the development permit stage, um, the design be further refined um, to align with the winter city design guidelines. And that also would address the architectural finishes and colors in more detail. Great. Um... Thank you. That's all I'll ask tonight and happy to move closure um, in the due course. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Okay. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Ms. Mayor. I, I only have one question. will be very quick. Um, so based on the, uh, uh, the comment uh, Ms. Rod made regarding the spatial characters and the facilities by law, and then this site development uh, will not fully align with that. Can you uh, provide a little bit background and the comments on that? Sorry, Councillor Rice, can you just repeat the first part of the question? Uh, so I heard Ms. Rod and uh, Rod a specific mention about the spatial characters and for the land use and then for our city's own bylaw and for this site development will not fully align with it and can you provide a little bit background for that and also what's your response to address that concern sure sure yeah 
sorry. Um, so the area has the Oliver um, Area Redevelopment Plan, a statutory plan that applies. Um, as Nord was referring to the special character area, um, which the site with the six parcels belongs to. Um, it, the Area Redevelopment Plan seeks and encourages uh, the retention of heritage character homes. Um, in this area, and it also suggests that any new development be of low density residential um, in nature, and also that it have um, architectural um, references to heritage. So that's some of the um, amendments that are required to go to facilitate this rezoning. We would amend the statutory plan um, and we would remove this six sites from this special character area. So we would essentially release a, a policy and the obligation um, for low density here would be replaced with mid uh, rise apartment building or medium density. And we can see from the design that's proposed that um, it has uh, less historical references in the architecture. Okay, so is that uh, my understanding? I just want to confirm my understanding is right. Um, so with that amendment right now, so this land use for this bylaw and is online with uh, our own state bylaw uh, in terms of that spatial characters right now, right? Or does there future actions actually needed? It, it, it aligns with some of the goals of the ARP um, and it aligns with city plan, our overarching municipal development plan and the goals for this area, um, which are a higher density um, in terms of jobs and people living in the area. And that's to be achieved through high and mid-rise buildings. So it requires an amendment to the area redevelopment plan in order to facilitate the rezoning. The rest of the area, special character area, um, still remains in the ARP. And Councillor, just to add that amendment is part of the bylaw package here today. So they're going in concert, both the rezoning and the amendment. So there's no further uh, requirements or applications that need to be made in, in order to facilitate this application in the future. If council were to approve the bylaws in front of you today. Okay, so is a part of this bylaw. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Reis. See no more questions. Any clarifying questions from council members to the public? Any clarifying questions from council? Seeing none, and I'll go to Councillor Stevenson for uh, Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll move closure of the public hearing on items uh, 3.23 and 3.24. Second. Second by Councillor Paquette. Any questions on closing the bylaw? Seeing none. Oh, sorry, Councillor Paquette, you, uh, you have questions on closing of the bylaw? No, quickly speak, Mr. Mayor. So can we could wait then, please? Uh, please yep. vote. Um, yes. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Just looking for Councillor Jans and no, just Councillor Jans. Yes. Thank you. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Councillor Stevenson, can you move the first reading? <laughs> Sorry, I was muted. Yes, moving first reading of 3.23 and 3.24. Second. Second by Councillor Paquette. All right, Councillor Paquette, go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, uh, first I want to thank uh, um, the resident for coming out to speak. Um, no matter how the decision goes today, I, I want you to know that uh, you're listening very closely. I was very li listening very closely and some of your concerns I actually agree with. Um, I think that uh, the pro pro uh, pardon me, the proponent probably could have done a better job, that was a tongue twister, um, in uh, conforming a little bit more to the character of the uh, 
of the traditional neighborhood. Um, and uh, having been a lifelong uh, resident of Edmonton and walking uh, that street a lot, I do miss uh, some of those character homes and they are irreplaceable. And uh, as I said in, in the last item, uh, unfortunately we can't let perfect get in the way of good. I would love uh, if the proponent had actually driven for perfect, uh, but that is not the case, um, but it is good. And uh, I will say, um, I did make a mistake in saying that uh, there was no such thing as perfect. I don't know if anyone's ever watched the movie Encanto, but I was watching it with my six-year-old and he whispered to me, I know why she doesn't have her powers. And I said, why is that? He said, because she's already perfect. And uh, in that moment, uh, I saw perfection, just not the way he thought. I saw it in his eyes. And unfortunately, we can't always see things through the eyes of our children, but hopefully what uh, happens here, if it passes, um, will give a lot of people the feeling that maybe their home is perfect. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Stevenson to close. Yes, thank you. Just to, to speak very briefly, um, again, really appreciate uh, Ms. Miller for coming out tonight and, and for the reflections. And agreed, as we, as we move forward with our city building, uh, it is important that we keep uh, what what was best from the past as well. So I I personally love these types of, of projects where, where it's bringing the new and old together. And um, yeah, I appreciate that, that it's a new interpretation of the history, uh, but one that I think overall will add to, to the street and to the area. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled to be seeing some three bedroom units going into this neighborhood. It's such a critical need and something I hear about all the time. Um, I think that this, this missing middle development is, is what we need in this area and I'm, I'm very excited to be seeing this come forward. So happy to support um, this uh, rezoning and, and amendment. And thanks, thanks to everyone for the work this Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Please vote. Um, yes. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. I'm a yes. Here, Councillor Rutherford. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Thank you. I'll move second reading of items 323 and 324. Second by Councillor Paquette, right? Second. Councillor Tang, yes, second. Yes, sorry about that. It's too late now. Councillor Tang, second read it. Oh, All right. Any questions? Uh, seeing none, please vote. Um, yes. Thank you. Just looking for, we have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried 13 to zero. Thank you all. Move consideration of third reading. Of Second. <laughs> Second by Councillor Paquette. Consideration for third reading, please. Vote, please. Um, yes. Thank you. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. Consideration is granted. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll move third and final reading of bylaw 2007 um, to amend the Oliver Area Redevelopment Plan and charter bylaw 200008 to allow clean rise housing development in Oliver. Second. Second by Councillor Paquette. Any questions? Seeing none, please vote. Um, yes. Thank you. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried 13 to 0. Thank you, everyone. Any notices of motions or motions without customary notice? Seeing none, we are adjourned and... Uh, See you at 9.30 tomorrow. We have a long day too tomorrow with committee and council meeting. See you, everyone. Mr. Chair.